Now I have a microphone. Brilliant. Welcome. I think you'll all be pleased that I didn't have a microphone while I was singing. Welcome back to day two of the Deep Tech Entrepreneurship Innovation for an Innovative, Resilient and Competitive Internal Market. Yesterday was an elegant dance between the tremendous opportunity, to quote our Minister Bush, and um, <laughs> quite a long to-do list from di different ecosystem players uh, on funding, on risk, on collaboration, on policy, on ambition, on intellectual property. But I was happy to see that yesterday was in part quite concrete and tangible, and not all conferences can boast that. And there's no denying there are challenges ahead, both structural, structural, planetary, um, political, financial. And I was reflecting yesterday, I was reminded of what President Biden was saying in the UN General Assembly just this fall. He was referring to the 1948 uh, Declaration of Human Rights, sure. but it came to mind, and I, I'm going to read it to you, what he said. It is an act. It, it, it is at its core an act of dauntless hope. And then as a good rhetoric, he repeated it for effect. An act of dauntless hope. Think about the vision of those first delegates, 1948, who undertook a seemingly impossible task while the world was still on fire, faced with death and despair. They had every right to believe only the worst of humanity. Instead, they reached for what is the best in all of us and strove to build something better. So, I say to Mr. President, uh, we will give you dauntless hope here today because we have a full agenda of forward-leaning ecosystem builders, pioneering entrepreneurs, and dare I say, daring politicians and ambitious bureaucrats. And we will kick off today with a uh, discussion and a reflection on yesterday and the state of deep tech. So I would like to welcome up uh, our next panel, give them a, uh, a warm welcome, the State Secretary of the Swedish Ministry for Climate and Enterprise, Sara Mudig, the Secretary General for Innovation of the Spanish Ministry of Science and Innovation, Tisi Teresa Riciego, and Director for the European Research Area Innovation at DG Research Innovation, Anna Panagopolo, please, welcome up. I will move, please, ladies. Thank you for joining us on this reflective start of the morning. Um, Anna, what were your reflections uh, on yesterday and the state of deep tech? dinner that we had uh, that helped <laughs> me also to reflect even further I, I actually i was thinking that it was a great event and i would like to thank the swedish presidency for putting in place such an exciting program which was not the standard program that you have seen organized by politicians in the sense that it was very interactive it was very energetic and i was extremely happy to listen to the success stories of all these innovation actors, but also the complaints. Sometimes <laughs> we heard a lot about uh, uh, administrative burden. I wouldn't like to use the word <laughs> bureaucracy uh, from the European Commission, but we said a lot. I heard a lot also about uh, that there is still problem on financing innovative companies in Europe. And I think we have to recognize that despite the capital around Europe, but also that there is still a problem of uh, reg regulatory uh, framework in Europe that we'll probably need to address even further, uh, that there is a need of a pan-European action and further collaboration of all actors within the innovation ecosystem and between the innovation ecosystems. And I think also there was a lot of uh, uh, discussion about what we can do better in order to be able to succeed and be the leaders on the digital and uh, green transition, but also on all the key challenges that the, the globe is facing now. And to be more ambitious and not just to say that we are good enough, because we are number third of the third, uh, if we compare about US and China, but our ambition should be to be number one. And let's dive into the, c the concrete matters of that. What are you guys doing at the EIC and what is the EIC doing tangibly to, to move this forward? 
I will go a bit, a bit further, because uh, in the European Commission we realized that all these challenges are around. First of all, last year we had this new European Innovation Agenda with five flagships addressing all the issues that I just raised. Scaling up companies uh, and financing for companies, a regulatory framework, uh, the creation and the interactions between the different ecosystems, attracting talents in Europe, because we need talents, and also, of course, what we can do more from a policy point of view. So that's one thing, and uh, there I would like here to highlight two main initiatives that we have launched this year, and I think will be important for all of you. First of all, the regional innovation valleys, where we'd like to boost uh, the collaboration between the ecosystems in Europe in order to deliver concrete uh, deep tech technologies on food security, climate change issues, energy, etc. You name them, you know them, it's there, everybody speaks about them. And the second issue that I would like to say this is very important is the fantastic EIC program. And this is a program of 10 billion that has been put in place the last years under FP, uh, under Horizon Europe. And the aim of this program is to provide funding and financing for the best deep tech innovative companies in Europe, but also to provide them business acceleration services. Did you hear the spontaneous applaud yesterday? Yeah. About uh, the bureaucracy. About the bureaucracy. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, I did. How to access these 10 billion? Well, actually, uh, I would be, I was happy to hear that because this confirms what we are trying to do, to simplify the access to these 10 billion, to make it easier for all of you, and therefore to be able to give the opportunities, even for <coughs> newcomers, that they don't have the administrative capacity to go through the labyrinth, allow me to say, of succeeding to Horizon Europe program for much more easiest access to EIC funding. And if you allow me one minute just to, to conclude on this, the other initiative we launched this year is the EIC Scale Up 100, where we are going to choose the 100 most promising deep tech companies, 50 coming from the EIC portfolio, 50 coming from portfolios from the member states and associated countries, these companies, they will be the ones that we think that we have the potential to become unicorns, and we are going to assist them and support them in their journey to that. Well, there's, uh, there's no lack of ambition, that's <laughs> for sure. And Teresa, I'd love to hear your reflections as well, and maybe uh, add on to what Anna was saying, because th potentially there's also a perception problem. Maybe we perceive the EU to be burdensome on a regulatory basis, which makes it maybe even worse. Maybe there's a a storytelling piece as on top of the work. I will, I will start with a, a particular example on how we can avoid or we can uh, do it in a better way. I won't use bureaucracy because uh, maybe someone in the ministry would tell me... No, administrative no, don't burden. So <laughs> administrative burden is very fine good. With that. We all know what it means. But, but I will give you just an example. Something we are doing in, in our ministry in, in Spain, in, in CDTI, that is using the evaluation that these people in the European Commission are doing very well for uh, f uh, granting our, our companies that have passed um, um, part of the, of the, of the uh, threshold of, uh, of excellence, using the seal of excellence in particular of the EXE accelerator to have um, a funding uh, prepared for the companies that are uh, passing that. With this, we are uh, having a, a, a very, very low administrative uh, load or administrative burden, and this is a, a very Did good idea. Did you use the words very low? Very low. Very is low. Very low is very low. In front low of witnesses. Because at the end, yeah, I say, I don't know if there's someone <laughs> uh, who is here, but I know. Please I tweet it. Yeah, <laughs> please tweet it. But uh, I say, we take this um, um, advantage of, of this evaluation, and as far as they come with the evaluation, we grant uh, the money with, f with that. And we are using recovery funds for that. So I think this is a very good practice that I recommend you guys that uh, if uh, there are other member states here that uh, you can use because it's very easy to use and it's very well secured because uh, remember that administrative burden is not there just because we like it. It's there because uh, the public money needs security. For so sure. 
Uh, and before we leave you on stage, uh, I will uh, let Sarah uh, come in for a second now, but uh, we want to talk about the presidency, the upcoming presidency. But please, let Secretary Sara, uh, you weren't here yesterday, but as you no. can tell, there was a lot of uh, uh, interesting discussions and workshops. But uh, from your perspective, how can the Swedish ecosystem contribute to Europe, European deep tech innovation ecosystem? Thank you, and sorry for not being here yesterday, but I heard you had a really good day, and I also heard from my minister, about Bush, that's, that it was a, a great energy and a good day here yesterday. And also, I met a lot of you uh, in the City Hall last night, and I hope you had a really good time uh, having dinner in, in, the, in the Golden Hall. But uh, talking about uh, how we, the Swedish ecosystem can contribute, Sweden is a small country. Uh, our ability to punch above our weight can be summarized in openness, and willingness to, to coordinate, cooperate, and co-create. We thrive in working groups, uh, which explains some of the well-known consensus mentality to exemplify one of the main relative strengths identified behind Sweden's number one in EU innovation ranking is the high rate of public-private co-publications. That is extensive use of the triple helix uh, model of innovation. And for deep tech to thrive in Europe, we will need collaboration, not only in Sweden, uh, but between actors from all over Europe. <coughs> I don't know if you know, but yesterday we also mentioned the unified European patent system that was launched. Uh, what's your view on how that will be important for Sweden? Well, as a, a former lawyer, I know how complicated it can be. I know how frustrating it could be to file uh, in different countries. Uh, and I know how much money you spend, uh, certainly as, 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 as a small company. So um, we have, uh, during our presidency, been, been focusing to stress the importance of the European competitiveness. And I think this is really a, a key issue here. So, uh, And now you can, in one just one single application, uh, get, your, get your application into up to 17 member states from the beginning, and potentially up to 24 member states if we <laughs> get some <laughs> more countries to join. Uh, Negotiation on the <laughs> stage, very <laughs> elegant. <laughs> so I think that that's that's such a such a good thing, and we're super excited that we've been launching it, and it could save a lot of money. Uh, talking about administrative burdens for um, innovative businesses, and really yeah. get some push on the innovative ecosystem. Which was also one of the beautiful quotes from yesterday. Uh, someone was quoting Elon Musk saying, uh, patents are for the weak. Yeah. Uh, and then translating <laughs> that to, yes, we need to secure our system. We need to secure our patents yeah. and, our, and our IP. And that creates a level playing field. Teresa, you will, for the fifth time, take over the presidency. Yeah. Uh, what can we expect based on the conversations that we've had here today and what we hope to s talk about? Okay. Um, I say um, I'm a little bit uh, scared because of this very nice uh, event that we have seen to, uh, these two days. So I have to congratulate uh, Sweden not only for the events themselves, but also we had a very successful uh, competitiveness council last week in Brussels, and um, and I have to congratulate. And I think the I say the cooperation with them is very easy and uh, it's very it's very well done. I say what what we expect for the for for the Spanish presidency on the one hand is that you all guys you visit us in some of the events that we are organizing, but also that everybody contributes to the council conclusions that we plan to uh, to address during our presidency, mainly related on the one hand on something that is very important, that is the use of uh, science and innovation for policy for policy making. This is something that I think it's in the in the center of the European agenda uh, itself. But also we plan to uh, address and we are analyzing very much everything related with the uh, adoption of the new uh, European innovation agenda and the, uh, in, in, and the ecosystem and the innovation ecosystems and also the possible, uh, I say, the, the, the tr how to avoid inequalities uh, in these ecosystems. And uh, as a third thing, we plan to uh, have a reflection also in the use of the recovery funds uh, in research and innovation, which are these three things. We have a very uh, smooth um, conversations with the European Commission. We have had a very, um, very nice and very constructive uh, meetings with them. And uh, we plan to organize an innovator summit in Madrid 
uh, on the 10th of October, so you are uh, all invited for, for that. And we plan to organize also um, an event on Startup Village, which is something that sometimes in this uh, big entrepreneur uh, idea, we forget that there are many opportunities of entrepreneurship in uh, small villages. And just to finish, I want to recommend you uh, two, things, uh, two things that are useful for learning and that I have learned here in this, in this, uh, in this, um, in this conference. Uh, these are the two words that I think are very important uh, for you to know, talking about innovation and uh, deep tech. One thing, one one, one, of course, is that if we build cooperation, we need trust. And this, in Spanish, is called confianza. So, for, I say, this, this is the first lesson, yeah? Confianza is so very important. There's going to be a written test afterwards, don't <laughs> worry. And the second word uh, is risk. I say you have to take risks to, to go ahead. And particularly risk in Spanish is said riesgo, that is my name. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so you won't forget that, yeah? So thank you very much. Trust and risk. Uh, we will bring that to the presidency. And I think we've seen it here to, uh, today as well. Could and you, uh, please add my name into that fraction as well? Of course, Can move dig, brain? brave. Ah, brave. Well, okay. Something brave as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, it's not only a question of colors. But Anna, how are you going to beat this? <laughs> I cannot, unfortunately. The only okay. thing I can say is that Anna was the mother of uh, Maria. The okay. mother so, of you're free from everything. So, uh, <laughs> above all of you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> uh, uh, moving back to what we're supposed to do here <laughs> and tomorrow. Um, we have a day full of uh, workshops, so I was thinking as this was the reflective start of the day, maybe you could highlight some of the things that you th uh, think we should think about, uh, or reflect on, mentally marinate, contribute with, above and beyond brave, risk, trust and uh, <laughs> motherhood, we'll call it that. <laughs> Anna? So the, the European Commission could be the motherhood in any I case, uh, trying to facilitate <laughs> all this great collaboration. So of today's workshops, I, yeah. I've seen the agenda is fantastic once again. So there will be a lot of discussions about how we can boost the creation of deep tech companies in Europe and how we can more finance them. As I said, we have this great EIC program. I'm looking forward to the outcome of your discussion to see what we can do more at European level. In particular now, they are reflecting about the current challenges, the le technological leadership of Europe, what we can do more through deep tech innovation and the innovative companies. And Am I reading you correctly? You're asking for a to-do list. Yes, of course, <laughs> of course, because in the context of collaboration and cooperation and co-creation, we will only succeed in Europe in case if, if we collaborate all together and we are thinking all together. So that's the one thing. Second, Teresa spoke about the presidency's priorities. The regional innovation ecosystem, it is a priority. How the regions who will be the, the, the places where innovations are created, but also they are collaborating is a priority. So I would like also some feedback on that. What we can do more at European level for the pan-European innovation ecosystem. And third, I said it already yesterday, gender and diversity what we can do more to promote women in innovation. It has been proved, I, I'm not the scientist behind that, but the men probably are the scientists behind that, but more diversity in innovation brings better results. Yeah. Here, here. Sora, what are your uh, suggestions for us to focus on in the workshops today and uh, highlight? Uh, I would like to see constructive ideas on how to solve the funding gap when, when scaling up European deep tech companies. Uh, Europe, European European industries needs the competence and production capabilities from deep tech companies that are crucial to address big societal and environmental cha challenges. If you can't find financing for scaling up and if you can't find customers in Europe, we risk of losing some great companies uh, and their knowledge to the US and to Asia. Teresa? Final words? Yeah, just to finish, um, as a um, former engineer, because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in okay. my former times I was an engineer, I think that is very interesting learning by examples. This is something the engineers we do. So uh, what we will see today also are examples of uh, very interesting and very innovative um, companies that have been created. And I think uh, this is something that we have to take note because there are many examples and best practices to learn. 
No, I, I don't want to say it. I'm, oh. I just said I'm also engineer, so oh, we, okay. uh, <laughs> I uh, fully agree with Teresa. <laughs> we all fully agree. We look forward to uh, adding to your to-do list. We uh, look forward to adding risk, trust, bravery <laughs> into a day of deep tech. Thank you, ladies. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we will move on, and I will hand over to my imminent colleague, uh, Jennifer Schenker, and now starts the vision and reality of building deep tech companies in Europe. See you later. Jennifer, stage is yours. Thank you, and good morning. I'm Jennifer Schenker, Editor-in-Chief of The Innovator. Um, and it is my pleasure to um, welcome on stage uh, some of Europe's best and brightest deep tech uh, entrepreneurs. Um, so please come on up. So we're really lucky uh, here this morning because we have entrepreneurs representing three key areas for Europe's future. We have two entrepreneurs who are focused on fusion, which, you know, when it works, will provide the world with free, abundant electricity and uh, remove our de Europe's dependence on uh, foreign countries for energy. Um, we have uh, Heike Frunge, who is the CEO of Marvel Fusion in Germany, and Peter Roos, who is the CEO of Novaton Fusion from Sweden. We have two entrepreneurs uh, who are specialized in quantum computing, um, which is focused on, when it works, will uh, solve some of the world's biggest problems from targeted uh, uh, drugs that can be made more cheaply and quickly to combating climate change. Um, the innovation, uh, the head of the innovation agency in Israel compared uh, the quantum computing uh, to uh, the invention of fire and the wheel. Um, so that's how important that technology promises to be. <laughs> we also, I'm sorry, I, I, um, uh, we have a third quantum computing company uh, from France. Uh, so we have Maud uh, Vinet, who is the CEO of Sequence. And uh, I do want to note, which is really interesting, is we have three quantum computing uh, companies from three European countries that are each working in a different part of the quantum computing uh, field, and they all represent three different stages. Um, uh, sequence is early stage, um, the company uh, uh, f um, QBlox Quantum from the Netherlands, um, Eric Kivit uh, is uh, in the middle of his journey, and Jan Goetz uh, from uh, um, IQM is uh, later stage, and uh, so uh, we um, we will hear from them. And uh, last but not least, we have um, Rachel Reshev, who is CEO of Endurosat from Bulgaria, who is focused on space, the next innovation uh, frontier, and is going to help Europe uh, put eyes in the sky. Um, so without further ado, I want to get right into what the reality is of building a deep tech company in Europe. And I, I want to start with, uh, with Fusion. So um, I would like, uh, like, Heike, can you tell us a little bit about your journey? Um, you're focused on a special type of, of Fusion that, that's based on lasers. But tell us, who has supported you so far? Um, and um, then we'll, we'll jump over to Peter and, and have him do the same. Super. So, um, first of all, thanks for having two fusion companies on this panel. I believe what's super important is fusion is happening. Fusion is now. Fusion can have a major impact on the energy supply of Europe and really help Europe to gain serenity again in energy supply. 
And many people always thought that Fusion will be many, many years out. But like looking at the past two years, there has been a huge momentum in, this, in the industry. We have seen massive scientific breakthroughs. Scientists in the US showing for the first time ever that it's possible to create energy with fusion on Earth. Um, Peter and me represent two very different approaches to fusion. Um, we hope that both of us will be successful because that will be an amazing signal for the world because then we will have unlimited supply of clean, safe and reliable electricity. And now your question, like who is supporting us so far? So we are, or first of all, like we are, support, uh, we are pursuing a laser-based approach to fusion. Um, so we are utilizing latest laser technology that was awarded with a Physics Nobel Prize in 2018 um, to, to um, initiate the fusion process, shooting with those lasers on a small fuel pellet and, um, and igniting that fuel and producing the, the electricity that's um, that, that we need on this planet. And now, um, so far, we've been mainly supported by private investors. So we collected 60 million in private funding, um, Early Bird being the main investor in our last funding round. The German government now also gave us roughly 40 million um, in funding to um, develop our laser systems. That has been the first kind of public support for our technology to develop those lasers. So that has been an amazing signal. But given that this panel talks about what's the state of the European deep tech ecosystem, one also has to acknowledge that there's a huge gap between Europe and the US and Asia when it comes to fusion. So our competitors in the US have 10 to 20 times the amount of funding. Last year, 4.8 billion went into the private fusion space uh, by private capital. That's more than 20 years before accumulated. So great signal, fusion is happening, but 90% of that was invested into the, in the US. In the US, there is a regulatory framework for fusion already saying that fusion will not be regulated like fission. That's amazing news, like the regulatory framework that the US put out there. Huge planning security for the companies out there. There's milestone-based funding programs in the US dedicated to fusion, cost share programs for companies and with governmental support, cost share programs. So those are the things that really support an industry and that attract private capital. And I think that's something where like knowing that there's many of the uh, decision makers here, like putting in place an ecosystem that attracts private capital is super important. Okay, just um, one follow-up question before we get to Peter, and that is um, today there are how many fusion companies in the world and how many of them are in Europe? So there's 40 private fusion companies in the world, which again is amazing because we will see fusion if there's 40 private companies, but two-thirds of them are in the US. We have a handful here in Europe. Okay. And unfortunately, the center of gravity in Europe is also in the UK and not in the EU. So in the half of the companies in Europe are located in the UK where they've been very successful with building up a fusion cluster, fusion cluster bringing together private companies and public companies. Okay, thank you. Peter, so let's, let's uh, move to you now. So you're taking a different approach to fusion um, and you've gotten some important validation for your technology. Maybe talk just briefly about that and then talk about the support, the economic support that your company has gotten so far. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, just like he Heike said here, it, you need to understand that w when we're talking about 40 companies worldwide in a community with, with, a, with a market uh, that is predicted to be about 15 trillion US dollars value, uh, even if all 40 companies would succeed, the market is more than enough than we could uh, handle to meet the demands of, uh, of the future. So that is why we are more collaborators than uh, competitors. So just to be quite distinct about that. And uh, well, our approach uh, is quite different, but uh, we will, during the next year, validate if the concept of uh, solving the last missing piece, having a stable confinement of plasma, fusion plasma, if that proves out to be correct, we will have a very interesting fast track to commercial fusion. At least that is our approach and our hope. Uh, all right, so our, uh, how are we being supported? Uh, the EIT in Energy is our uh, main supplier, uh, main f uh, not only by funds but also by opening doors and the networking. You know, all we, these things are very important in, in the early stages of a company. 
We are also uh, having uh, KTH Holding uh, as a part investor of uh, the company, which is extremely important as well, not only by, me, by the funds, but also like I was talking about yesterday, the infrastructure they supply us with, the, the knowledge, the experience they have, uh, and of course, uh, uh, the credibility that a, a trademark like KTH uh, supplies as well. Uh, we have been funded, uh, so we can um, kind of, uh, we have the seed funded, uh, for making sure that we can uh, do the, this um, experiment that we're running right now. It will be assembled at KTH by the end of this year, and next year we will pro prove uh, if uh, our concept really works. We are adding some new money as well, uh, private investors uh, or institutes, uh, and luckily they are all from Europe. Uh, but I can say, uh, to get to the point a little bit, is that when we're talking about the next level of machines, we are planning already the next generation, which will be assembled in 2026. That type of capital that is needed is somewhat more difficult here in Europe. And the interest outside Europe is tremendous. We have been uh, approached by very, very strong uh, uh, countries and uh, uh, entities around the world who are willing to support us by means, by the infrastructure, uh, 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 all the university support, uh, money, of course. We want to be in Europe, but it's very important that we make fusion work. That is our first and highest priority. So let's talk about where the money, because Money is flowing into fusion at the European level, but where is it going? Yeah, actually, I mean, Europe was, uh, has been doing a great job when it comes to fusion. We were very early on to, uh, to be one of the, the main contributors to this, the largest, largest project in the world uh, by mankind ever, a polar project uh, included, the ITER project that is, uh, being, uh, build, that is building a fusion reactor in Kadarash in, in south of France, uh, where we have US, Russia, Japan, South Korea, the European Union, they are all partners doing this huge fusion reactor demonstrator. It has been taking a lot of time, a lot of money, and the private industry has, use, has been using the latest technology, uh, advanced computing, accelerating, and now uh, many of, uh, not only the, the private industry itself, many s predict that the solution to f work in fusion will happen in the private industry before we see it in this large uh, common project. But ITER, this project, is very important because it, they also supply with technology solutions that will be crucial for all the other private initiatives. So it's very important that we, that we continue to support it. But as Europe right now has an attitude, is that they are betting all the money in one horse and saying, hands off, we are doing our share, we don't need to bother, ITER will solve it. I'm sorry to say, I believe they will, but the timeline is not good enough. If, if I understand can I add correctly, one point oh, on that? Yes, so please. I can only reiterate what, what Peter was saying, like we need technological openness when it comes to new deep tech topics and we can't bet everything on one horse and ITER is a magnetic approach to fusion and 99% of the European efforts go, fusion efforts go into ITER. It was great when it was started in the 90s and that was the dominating technology back then, but now other technologies have come up and then we also need to adjust that, such a strategy along the way. That's one point. And the other point is, again, looking at the US, they are also contributing to ITER as an international science project, but they have their domestic milestone-based program for their companies. And I think that is what we need in Europe. Otherwise, we won't have European tech champions. And I think it's something that we missed in many of the technologies. Now is the point where we can still do it in fusion. In five years or so, that train will also have left the station. And then again, we will not have a European champion in fusion. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for that. I think it's, it's a very... Uh, important point because we do need to invest in scientific research, um, but we need to have a, p a clear path to commercialization. And if I understand correctly, the, the program in South of France um, is has a timeline of something like 2060, and there is no clear path to commercialization. And as you say, you know, 
in the U.S., uh, they are they they are doing things differently. So we there is a way to do both, and uh, it's important that Europe do that. So thank you for that. Let me now skip um, to space, and then we'll get to quantum. Uh, so describe a little bit. You 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 told me earlier that you know your company is kind of like uh, the space equivalent of um, the, the cell phone towers. You're building the infrastructure in space. So tell us exactly what that means and why it's important strategically for Europe to be there. Yeah, so um, imagine your lives without meteorology, without communication, without space weather prediction, without navigation. We are basically back to medieval ages. And the fact that people don't see satellites is because they're in space and we have them as a given. But satellites are exceptionally strategic asset. And our job at Endurosat is to build the next generation of satellites carrying to orbit any type of sensors, but much more st in a much more streamlined way. Sensors, I mean cameras, hyperspectral infrared cameras, visible light cameras, uh, navigation, communication sensors. And I think this is more than evident uh, strategic assets to Europe. And uh, there are a few challenges. Uh, along the way. If you take the rocket industry, uh, you've seen what happened when SpaceX entered the game and uh, other private industry players in the US. Uh, they literally made obsolete an otherwise successful European rocket industry. Uh, and I'm afraid that in the next two to three years, if there's no significant push on the European side on satellite technology, the same is going to be visible in the satellite technology world. And I, I'm, I'm uh, working so that this doesn't happen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so you're based in Bulgaria, um, and you know y you said there are a number of, of, of challenges. Um, you know you were in a country that doesn't have as as a developed um, innovation ecosystem as some other places. What are some of the special challenges that you have as a deep tap company being based there, um, and how are you overcoming them? Who, who has supported you so far? Yeah, so the challenges was. Uh, uh a bit uh, abstract for us because uh, Bulgaria still doesn't have a space agency and we still don't have a relevant space education in the country. So we had to start with the educational program that we financed ourselves to start up with within the cooperation with Sofia University. And I'm happy to say that today we are one of the fastest growing satellite companies in Europe and uh, we are one of the very few profitable ones and our major markets are US and Europe. But at the, b at the early stages was uh, quite difficult. We had to go and ask about 40 to 50 investors locally. Hey, I'm Raicho. We are building the next champion in satellite technology. And, and the, uh, the rep resp reply was always like, I'm sorry, what? And there were literally two guys that uh, asked the security guys to walk me out of their offices because they thought that we are mental all the time. So it's uh, literally, <laughs> this is the real story. It's not an exaggeration. So uh, we started slow, but uh, this also motivated us because uh, for us, the reality was, uh, with absolutely minimum financing to bootstrap a space technology company. It usually never happens. Uh, for us, the reality was either we go on the market, be exceptionally aggressive and competitive, and our products are good enough for the markets to endorse, or we die. And this was year after year, but this made us structured in a way that today we are only focused on the market. We love competing, we love competition, and we learn as we go further, and I think Europeans, we should be exceptionally more acceptable to the idea that we should compete. We should not be afraid of competition. We should forget more and more this free money type of uh, program and, and go to the competition type of program and, and let the market uh, decide who the winner are. And I think this way we'll have, again, an incredible treasure trove of entrepreneurs in space and deep tech and we'll have uh, uh, the leading role on the planet. Will you be able to raise enough money here? Yeah. Um, raising capital has always been challenges, uh, lately not so much, <laughs> uh, but uh, the reality is that we are approached more uh, from a fantastic group of US investors and, and foreign investors in Europe. Just to give you the context, building spacecraft technology and satellites requires capital. Again, we are profitable, so this puts us in a completely different position. Today we serve 210 customers around the planet, w almost every leading space agency, also majority of the new space companies in US and Europe using our technology, which we are really proud and, 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 uh, and really hope that this continues. But to build a satellite company further, you need to raise capitals in the vicinity of 50, 100, 150 million. This sounds like a lot of money, but for space industry, this is like a peanut money. 
and still in Europe, if you tell to a normal investor, well, I need 100 million to grow my business and to address the market that we have as a demand, it's becoming more and more uh, complicated. So I hope in the next uh, few years, we urgently start to st have strategic capitals empowering companies like ours to grow in Europe and not only globally. Okay, thank you very much. So now I want to move to to quantum computing and um, here too, uh, we are talking about uh, global races. Um, China is investing more than double than the EU, um, around $15.3 uh, billion dollars compared to $7.2 billion in Europe. Um, so let's talk about you know, what is the reality, what are the challenges for, for building a quantum computing company here? And Maud, I'll start with you. You're a spin out from the French research um, uh, CNRS Institute. Um, you're, you're just getting going, but you have a vision of how to get to quantum computing quickly. Just give us the headlines of, you know, what you're doing and then tell us what you see as the challenges. Okay. Um. Maybe before we go into the challenges, um, let me remind you that, as you stressed out, quantum computing is seen as a revolution of computing. It, it can actually enable solving intractable problems. And to give you an example, what we think of currently intractable problems can be calculating the chemical properties of uh, complex molecules, and it finds applications in um, finding new drugs, inventing new material to transport energy without dissipation or to design lighter, plane, lighter planes. So um, we're talking about high performance computing, a new disruption uh, for the whole industry. And what we're trying to do is to make that happen. And in Europe, it, it needs still scientific and technological breakthroughs. And in Europe, we're good. We're very good. Uh, last year, we got a Nobel Prize. Alain Aspe from France got rewarded for um, its discovery or its demonstration of entanglement. Uh, we've got a tradition of quantum physics. So we're good in science. We've got solid ground. Now, now what is at stake is actually to turn, and it's kind of like the story of ITER. We need to turn these scientific firsts into actual innovation and actual sustainable innovation for our society. So this is what Sequence is trying to do. We were uh, launched, we were created six months ago, and we've got a trajectory where we're coming from 15 years of public research uh, in France, in CEA and CNRS, and we were also, we were a lot funded by uh, European uh, European community. Um, Grenoble has taken the lead into uh, bringing quantum computing uh, into, uh, in, into innovation in the semiconductor industry because there is something unique in Grenoble uh, that we need to think of. In Grenoble, we've got fundamental research, we've got technological research, and we've got the semiconductor industry. And we've been interacting all together uh, since, since a while on different topics, and that enabled us to be the first uh, in the world to demonstrate that we can turn a, a standard transistor for the, from the semiconductor industry into an actual quantum bits. And this is really what we needed to, to show that we can bring it to large scale. And it happened in Europe uh, five years before it happened in Intel, which means we've got we really have the possibility to, to do scientific and technological first. Now we need to um, bring it to larger scale. And there we go, we come to the challenge. How do we, how do we take it to the larger scale? And uh, it has been said yesterday and today, of course we need money, we need talents, and I agree with everything that has been said. I think there's also something that we need is maybe we need to change our mindset. We need to make science and technology look cool uh, for the society. We, we miss talent and engineers, and actually 
we are able to shape a new, a new world and we are able to make a better future. And our young, uh, young people, uh, they need to understand that for th that, science is really uh, the ground that we must build on. So I think there's a, there's a work that you can help doing by changing how people perceive science and technology. And on the change of mindset, I think there's a second point where we can all work on is um, just make research and industry work together as a stream, steam, uh, sorry, seamless uh, flow towards innovation. And uh, we need to have people being able to go back and forth back and forth in, in research and industry and make it simple and, and have people understand and we sometimes have tendency in Europe to have research on one side and industry on, on the other side. And this is old fashioned. It cannot happen like that if we want to go fast. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I want to just follow up really quickly on one thing you said. Um, you know, maybe we need to change the way we talk about th these technologies. Maybe we get rid of the term deep tech as a bucket and instead describe what individual technologies can do. Think about if you went into high school and university classes and said, do you want to change the world? Do you want to have a huge impact? Do you want to make sure that we have personalized medicine, that we can, we can you know, combat climate change? Well, quantum computing is going to help us do that. Wouldn't it inspire more young people to do it? And what if we said, and you can do it shoulder to shoulder with your you know, compatriots in every other European country um, and, 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 and work towards building pan-European companies? Um, so uh, maybe that's something we should think about. Jan, I'm going to go to you because you are one of the best known quantum computing companies in Europe. Let's just give us a quick you know, um, picture of your trajectory and where you want to go from here. Sure. Uh, well, thanks for, for having me here. Maybe I want to focus a little bit on this reality and vision and how we can connect those two because I think we all have a great vision but the question is how do we get there right and in the early phases and I think this is something that we all share is we came up from great ecosystems and I think that's very very important let it be CA or TNO in our case it was VTT and Alto and in Finland to really have this local ecosystem to let something flourish to, to be the seed um, but then the question is how do you scale companies and what I've been telling over and over again and I think which creates a lot of positive resonance um, is the the story of SpaceX and how we can learn from it um, in Europe by using public procurement then to grow those companies that have been emerging from the ecosystem. So if you look at the, their story, basically the first revenues they made, actually uh, like quite significant revenues, it all came from public procurement. And I think this is something in, in Europe um, that we need to strengthen much more. It is happening in quantum, so um, I'm actually very positive about this. We are working very closely with the Commission, with individual member states who are procuring um, early quantum computers to let those companies grow and I think that's very important. It was also very important for us as a company to, to grow um, to then attract further private capital because this is what this revenue does. It activates so much more private capital which then can be used to kind of take the next steps. And I think if we do this in a clever way with the ecosystems that we have and the technology that we have, then we can come up to this vision. So you mentioned this pan-European technology companies. I, I have this vision of building something like a quantum Airbus, right? So really bringing together the, the skills that we have in the individual member states, because at the moment, unfortunately, it is still so that each member state tries to build their own quantum computer, does their own thing, which in my, um, let's say, honest opinion, is, is not the best way to do, because we have different expertise in, in France, maybe, in Germany or, or Finland. So why don't we bring this together and create a European project of it and really streamline the development because the problem is so big and the competition is so big that we cannot do it with kind of micro little companies here and there. We need to have this big vision, I think. Eric, I see you nodding your head. So, you know, what, what, you know, what has been your experience and, and do you think that that's a good idea? Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at Q blocks, um, when we look at a quantum computer as a whole, there's basically four building blocks that you need. So you need a good QPU, you need a cryostat, basically a fridge and wiring, you need control electronics and you need software. Uh, it's oversimplifying a bit, but what we said is 
we are very good at one thing, and let's do that one thing really well, which is the control stack, the el electronics that send signals to the quantum computer. And if you look in Europe, there is that difference in, in competencies. We have really good companies on the, the qubits. We have really good companies on the integration and the whole system as a whole. And we have really good companies in the control electronics. So if we connect that more together and work more together, I think we can innovate significantly quicker. And if you look at QBlox, what we said is if we do only that layer, we focus heavily on customers. So we do everything with sales. We're completely bootstrapped still. Um, and we grow, on average, 250% a year on revenue. Last year, even 400%, but it's by far not good enough. We need critical mass to innovate, and our competitors have much, much deeper pockets. So what we are kind of currently at is at a crossroads of we want to stay European, we want to kind of build that competence here, but we do not have ac enough access to funding to accelerate that growth further. Um, and maybe also as a, a, a question to the, to the audience, we have a few really good examples of how it can be done. What we have in the Netherlands is, for instance, Quantum Delta Netherlands. What is really good for us, and this helped us tremendously, is that's a one-stop shop where all these uh, quantum computing startups are working together. Uh, we get access to funding very quickly, so we don't need 100 pages for proposals to get some project of a half a million. Even, let's say, with a few pages, we can hand it in. We get an answer in a few weeks, and then when we get payment, we get a large tranche very early on in the project instead of a carrot somewhere down the road. And this really helps us to accelerate quick. And this has also really helped us to bring us to the point where we are right now. Okay, so going back to something Jan said, I want to I want to ask if you think that perhaps Europe could learn from uh, something that Israel is trying right now. They are um, building a, um, a a kind of trying to build a kind of quantum innovation ecosystem. And the way they're doing it is they're building a center that basically allows you know that has allows quantum anybody working in quantum to come in and experiment using the different technologies that are currently available and um, you know they're doing that as a way to attract uh, quantum companies from around the world plus corporates to come and test the technologies because it is technology agnostic as opposed to working with the big US uh, tech companies. So would it be a good idea for Europe to provide something like that on a pan-European level? Do I would absolutely say yes. Yes, that's, okay. we are very much keen on, on building that ecosystem, not just in the Netherlands, but doing that pan-European. Because we have all these companies, even on this stage, we have three companies from different layers, highly successful at what they do, and we can have a lot of value to each other. Okay, so we're... we're uh, Jennifer, maybe we should acknowledge sure. that, that Europe has taken a first step in that direction. Uh, the quantum flagship was launched in uh, 2016, roughly, and it, it, it was in the idea to um, foster the European ecosystem. It has kind of, for the moment, stayed theoretical. Mm -hmm. We've got to make it practical. Okay. But th th there is already something that is in the mind, and now we've got to take it to the next level. Okay, so we're almost out of time, and what I want is for each of you now to, in mo no more than one sentence, um, say, what will it take to keep you here in Europe, and what is the one thing you want the people in the room to walk away with from this panel? Peter. Thank you. Uh, I would like you to not sit back feeling confident that, all right, we're on track. We have uh, all the programs there. They are all covered. Thank you. I can continue to do my work next week, just like the week I did before. Be the hero to make the future of tomorrow. You have good stories to tell your grandchildren when you leave here. You were enabling fusion, quantum computing, next generation of satellites. Be that hero. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Finished. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> so I think by being that hero, you can enable having real European tech champions again. I've been missing those in the past 10 years. And we need to build true European tech champions again. We need to attract capital into Europe. Europe is not an attractive place to invest into deep tech. I'm happy to see that we have workshops on this this afternoon. And we need to be attractive to attract capital, to have the programs in place and build those champions here in Europe again. Jan. Well, 
one thing that wasn't mentioned also make it more attractive for corporates to engage in the whole play because nothing is better for a startup than actually to get an early customer from industry and i think this is also very much missing still thank you eric yes so my qu request would be lower the bureaucracy centralize decision making and help us uh, act, collaborate much quicker mod help us be a team we, to, to succeed we need team players We've got different skills and make it easy for us to work together and to, to play as a team. Um, we can win the competition if we are good players in a good team. Wojho, you have the last word. Yeah, so open market, all in on competition. Do not be intimidated by competition. Once you see the winners, support them so that we can have the best champions on the planet. Perfect, thank you all. Can we have a nice round of applause for these great entrepreneurs? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> Sorry. My bad, I, f I forgot to announce the break. Uh, so um, yes, you have coffee and please come back right after the coffee break and Bindi Karia will be uh, your moderator for uh, the, uh, the, the rest of this morning's program. Thank you very much.
Good morning, everyone. Did you have a good coffee break? Yes? Let's get some energy? So welcome to our second uh, session on day two. And this first panel, I think, is going to be so, 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 so interesting. We're talking with some of the largest funds in Europe and in the world from both public and private sector. So with that, I would love to invite up on stage Lars Froland, lecturer at MIT and EIC board member, Niklas Zenstrom, CEO of Atomico, and Mr. David Van Veel, the NATO Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges. <laughs> How are you three today? Doing well? Yeah, great. Yeah, great. So we're here to talk about how deep tech is critical for European green transformation and Europe's future resilience. But actually, can traditional venture capital take on that responsibility to protect EU strategic interest? So I want to see a little bit of a debate amongst the three of you. Um, and really, we're going to talk about the interplay of VC and public funding to see what we can do to secure Europe's future resilience. So with that, Nicholas, I want to start with you. Now, you produce at Atomico this wonderful report called The State of European Tech. And that's uh, delivered at Slush every year. I have to say the numbers in 2022 were rather depressing. However, you're bullish on Europe. I'm just sort of quoting a few things. But I see that also we see that Europe is leading when it comes to ESG thinking. Now, according to the report, purpose-driven tech is accounting for more than half of early stage investments into companies uh, addressing UN SDGs globally. What does this mean? Are we on a good path? And what are the pressures that you receive in these investments about returns to the fund? And then I'll ask a follow-up question from sure. there. Yeah, so first of all, you know, the state Euro European tech in general is amazing. It's, it's, uh, we're really, really, really working. 2.7 trillion uh, dollars, euros in total value. And on early stage funding, Europe is now, le Europe as a le region, not only EU, but as a region, is now leading uh, on, on um, investment rounds under 5 million. Europe is now exceeding US with 33% market share. And the conversion rate from seed to kind of unicorn billion dollar company is the same in US as, as in Europe. So we should be really proud of what Europe as a region has achieved as an ecosystem. And I think the key word is ecosystem because it's not as individual companies, individual investors. And the other thing that we've seen a big shift over the last few years is that uh, new founders are addressing uh, pressing issues like climate, uh, uh, biodiversity, but also health and in general kind of really, really aligned with SDG. And what they see is that they see these big problems and they see an entrepreneur, a problem is an opportunity. So Europe is really leading the, um, um, when it comes to purpose-led uh, founders. But these founders, they want to create companies that can have a big impact on the, on the climate and other uh, societal issues, but they also want to create sustainable financial companies that want to you know, be successful financially as well. So purpose and profit is, is actually reinforcing it. And in, in last year when actually in, in China and, or Asia and, and US, those kind of purpose-led investments really went down with something like 40%, but in Europe it kind of stayed, stayed, stayed um, the track. So we're actually in a really good, good stage. Most of these companies are not deep tech companies, to be very clear, because it's harder to start a deep tech company and it's such a big risk to, 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 to get funding. So that's all good and golden, but what are the pressures you're receiving from your LPs for, for yeah. this kind of, yeah. what I'll say for lack of a better yeah. word, do good technology? And how does that di differ from the public sector sure. LPs that you have sure. in your fund? So first of all, there's we have, an amazing set of European institutions, the pension fund system, the um, reinsurance companies, and EIF, which has been a great supporter of European tech. A lot of things that we hear, and, and all our colleagues here, that they want to see not only paper returns, but also want to see money coming back. So DPI is the keyword that, they say, that they're saying. So that means that they put pressure on short-term uh, liquidity, because if you want to support a deep tech company, you might have you know, 10 years from you know, Series A funding until even in commercial service. Yeah. 
So you need to stretch the horizons, and these, the funds are set up as 10-year funds, and, and with you know, two or three years extension is really short. You need to have longer, longer horizons. So that's the kind of the battle that we're having with, with um, or, or not battle really, but it's like... It's a tension. It's a, it's a bit of tension, right? So because yeah. you want to support these de uh, deep tech companies, but it takes time for them. The J curve for them, you put more and more money into them, and b before you see kind of some kind of return. Yeah, and, and so I'm going to switch then to, uh, to Lars. Mm -hmm. I want to look at the current uh, macroeconomic downturn. And we were having a debate last night at dinner, are we in recession? And it was quite a resounding yes. And what we're seeing is US and North America, Asia and North America have decreased their investment in the sector by 40% in 2022. Um, I'm also aware that in the UK, European continent, uh, they've also softened their stance on these ESG technologies. They are telling the big PLCs not as much focus on ESG, which I think is interesting. Um, but Europe continues to maintain its strong focus. So wearing your new hat around tech sovereignty, congratulations, it was announced yesterday, plus the work you did to set up the NATO fund I guess, what are your views on this, Lars? Um, let me just respond maybe to some of the first things that, that, that you mentioned. I, I think that um, on the answer, will the current predominantly exit-driven venture capital system uh, deliver European sovereignty? Will they deliver that we get to having great companies that actually have both sustainable and great production in Europe and for Europe? The answer is no, I do not believe so. Uh, because it's simply not the way that it's been set up. It's yeah. not the way that it is optimized for in that sense. That doesn't mean that it's not part of the solution, but it needs an alternative. And I think where I'm mostly focused on is like, how do we build an alternative that can take much larger portion of the uh, technological risk? I think that was some of the ideas that went into both the NATO fund, but also into, uh, into the EIC. And I think that predominantly what we need to just realize is that we can't solve this problem of uh, massively reindustrializing Europe in terms of all the green transition because I don't think we're sort of kidding ourselves. This is, you know, let's get some of these companies on the market. I was very inspired by Massimo uh, yesterday and his presentation of like, what we're actually trying to do here is, is, is very fundamental. Yeah. So I think the taxpayers' money won't cut it then there are other, there's a lot of money out there, but I think the key problem still, so the must-win battle for Europe still remains that our pension funds, our family offices, and our foundations are not enough involved uh, in, in, in solving the problem. Um, uh, I don't know if you saw that came out this report, that uh, I think the percentage was that now 15% of the ownership in German venture capital is American pension funds. Yeah, so we get surprising. into a situation where <clears throat> if those companies in Germany do very well, it goes great for American pensioners. Yeah. How does that work? <laughs> Good for them. Good for them. But maybe we should try to do yeah. something a little bit differently in Europe. And, and I think fundamentally we come down to that problem that we, we simply need to, to leverage that type of, of trusted private capital to, uh, to, to get anywhere. And You're if, already we don't, if we're not solving well. that... Then we get to another problem. <laughs> then was the ESG. Okay. Yeah. So oh, the no. ESG, I, yes, I think, have a focus on ESG. I think we need to take stock of a situation where uh, we have a war, uh, we have a climate uh, crisis, but the war has also learned us that defense and security is important to us in a completely different way. And we also talk about defense and security in a completely different way than we did, I would say, about a year ago. And when we talk about security, uh, we also talk about, you know, uh, energy security, food security, and those type of things. Uh, so in a way, uh, in the perfect world, you know, you might actually add the D and S of defense security to ESG. So maybe we need to go into a world where it's ESG, DS. Okay. Uh, into now that. that's interesting. And I think that will be interesting. Okay. Well, that's a great segue to you, David. So, um, David, you're, you're from NATO. And it's a very different world to what any of us in the audience, most of us in the audience, are used to occupying. So I would just love to get a bit of background on the, the NATO Innovation Fund, the thinking behind it, and how do you think that fund is going to contribute to what 
Nicholas and Lars have been talking about. Yeah, thank you. And first of all, thank you for, for having me here uh, uh, as the old one out at uh, this innovation event. Um, but I think that NATO has woken up that uh, uh, we have a problem in adapting and adopting new technologies. Uh, innovation cycles are going quicker and quicker, uh, and we see that the traditional defense industry is not geared towards this innovation. And that leaves us uh, uh, on the back foot, and that's not a place where we want to be when it goes down to defending uh, the one billion citizens of NATO. So the NATO Innovation Fund is one of the initiatives that we came up with uh, in order to engage more with young entrepreneurs, with startups, in a more agile manner uh, to make sure that they see that there's a dual-use perspective. Uh, so we can be early customers uh, through the defense institutions. We have patient capital. The NATO Innovation Fund, uh, the first sub-fund, has a runtime of 15 years and 1 billion euros. Uh, so we're able to take the lead in investment rounds. Uh, and, and all the startups we saw in the previous round, they all yeah. have a dual-use perspective. Uh, and, but and actually, can you go a little bit more deeply into that? Because I think the audience, probably all of us need educating about yeah. dual-use. And then the other thing I remember we were talking about last night were the optics around that. How yeah, do we so do this for the good of Europe? So, Julius, when we come from NATO, uh, a lot of the thinking is about missiles and rockets and bombs, etc. But if you look at the war in Ukraine and the role that innovation is playing there, then a lot of it comes from dual-use technologies. It's the use of AI to translate automatically intercepted Russian soldiers calling home. Uh, it's the use of satellite imagery enhanced with AI uh, in order to discover tanks under the foliage. Uh, it's the use of commercial drones uh, to get a better situational awareness picture. So there's a lot, well, Starlink, uh, just yeah. to name a small uh, company that's playing a huge role uh, uh, in, in, in this war. So a lot of technology that is being developed for civilian applications really also has a use in the defense and security sphere. I was talking to one Dutch startup in, in, in making energy from plants, for example. Yes, you probably all know there. her, Marjolein. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but this, if you have soldiers in a remote camp being able to provide for their own energy resilience, that is a huge win uh, from the operational side. Yeah. So don't think tanks and missiles, uh, but I'm pretty sure that if every which one of you, if I talk to you, uh, I will find a dual use purpose in the technology <laughs> that you're developing. The food delivery drones, we were talking about that last night, weren't we? Yeah, I yeah. often <laughs> use the analogy that we use 10 ton diesel trucks based on Excel spreadsheets as logistics in the military, whilst uh, there are companies that can deliver whatever I want by drone to wherever yeah. I am. It, uh, it's great, it's great. Yeah. So then this brings me nicely to sort of the next um, subject of crowding in. And we've talked a lot about that when, with my former EIC board hat, that was the very beginning. How do we crowd in and work with the private VC sector um, and collaborate? Uh, particularly because we need more growth capital. Nicholas, you talk very well about it's not just a 10-year cycle. Um, can the two grow together? Can we crowd in? So, uh, so David and, and Lars, can the public funds crowd in with Nicholas? And Nicholas, ca can you guys work together? That's a genuine question. So Lars and then yeah. Nicholas and then David. I'm happy to start. Yeah. Uh, the, the answer is, of course, yes, and the EIC fund is doing that massively, by the way, already. Uh, I, think, I think there is a, um, um, you know, I think we've come to a stage now where there is becoming a clearer, clearer sort of um, way of looking at the different roles, because as soon as we talk about deep tech, um, a lot of the deep tech have significant technological risk. And I think we've been a little bit clearer on when actually the public funding, the taxpayers' money in the end, and I would like to add to that also the pension funds, blah, 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 is actually very much a part of, of de-risking on the technological side. I think we need to do what we're best at. So one of the key things that I've seen from some of the best VCs, but first of all, they're not just about capital. What they're very, very good at is actually working with the companies you know, bringing them to the market together with them. It's all, not only about board seats, but the way that you work with the founders and all, all of those type of things. So really finding that sort of division of labor on who can actually provide some of the capital for the de-risking on the technological side, and then who can actually be on the more commercial side. I think we are finding a very, yeah. good, a very good balance there. Starting to, but there's yep. still some cynicism from the private sector. There is, and, and we, we've all heard that. So, um, Nicholas, what no, do you think? So Okay, yeah. okay, now Lars, you had one, but um, I want to hear what Nicholas yeah. has to say as yeah. well. So, first of all, it's all about collaboration. Yeah. And there's uh, these deep tech companies are so underfunded. And 
one thing you mentioned growth capital this is not about growth capital because once these companies are starting to scale revenues and get somehow into profitability there is a lot of growth capital in the world maybe right now there's a bit um, hiding under the rocks but it exists what we need now is the funding you know so the companies that we have were on stage they probably need i don't know a few billion euros each of, until they're really commercial yeah they probably all think they need less but they're going to need two three times four times more are going to take much longer time and so we have this, we have invested in several deep tech companies in, in food security in, in a German company, electrical aviation, you know, quantum computing, uh, uh, AI chipsets, and it's most of those the investors are you know private investors. There's like VCs, you know, maybe some family offices, maybe some corporate VCs, and. It becomes a real problem when you know you have the, this. We, we talked about the early stage funding is is really f been flourishing for seed funding, also for deep tech climate companies. But when when these companies need and you know VC can maybe put in 10 million, 25 million, but then these need, companies need you know a billion until they have profitability, and that's the gap that need to be plugged, and that's what we need to collaborate. And and it's like. You know, some of the deep tech companies in European companies we invested in. It's like, who are the like the investors who are coming in after us? Is you know, Chinese corporation, a Middle East, you know, sovereign wealth fund. Yeah. One company had to go public in, in in New York. It's just we really, really need to. This is just an opportunity, but we also yeah. need to execute and make it happen and really work together. You know, and 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 then. That's the big. That, that's I think the big opportunity. So then, David, actually, again, last night we were chatting about some of the vision for the NATO fund and what what's been set, and and how can you can can you sort of comment on that collaboration? Because it strikes me that a lot of the thinking that you have put into the fund and the execution sort of answers a lot to what uh, both Nicholas and Lars spoke about. Yeah, that, that's the advantage. If you're late to the game, then you can adapt to uh, mm -hmm. the problems that you actually see in the world out there. So a lot of nations within NATO in the beginning said, well, we don't support this idea because NATO is not an investment machine. It, it can't do it, and it can't do it in the right way. Uh, and, and we realized that. So the way we set up the NATO Innovation Fund, it's actually the world's first multi-sovereign venture capital fund, but it is a proper venture capital fund. The 23 nations that are donating the first billion, they are limited partners, so they don't have any influence on the individual investments. There's no just retour. Uh, the senior management team, for those of you in VC, uh, when we announced them very shortly, you will recognize them. So they're recognized uh, people from the venture capital industry. So we're trying to do what we can to combine the best from VC world uh, uh, in setting up a proper venture capital fund with the best that we can offer as an international organization, and that is actually adoption of technology. So a large part of uh, uh, the, 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 the thing that the fund should do is actually make sure that there are customers and that we make sure that this technology makes it into actual capabilities. Okay, so do you really think we'll be able to work with the military industrial complex? Will those two cultures well, the, the complex, I don't know, because I think <laughs> something needs to change in that complex. Yeah, uh, because yeah. we've been working on the basis of requirements there uh, and, and, and continuously ev evolutionary uh, uh, improving what we have. Uh, these technologies that we're talking about, deep tech, are game changers. So that means the, the military industrial complex needs to change. But the military personnel are definitely ready for this. They see now a gap when they come into the armed forces. They see a gap between what they see on their PlayStation uh, and what the military is actually operating with and what the capabilities uh, uh, are. Okay, interesting. So, in the final five minutes, I want a good quotable snapshot <laughs> view from each of you on the collaboration, the crowding in, the coexistence, and the shared goal for a sustainable long-term future for deep tech in Europe. So, Lars, can I start with you on that? Okay. Um, <laughs> You had a few good so nuggets, I'll, I'll you told probably me. take on, uh, as, as you heard yesterday, Commissioner Vestager announced, you know, some things around, you know, the sovereignty fund that will, you know, and I think if we take the sovereignty perspective, and uh, we probably should ask ourselves the question in, um, in Europe, uh, so there's fundamentally two ways to compete. You can compete to win, and you can compete not to lose. I think we fundamentally in Europe has been incredibly good at competing not to lose and we have forgotten how it is to compete to win. And by the way, competing to win starts by asking the question, how does winning even look like? 
And I don't think we have found an agreement on that fundamentally, neither, yeah. I, quite frankly, at the political level. And I think the sort of comes down to like, what does sovereignty actually look like? For with whom? The nation state? Europe? Europe with US? Or right? the those are the those are those are the critical yeah. questions to actually answer. I think as soon as we have answered those things and we know how winning could look like, then I think we can devise an actual strategy around how you would actually invest to actually compete to win. All the things I just said, you know, around you know getting those new LPs uh, on board are very very important, but we still have a very significant European sickness, which was also mentioned by some of the entrepreneurs who was up here, which is that we're not very, very good at using the market creation piece, right? You know, the US is very, very good at using public procurement to create markets, and I think we need to be much better at that, because eventually, if we don't solve that problem, we can pour as much money in the right way, strategic capital, whatever you want to call it, patient, catalytic, at the end of the day, those companies will go to where the market is, and your will end up being what it is currently, an accelerator for the rest of the world. Yeah. So I think let's start by actually giving, maybe have some kind of a vision of how winning actually looks like, because then we can compete to win. Very good. Thank you. Nicholas, what great. do you think? That's uh, it's great. Yeah. I love um, this ambition that there's such an opportunity. But I also think that it's actually an infinite game. It's, if you look, see, listen to these entrepreneurs who were on stage before us, their objective is to make their technology, uh, the world, more sustainable. And entrepreneurs are also mobile. You know, investor, venture investors are also mobile. So I think we need to kind of, is, is we should not f focus on the borders here. We need to think about the infinite game. But we also need to make sure that there's sovereignty in terms of innovation and long-term sustainable companies staying in Europe and Europe as a region. And it's all about collaboration. And... and um, but we need to unlock, we talked about the pension funds, you know, 0.018% of the pension funds um, com um, investments goes to venture capital. Um, and for every dollar they invest in, in venture, it's about $20, $23 in buyout. Buyout doesn't create anything. It's, it's a financial engineering, you know, create maybe more efficient company, but it's not about innovation. So we really need to pull all of these things we're talking about, but we need to accelerate it and we need to yeah. work together. But it's important also that uh, the worry I have is that when you have, you know, governments and policymakers are going to start doing, taking, you know, do venture capital work, that we should work together and, and hand in hand. And we need to find models where we can kind of where, because these companies need to be de-risked. And, and, and that's, what, that's, I think, that's an opportunity. So I think it's a great opportunity to continue those, you know, this dialogue <sighs> later on. And yeah. I was hoping for a bun fight, but I really like no. it. <laughs> <laughs> that, like, the, there really is some great agreement <coughs> about the bigger goals. Last minute, over to you, David. Yeah, it's one minute, so I'll just yeah. steal them from Lars. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of them is I like the ESG for security and defense. Uh, I think that would mean we've come a long way from putting defense industry at the same level as tobacco and porn. Uh, uh, I think we now realize after the invasion in Ukraine that we actually need to look after our security, mm. uh, otherwise nothing else matters. Uh, and from that perspective, I steal the same one from uh, Lars as well. If you compete, uh, and we are competing uh, to maintain our technological edge, to avoid ever coming into conflict, then you need to compete to win. Uh, because in conflict, there's no prize for second place. Uh, and this is a whole of society effort. And, and that's, I think, where I, I, I agree with Nicholas as well. This is not something that just NATO or just the public sector can do. Uh, this needs to be a whole of society effort uh, to, uh, to, to keep us at the top. Okay, well with that, thank you very much, the three of you, for your great insights and your leadership in helping thank drive you. this change. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great panel. So, so, so interesting. Okay, with that, we've got two presentations coming up. Um, a deep chat dive into innovation and production of deep tech companies in Europe. So we've got two presentations, and the first one will be from Jean-Christophe uh, Lalou, the Director General of Head of Lending and Advisory Operations of the EIB. With that, over to you. One, two, three, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. So I've been tasked with entertaining right. you for 10 minutes. That's fun. 
um, to keep you away from my mobile phones if I can. Um, and so the first thing I'm going to try to do is uh, to convince you that uh, it's worth listening to me. So why would the head banker of the large bricks and mortar EIB, so we are the bank of the 27 member states, if you, if, if, for those of you who do not know the European Investment Bank, we've been financing bridges and roads and all the bricks and mortar for a long number of years. But as it happens, we also have um, recently um, branched into a more... Um, interesting activity, I find, or at least uh, an activity closer to the theme today, we have a portfolio of 5 billion euros of venture debt and equity type investments, which we perform directly. If you ever heard of BioNTech, the Pfizer vaccine, right, we financed them way before the pandemic for their oncology efforts. Jan Goods, who is probably here, whom some of you have been listening to, is also uh, in our portfolio of companies supported through the venture debt investment. So we've got a bit to say. We do about 400 million euros of uh, deep tech finance directly, and we also finance indirectly through our subsidiary, the European Investment Fund. So with that, I think, I hope I can um, contribute usefully to the debate and convince you that EIB has a number of things to say on the subject. So what I'm going to do is two things. I'm going to bring some analytics to some of the things that have been exchanged and then tell you about uh, the, uh, what we try to do in terms of, of solutions. So it's been said, um, but here you, you see it in figures. We are good at innovation. We are very good at innovation. On the right side of the graph, you have the number of patents held by European universities by country. Um, UK is still remarkably in the lead, but then Germany, France, Switzerland, interesting to see that some of the smaller countries, Switzerland in particular, have got uh, quite an, an ability to generate a number of patents. Um, some have also mentioned it, ecosystems are really important for that. And uh, we, ha we, say, we see a number of ecosystems, and I, I, I'll come back to this. So we're good at innovation. Are we good at um, translating innovation into um, small-scale companies? Well, there the picture is already more doubtful. On the right side, you see in red the number of US firms, SMEs, holding patents in the, um, in the fourth industrial revolution. And on the blue, you see EU27. Yeah, the, the, the characters are a bit small, so I'll read the... Uh, I'll read the uh, uh, the small print for you. Uh, the grey line is uh, the rest of Europe. So it seems that we have lost, right? We are very good at innovating in universities. We're not so good at translating this into SME firms. What is you can also see on the right side of the graph is that uh, there are some interesting clusters, but clearly we have a two-speed Europe here. We have very dark blue patches. It's where the clusters of innovation are, but the rest of Europe seems to be uh, remarkably white. So, with this, where do we stand in terms of sectors? Um, this is on the right side of the graph, a study of McKinsey that actually presents the competitiveness of Europe versus the United States in the various tech sectors. What you see is that the larger and the darker the bubble, the more competitive we are. So take a look at the picture. Mm. We're really competitive in the two lines below. What are they? They are next-gen materials, so nanomaterials, composite materials, and semiconductors, and the future of clean tech. So solar, wind, hydro, nuclear, electric vehicles, and hydrogen. So we are really good at the intersection of Europe between clean tech and deep tech. This is really where we Euro currently still have the lead in Europe. I would add biotech to this. For the rest of it, so everything that has to do with digital, applied AI, future of programming, um, distributed infrastructure, future of connectivity, 5G in particular, we seem to be edging behind the competition. So the key question is, how are we going to keep in the lead on the things where we still have an edge? And I will leave again the case of biotech aside at the moment, but, and I will concentrate on the future of uh, clean tech and on the next-gen uh, material. This is a key sector because we think that it will account for half 
of the growth of the GDP in the coming years, in particular around the energy transition. We are a global leader in the development of new technologies that combine digital and green. So when these two things are there. And this is another way to see it. This is on the left side, the number of digital patents in 2010, where you see that Europe in blue, both in terms of count, the full line, and in terms of share, the dotted line, is behind the US, which is in black. So this is on the left side, the digital. Combine digital and green, the lines switch. We are ahead. The blue line, which is Europe, is on top of the black line, which is the US. The problem, and it has been already evoked in this uh, conference, is the problem is that uh, the funding levels are going down quite sharply in, 2000 and in 2022. This is another uh, way to see it. And the trend has been down already for quite some time. So, absolute investments in level, uh, levels in Europe are generally too low. And um, scaling companies, and it has also already been mentioned, but you see some of the analytics here, scaling uh, companies um, in particular is a problem. Um, the investment volumes for early and breakout stage for deep tech companies are in absolute terms too low to secure, to continue for us to secure our competitive advantage. Here are some of the figures on the bottom uh, side of the graph. Uh, US around 166 billion euros invested in the deep tech um, between 20 and 22, uh, around one third of that only in Europe. Okay. So, why is this? Well, you could say, well, deep tech has got a longer, um, the so called value of death, right? The J curve effect. Uh, you need to spend a lot of cash before you start earning some cash. That is true. You can say that about the deep tech compared to conventional tech, but is it specific to Europe? No, it is not. Therefore, the problem is probably not there. Where could the problem be? Well, look into the studies that have been produced and the way we have uh, asked some of the companies around, and some of them have already said it. What is the number one cause, according to a study from the BCG, what is the number one cause in not being able to... Uh, to scale up companies and, and, and to deploy business plans on the right side of the graph, on the graph, it's raising large rounds of financing. So raising large rounds of financing and finding a lead investor are the two main causes of uh, difficulties uh, for companies at the moment. So there is clearly there a question of supply and a question of demand. On the supply side, we in Europe have about one-tenth, compared to the Americans, of large funds with deep pockets able to put between 50 and 100 million ticket sizes uh, on the table. So that's one of the things that we need to solve. On the supply side, on, on the demand side, the number of sizable investment opportunities from which large investment funds could benefit from is too limited in Europe. So we definitely need to work on uh, fostering and, um, and, and focusing clusters on the deep tech to make them more attractive for investors and have a larger pool of, of, of companies actually bidding for, for funding. So there is a very continued uh, story of uh, um, both supply and demand side, which in, in our view um, justify the fact that we would continue to uh, deploy some of the instruments. And I will make it only very brief here. I have very little time remaining on my presentation, but we, the uh, EIB group, which means the uh, European Investment Fund and the European Investment Bank, um, together with our colleagues from the European Commission, this is a team effort, can support both indirect equity, so investment into funds, and there we have announced, together with a number of member states, uh, the setup of a very large fund of funds that will try to support uh, uh, the birth of more 1 billion plus funds in the European market, the so-called European Tech Champion Initiative that is powered by our colleagues from the EIF. So we can invest into funds, so that indirect equity, and we can also provide direct equity or quasi-equity 
into uh, clean tech and deep tech companies through uh, the products that are there depicted on the graph, which is what we call thematic finance or a standard uh, venture debt. We can also, uh, through, and Jean-David will talk about this in a moment, you have, to, you have heard about it, we also uh, partner with our colleagues from the European Commission, we're technical advisor to the EIC, the EIC providing direct equity. So the instruments are there, we're going to try to continue to scale them up, and uh, we're going to, um, to try to, provide, to, to continue to provide uh, the solution. What we think, as a conclusion to all of this, is that we, uh, at the moment, uh, really cannot disarm in terms of efforts, both on the public and, uh, and on the private side. Um, I think it has been said in particular by the, by the Bulgarian gentleman from the satellite industry, we should not shy away from market competition. This is understood. But at the same time, um, we need more patient capital in Europe, and we need to also provoke uh, a, a supply side effect uh, by continuing the efforts uh, to, um, uh, to support uh, promising uh, companies. So this is both at uh, pre-seed, pre seed stage, but also on the scale-up uh, uh, stage of, of, of financing. So our next efforts uh, for now will be focused uh, together with our colleagues from the European Commission in bringing more money into the scaling uh, effect, so not so much into the early stage, but more on the scaling effect, uh, both indirectly by helping to, to the birth of more 1 billion plus funds and also directly by scaling up uh, our venture debt product and the, the direct investment that we perform. And with this, I have exhausted my time. I'm uh, s five seconds ahead of time right now. Thank you very much for having listened to me. Thank you very much. Wow, 50% of late stage funding comes from outside Europe. That's a very, very interesting number. We'll talk about that in the next panel. So with that, I'd like to introduce Jean-David Malot, the director of EIC, an SME executive agency, and I'm sure he'll have some great insight to share as well. Good morning. Um, I'm really delighted to uh, be here with you this, uh, this morning. Um, I think that uh, the uh, precedent presentation uh, by Jean-Christophe was very illuminating on the situation, very inspirational. Uh, and in this context, in order to complement, in fact, its, uh, its presentation, I'd like here to focus uh, on one part of uh, the solution that has been uh, established at the level of uh, the Union, which is the launch of the European Innovation Council. And if we go to the next slide, um, I would like to um, start by recalling you uh, what was the analysis that was done, which is in fact echoing what Jean-Christophe uh, just said a few minutes ago. Europe has uh, a number of strengths, uh, an excellent uh, capacity to generate knowledge, to make great research, uh, and this is exemplified, uh, for example, by the great number of uh, publications that we have in top journals coming from uh, European researchers. We have a very attractive research organization and universities uh, we have a remarkable tool which is recognized worldwide regarding basic research, which is the European Research Council. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we are facing for several decades now with two main gaps. Our difficulty, remaining difficulty, to move from this generation of knowledge, mainly generated in lab, to fab to the transformation of this knowledge into innovative processes, innovative products that ultimately could lead uh, to the creation of value, creation of companies and of jobs. And second, uh, we have uh, another weakness, which is not our capacity uh, to, um, 
uh, generate uh, the creation of uh, startups, including uh, deep tech startups, because there we are comparable to the situation of uh, uh, the United States. But where we remain weak, and the main reason where explained a few minutes ago by Jean-Christophe, it is in our capacity to accompany the growth of these companies and to take risk to ensure that uh, we have for some deep tech, company, deep tech companies that need patient capital, uh, this kind of means, that we are ready to take risk. This called for the idea to create, in fact, the European Innovation Council with the objective to cover the whole journey from the generation of an idea that may launch the creation of emerging technology up to the support and the scaling up uh, of deep tech startup and SMEs that have the potential to lead emerging markets. This is the role rationale of the EIC, so a program which is covering this world journey. In other words, with this program, we would like to continue to invest where we are strong, capacity to generate knowledge for emerging technology, and this is the purpose of one of our program, which is the Pathfinder, which is a purpose to support advanced research, but also to tackle the main gaps that I just identified a few seconds ago, uh, which are the move from lab to fab with a program called Transition, where we would like to give a last push, in fact, uh, to these new ideas generated uh, by basic research or semi-applied research into a transfer of this technology for uh, a company or up to the creation of a company. And ultimately, and this is of course the art of the EIC, to accompany our most promising startup and SMEs uh, in their growth with the accelerator uh, program. I'd like to focus in particular on, uh, on this accelerator program, echoing what um, uh, Jean-Christophe has just mentioned a few minutes ago. For our promising deep tech companies, it's absolutely essential that we are providing them with the necessary means. By necessary means, I mean, of course, the necessary financial support, meaning that if we want to help a company to grow up, it's not only by providing it uh, a grant support that we can help it, but it's also by providing them capital. And by providing them capital, we should be, uh, and this is the ambition of the EIC, progressively the investor of choice, allowing to aggregate among him all other actors with a crowding in effect because our purpose here is not to have a crowding out effect on the investors, but on the contrary, to create the condition to aggregate all the investors. And this was a rationale for the creation of the accelerator and of its EIC fund, which became very quickly, in particular in the context of the pilot actions that we launched in 2019, 2020, one of the most important early stage uh, investment fund, as it was recognized in 2022 by SIFTED, with the most important number of deals and a total of decide decision of investment of around 600 million euro. By doing this, we have created, in fact, an appeal on the market. And I just would like to illustrate this, because my time is counted, uh, by some of the companies that uh, we have selected all over the Union, in particular in the last two years, out of which, as you can see, more than 500 have been selected for equity or blended finance investments, and for which we have already started to have a number of investments together with other investors. The type of investments that we are doing with the IC fund with the great support of uh, the EIB uh, and with the uh, funds that we have created and uh, our AEFM uh, is uh, it's typically uh, either 
um, uh, direct equity in a round, round A, round B, uh, or in order to prepare a round, a convertible loan for short maturity in order to attract other investors. And in particular, it was mentioned as a main uh, strength, I mean, the main weakness to tackle by, uh, by Jean Christophe to uh, attract a lead investor. In this context, if we move to the next slide, uh, you can see that uh, we are selecting our companies in two ways. A bottom-up approach, because we consider that innovation can pop up in any domain, so we should harvest everything that is coming up, but also a top-down approach with some challenges calls that are in direct relation with the priorities of uh, the union, the green and the digital transition, the necessity to uh, ensure tech sovereignty and to uh, maintain some value chain in Europe. And as a result, we have uh, a portfolio of uh, projects that are in the following uh, main uh, areas that are echoing what uh, Jean-Christophe just mentioned a, a few minutes ago. What is essential, and uh, I will uh, finish in a, in a second my presentation with the next slide, what is essential in this context is, of course, to develop a very important network of co-investors. Uh, we are working intensively with the community. We have a, a, a network of co-investors which has reached now more than uh, 1,000 co-investors in our, in our network. Uh, some of them are mentioned here. They are coming from promotional institutions, but also mainly from uh, the private VC market. And the objective here is clearly to, um, to provide what is needed for the company and the level of investment that we are providing is usually going up to 15 million euro uh, of investment on our side and is leveraged, and this is the last data, uh, by a factor of three by other uh, investors. So the, uh, the EIC is part uh, of uh, the uh, solution uh, of, the, uh, of the challenges mentioned a few minutes ago by Jean-Christophe, but is certainly not the only solution. It has to be complemented uh, by other initiatives. We were talking uh, these days uh, about... Uh, the sovereign fund. You can make reference also to uh, other initiatives at the level of the union, like InvestEU, as it was mentioned in the last slide of Jean Christophe. And it is absolutely essential here to create this pass between the various existing tools, existing initiatives at EU level, but also at national level. It's absolutely essential here uh, to work uh, all together. So, uh, a huge uh, uh, ambition. We have, uh, as our former chair uh, told us uh, in our EIC board, we have the ambition to become uh, the EU uh, factory of unicorns. We have uh, 12 unicorns in our, in our portfolio today, 112 centers. Uh, still a long road to do, uh, but with already some very promising results in a number of emerging tech such as AI, quantum technology, just to quote uh, these two. Thank you very much for your attention. I just would like to use the opportunity, uh, if you allow me, uh, Bindi, uh, to um, say also a word, which was not uh, foreseen initially in my speech, uh, on uh, a decision that we had to take this morning regarding the implementation of the EIC accelerator. We have decided to um, switch, in fact, to another uh, application for the call. Uh, we are perfectly aware that this may create some disruption, but I can assure you that uh, we have taken all the necessary measures in order to minimize this uh, disruption. Uh, and I just would like to use this opportunity for those who are interested by the IC accelerator to tell you that as a consequence, the deadline for the current cutoff will be postponed from the 7th of June to the 21st of June in order to ensure uh, fluidity. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
some interesting statistics and insights. Okay, well, thank you very much. So with that, I wanted to sort of introduce our next panel. Um, and, and really, we were going to talk about the exit environment and what we need to do for the growth stage companies. So with that, I'd like to call up on stage Sarah Mazur, the Vice Exec Executive Director of the Wallenberg Foundation, Chair of the Board of Wallenberg AI and Software Program. Welcome. <laughs> Herman Hauser, the Director and Co-Founder of Amadeus Capital and member of the EIC Board. Welcome. <laughs> Paula Lane, the CEO of Klimatfonden. Thank you. And Delphine will be with us in a minute, but she is the chairman and CEO of Euronext Paris. So we will get her with us very soon. But in the meantime, I will start with the three of you. Can I get each of you to do a quick um, one minute intro to yourselves and what you do? Because I think that's really going to set the context of this panel. So Sarah, over to you. Thank you. So uh, the main part of my time, I work for Knut and Elise Wallenberg Foundation. And that is a private foundation that is the largest founder of research at Swedish universities in Sweden. We fund research in the areas of science, technology, and medicine. And we do that uh, in a long-term way, focusing a lot on excellence. Uh, we have different ways of supporting research. We have individual grants where we support the most excellent researchers and we give them long-term grants with a lot of freedom. We run strategic programs in areas where we think it is just super important for Sweden to build competence. And examples of such areas are AI, autonomous system software, data-driven life science, material science for sustainability, but we also support innovation. But I'm also involved in a company uh, by the name of Navigare Ventures, which is a company within the Wallenberg sphere that invests in early start science-based startups in the deep tech area. Great, thank you. Herman. Uh, I'm Herman Hauser. I'm an Austrian physicist who did his PhD at Cambridge. And then uh, some kind uh, journalist called me the father of Silicon Fen, which is our sort of local uh, deep tech community. Uh, so as a serial entrepreneur, I, I've been very lucky that I've uh, uh, contributed to uh, seven unicorns, uh, uh, mainly in, in the UK, but also elsewhere. Uh, two of these unicorns have become decacorns, which is still a sort of rare uh, event in uh, Europe. <coughs> uh, but I've also been very active uh, with uh, uh, government. So uh, I wrote the report that, read that led to the Catapult uh, Initiative in the UK, uh, which has 12 uh, intermediate institutions between uh, the university and industry. Uh, so I've been uh, active all my life in the translation of science uh, out of universities into successful companies. Uh, and that was also the reason why I'm uh, the only venture capitalist in the world who is also uh, an FRS, a fellow of the Royal Society. And the, because the Royal Society, as I found out, does the uh, Swedish uh, Academy of Engineering, uh, does not just concentrate on the excellence of science, but in its original charter, in 1660, it was to support the excellence in science and its translation for the benefit uh, of humanity. And it's uh, on that translation okay. thing that I, I got my FRS. Uh, I then uh, also got involved in chairing the advisory board for the EIC that wrote the rules for the EIC. And the thing that I'm most proud of is what Jean David has just uh, mentioned, is the crowding in uh, condition that the EIC always tries to work together with the market, with the venture capital industry. And that has worked beyond our expectations, that every uh, uh, every euro that we spend at the EIC actually crowds in three euros uh, from the market. And I very much hope that the uh, Technology Sovereignty Fund, uh, which uh, hopefully will, will be announced soon, uh, <coughs> will do the same uh, for uh, the growth of technology companies because the EIC is mainly concentrating on uh, early stage. So okay, well, thank that. you for that, Herman. Uh, Paula. Yeah, so I'm Paula Leinert, the CEO of the Finnish Climate Fund. 
And the Finnish Climate Fund is a special purpose company. Uh, we offer uh, mostly venture debt type of, type of funding for scaling up uh, climate solutions. Uh, we have currently commitments uh, with a bit over 150 million euros currently. And uh, we measure our success by the CO2 emission reduction potential that we are able to enable. Uh, and currently in our portfolio, uh, there is uh, over 10 years of time uh, potential for reducing 300 megatons of CO2 equivalents. Thank you very much. And Delphine, welcome. Yes, so, sorry to be late. My, my mm. mic had been fit for, for a much bigger brain, apparently. <laughs> so it didn't fit between You're my here. ears. This is the best part. <laughs> yeah. So I'm Delphine Damanzi. I'm a, a member of the managing board of uh, Euronex, which is a group of uh, stock exchanges on one technology, seven uh, exchanges, including uh, your neighbors in, uh, in Oslo. And I uh, specifically chair Euronex Paris. Uh, I've done that for two years, so we are, in uh, contrary to many people here, we're neither a company nor an investor, we are an infrastructure. Uh, but we are at the middle of the market, and so we have the vantage point of being able to, to um, unite everyone in a kind of neutral space. And we depend on, uh, for our own success, we depend on the weakest link. Yeah. So we are very uh, glad to be able to, to participate in this ecosystem and stimulate it, even though we... Uh, we also fulfill our role. Before that, I, uh, I spent uh, a few, <laughs> well, the beginning of my career in, uh, in the finance ministry or, or around it, so I, uh, I've come back to some scene of my crimes and, uh, and, and I've been able to, to witness the progress and have some perspective that I uh, maybe uh, testify okay. about that. Thank you so much, Delphine. So we've been watching a lot of very interesting content over the last couple of days, and it, it's fundamentally clear that we have a growth and scaling problem in Europe, but everyone in this room is united to try fix that. Um, yesterday we heard from McKinsey, and this, my jaw dropped when Thomas said this, but you know, is he right? I heard that Europe is not ambitious enough at this point in time. Is this actually true? Why do we lose companies so early in Europe, and what can we do to change this issue? So I'm actually going to start with Herman and Delphine, and short and sweet if we can, because we've got so much to get through in this panel. So the biggest problem that we now have is, as was mentioned in the excellent uh, presentation by uh, Jean-Christophe Lalou already, uh, is actually the funding of 50 to, say, 200 million uh, later stage uh, investments. If you look at uh, the... Output of our universities is comparable to the US. Europe produces more startups than the US. This is a little known fact. Uh, we have a, a, a very vibrant startment and Series A and Series B uh, uh, venture community. We only have a quarter of the venture capital that America has per GDP. But the biggest gap is those companies that we have created uh, need 50 to 100 million to really scale to a global company. That's our number one problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I compliment to that. So, yes, we're all looking at you know what is the missing uh, link in the chain. Um, actually, I would. Uh, you are right, and we see that in France too, for instance. But to be honest, you also have to have vibrant capital markets that will be able to provide the exit, and we're going to talk that uh, about that uh, uh, soon. So, if the next stage is not secure enough is it, and I, I, if the entrepreneurs and their investors are not uh, entirely convinced that this is going to be uh, possible and, 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 and active in, the, in, in the, the stage that is coming after the one you're in, they might be willing to prepare to go uh, somewhere else across the Atlantic, for instance. And there, if you want to survive, you have to be all in for it. And so that's why you lose and, and you have to, to almost you know, change your... Uh, uh, your headquarters, uh, send your teams there, uh, you will have the offenses. Yeah. So there's a lot of, of um, reasons. And so one of the key for success is to have enough investors also on the capital markets, public investors. So it's not only about having um, what, what you're saying, Arman, which is um, staying enough, uh, local enough at the late stage, uh, uh, stage. For instance, in France, uh, for, for all the big fundraising above 50 million uh, since 2021. There were only uh, uh, one fifth which were led by a, a local investor. So that's something in which you risk, run the risk that those people will have views for elsewhere. And I will argue that our financial markets are per perfectly fit for purpose yeah. for the exit. 
but that we need to be in that all together. And I'm going to quote a number here from the Atomico report. There were only three tech IPOs last year with a market cap in excess of 1 billion in Europe. The prior year, in 2021, that was 86 decent-sized IPOs. So there's a problem here. <laughs> but before we get to that big problem, I want to sort of switch back a bit to the early stage. And um, Sarah, there's a quote of yours, innovate or be history. And I'd love to know what you mean by this and where, where does a family office fit into all of this value chain and structure? We've learned about the problem with growth and IPO as an exit. What about at the early stage? Yeah, first of all, the statement was a statement that I did in connection to uh, encouraging Swedish industry and Swedish companies to uh, realize that they have to be innovative to survive long term and that they have to engage with the fundamental research and with the innovation that comes out of fundamental research to be long term successful. So what we as a private foundation can do is that we are limited by uh, laws and regulations. So the foundation itself can only support research at Swedish universities. So how we work with innovation from the foundation side is that we offer our researchers. But, but first of all, if we put more than two billion Swedish crowns into research every year, of course, there will be a lot of innovation that comes out of that. Uh, and then what we offer the researchers is that they can apply for funding for a proof of concept grant. And that grant then goes as a research grant to the university. We cannot, as a foundation, engage commercially or support companies. That's against the regulations. But what we can do is that the assets of the foundation are managed by a set of companies. And those companies can invest. And Navigare Ventures is exactly uh, one of those companies with the mandate and with the clear objective to invest in science-based early startup deep tech companies and do that in a long-term way and help these startups to scale, not only for the first series, but to build long-term sustainable growing companies for Sweden and Europe. So the ambition is not exactly exit in a few years, rather building strong, sustainable yeah. companies for the future. Yeah, and I, and I think that's great because that's so in line with what we've been hearing from the previous panels. Paula, we know that ESG is a proper European strength and what you're investing in early stage as a fund is delivering that strength. So I'd love you to follow on from Sarah and give your points of view on what we can do to deliver that long-term growth and sustainability. Yeah, we at the Finnish Climate Fund, we are really focusing on the next stage already, after the early stages, uh, mainly operating with ticket size from 4 million to 40 million euros. So, and that's quite often something you need to get to that 50 uh, to 100 million uh, category that was so, so well brought up here. Um, I think from, uh, if, if you look at investing from the CO2 perspective, i.e. Em emission yeah. reductions uh, perspective, uh, I'd like to bring up uh, something that I think Niklas Zenström just said, that we should not look at the national borders. Uh, and Absolutely. It's the, sa the same goes with, the, with this sort of impact investment. If you want impact, you have to have scalable impact. And in the, for example, in the case of, of uh, uh, climate, the atmosphere is global, so the perspective needs to be global. If you want to have scalable CO2 emission reductions, you need to have the underlying business model that is also globally scalable. So uh, I don't think that ESG investing or, or getting for impact investment into impact investment is in any way contradiction uh, with the same logic that was all earlier brought up uh, with, with, for example, Nik Niklas Zenström. Well, maybe with the exception that we all have also these national uh, emission reduction targets. And there, of course, we can have some specific bottlenecks that uh, national efforts into, into science and innovation can help to solve. But otherwise, it's really a global, yeah. uh, global setup. And for Europe, the perspective needs to be that companies need to choose what is best for them always. And the only way the companies choose the European is for the European ecosystem to be so appealing and competitive that the companies want to choose the European solutions, uh, investors uh, and, 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 yeah, and partners. Yeah. And yet so many of the LPs, when they do traditionally come from public sector, 
have geo restrictions for obvious reasons. So I think that's that's you know quite an interesting uh, dilemma infrastructure-wise that does need to be fixed. Delphine, I keep hearing the exit ecosystem and exit environment is not appealing. And so again, in the Atomico report, um, four hundred billion dollars in value went poof last year, <laughs> which is absolutely incredible to read. And companies in Europe are often pressured by investors to exit early because of um, funding uh, commentary from the LPs. Um, is it efficient to provide an efficient exit market in Europe and why? Yeah, it's, it's fundamental, of course. So there's this issue about is it you, know, you need to grow enough before you, you join the market in, in the case of an IPO exit. Um, of course, uh, I, I would argue that the, um, the maturity of the private capital market is, has, has, has made those exits mm. uh, come a, a bit later. And on the other hand, you can sometimes say that you need some you need successful and early enough exit so that the funds can prove to their LPs that they're able to exit. And so from one point of view, some exits are not happening uh, soon or well enough. And it's very important that the European financial markets demonstrate um, that those exits can happen uh, in order to fuel the, the wheel for, for the others. I would, we, we have to stop, you know, inflicting to ourselves our, our self-evaluation and being so harsh. I mean, the tendencies of the market in the U.S. and in, 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 in Europe are, are, are quite aligned, actually. And, and those, those values that just disappeared uh, last year was uh, even more boom and bust and bust in the U.S. Than, than in Europe. So let's consider that for, for a minute and, 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 and not uh, deprecate ourselves. What, um, what we do, wh why, why is it important? Um, for two reasons. Of course, you know, in this room, the, 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 the natural answer is to say it's important for uh, the companies and for the economy of Europe that those homegrown companies stay here and continue to uh, have their cluster effect for innovation, etc. Yes. But let's remember, it's also important for the investors. It's important for the savers. If they don't have companies uh, in which to invest on their capital markets locally, the, the domestic buyers that everyone has will make, as a result, them le invest less, less in equities than they should, and they have ye less yield. And that's one very uh, <laughs> depressing uh, fact that the uh, EU saver, the individual, the retail saver, will have less yield on his saving, will have a tendency to, uh, to have more, uh, be yeah. more invested in, in, in low risk environment and low yield, and that's bad. So this is a loop that should be uh, self-fulfilling. And of course, um, you know, choosing an IPO for, for a company is, is a mark of ambition and independence that is quite different from being bought, which is, uh, can be great, especially if you build a, a champion still on European soil, but uh, it's not the same story, of course. And, and maybe I can sort of follow on with that with a, a question to Herman. Looking at the current macroeconomic situation and the fact that we, we know that VCs are telling the companies to double down, buckle down, execute, focus on the, the essentials, but VCs are facing that pressure to re have some realizations um, and you know a different form of exit, yet the market is not necessarily there. I'd just love to get your perspective on what you're seeing, given you have worked across Europe and UK. Uh, yes, and uh, given my age, I've been through four of these cycles already <laughs> where, uh, where thing, we're in a downturn uh, the valuations are down. We've just heard the, va the public valuations are down more in the US than in Europe. That's a very important point uh, that Delphine uh, made. Uh, therefore, there is less uh, um, willingness of people to uh, I invest in companies at the moment. But having been through a number of these cycles, I can also tell you that now is the best time to start a company because if you look at the returns, uh, the, the returns and the successes are biased towards companies that start in a recession rather than at the height of a cycle. And the same thing is true for venture capital returns. So the funds that are being funded now are actually the ones that will uh, give uh, the highest returns. So this is actually a time to get into deep tech rather than out of uh, uh, deep tech. Uh, just uh, uh, one more comment on exits. 
so the important thing for a healthy ecosystem, <clears throat> and let's not forget we are in competition with the US and China here, and Europe is behind both of them uh, at the moment in the way we fund our deep tech companies. And we need to have the whole stack. We heard earlier on that the early part, uh, the early uh, <coughs> funding of our stack is getting a lot better. The big gap is the 50 to 100, 200 million. But Nicholas made the very important point that in order for a company to actually become globally relevant, and this is a global game, these companies need to be present globally, not just in Europe. It needs billions. Uh, and where do the billions coming from? Where is the support to build up you know, very substantial companies? And if you look at <coughs> the way the venture capital companies get their returns is, is through exits. But if you look at the exits, there are typically four or five exits in an M&A transaction, and then the really good ones go IPO. And we need to fix both. Uh, you know, we need our uh, European corporates uh, that, that should buy more of these companies and then uh, turbocharge them with their access to market, their additional uh, capability. Uh, European corporates are much more reluctant than American corporates yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. to work uh, uh, with, uh, with startups. And then our... Uh, IPO windows is still uh, IPO capability is still not as good as Nasdaq in in the terms of the depth uh, of of money, and that's uh, uh, one sad example of that is that uh, ARM is likely to go market uh, to go uh, public I in New York rather than in Europe because uh, you know a, a, an IPO at uh, between 30 and uh, 70 billion is still hard to do in Europe. Yeah, and and that that's disappointing, and actually the the M&A exit number is down 72% from 2021 to 2022. So the European corporates not buying is a very fundamental uh, comment. Um, Sarah and Paula, there are routes um, that only selling a company or going public, there are other routes to think about. And Sarah, we talked a lot about you know, the evergreen approach and being with a company long term. And that's really what the first panel talked a lot about as well. We've got to step away from these 10 year cycles. So it'd be really good to get a perspective from your world. I think one important uh, part of what Navigari does is exactly the long term perspective. Uh, to stay with the companies for a longer time, also then giving them more time maybe to find a buyer <laughs> in, a, in a, a European company or to attract other capital, but not be so quick to step away, but rather hanging on, giving them long-term support to build the strong new companies that we need in Europe. Uh, Paula, over to you. Yeah, I think, the, of course, the patient capital is needed. And for, for example, for us at the, uh, at the Climate Fund, so we can look at maturities over 10 uh, the critical limit in, 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 in many cases. Um, maybe just um, one comment still to these uh, European buyers. I think <laughs> the companies need, need to also choose the best buyer. So again, we come to the whole competitiveness and appeal of the European ecosystem. We need to have the best industrial corporations also out there who offer the best opportunities for these companies to, to, yeah. to grow and go global. And that is, a, again, a fundamental issue that um, has continually been called out over the last couple of days. Delphine, uh, you yeah. have something to say. Yeah, no, I wanted <laughs> to, to, to take the gauntlet from Armand because I agree with all what you say, but then, then what? what? What does it take for those capital markets to work? Like I said, there is an infrastructure. There are some big infrastructure in Europe. They can attract and they do attract the international uh, flows. Uh, there is uh, all, uh, all the American uh, funds and all the UK funds are there and they are present on our markets, especially if you have a, a, b a big enough stock market. Um, what we need is to complement that with the local markets because to stay in Europe, you want to have the best of both. And the other thing we need, and this is a collective uh, endeavor, is to have a good valuation process. So the valuation process is not done by the exchanges. It's done by um, the bankers around the... Uh, um, the, 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 the candidate uh, for, 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 for quotes. And there's been a tendency to a bit inflate valuation in the private equity side. A lot of um, mediatic and public uh, 
uh, notion about that, which then makes it a bit difficult to find something that is reasonable to, to enter the market and then be a success. And so this is difficult because you have a lot of different invested interests into that. But the fact that we now have IPOs from, from companies who were in the private uh, uh, funds um, economy rather than family owned has this little tendency to say, you know, I, I, I am over invest in the valuation at the IPO. I under invest, invest on my equity story and the long term vision. And I think this is what we need to collectively reflect on that. And I think mm. the um, quasi bubble that we saw should we should we should learn from that yeah absolutely and i think unfortunately uh we are over today there's so much more we could talk about but hopefully the audience got a really good insight from very differing perspectives on what we need to do to get to the next level and herman you're absolutely right some of the best companies have been founded in a downturn and some of the best returns by vc have been generated through a downturn so there is hope and policymakers out there um i hope you're listening so with that, thank you very much for your time, panel. So the final segment of this section is we're going to get some perspectives that we want to share that will hopefully feed all of you with what we need to discuss in the workshops this afternoon. And so with that, the reflections and concluding remarks, can I please invite Philippe Huberdeau, the Secretary General of Scale Up Europe, a President de la République, Presidency Board Member of ESNA. <laughs> Andras Inotai, Head of Unit, Innovation Policy and Access to Finance, DG Research and Innovation from the European Commission. Welcome. Thank you very much, thanks. And Dr. Sabine Heperel, head of SME policy department of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. Welcome. So each of you are going to get a couple of minutes each to give your thoughts and perspectives to a couple of questions that we pose to you. And what's great is you are all decision makers and can really make a difference around this cross-sector collaboration. So the questions are, what are your reflections on the previous panels and keynotes from this morning? What are you working on to accommodate the mentioned challenges? What can be done on a national or European level to ensure that strategic interest and economic benefits of both Europe, companies, VCs and LPs can be met? And finally, are there any specific challenges that you want to give to the delegates? to really work on and focus on during the workshops this afternoon. So, Sabine, why don't we start with you and have your reflections first. Thank you very much, and it's a great honor and pleasure to be here at this conference. Um, first of all, um, I've, I have many takeaways from the two days conference so far, and um, I think one of the most important things is really to join forces um, not, not only on a national level where governments and um, VC funds, um, corporate ventures, family offices, foundations, in, uh, what have you, we really uh, have to work more closely together, um, but also when it comes to the national and the European level. So, for example, um, Germany has a, a long-standing, very successful cooperation with the European Investment Fund, uh, with co-investment uh, venture capital funds. And um, we have also brought up now um, the new um, topic for us, uh, which is a, we just launched a deep tech and climate fund in Germany um, with up to uh, 1 billion euro. And um, we want to really yeah, attract and approach um, long-term investors um, because we, we have also this, this funding gap in Germany when it comes to the, to the growth um, phase and the, the scale-up uh, scale financing. And so we've launched this um, uh, Deep Tech and Climate Fund um, just recently. And uh, we also um, want to approach now in a very structured uh, dialogue, family offices, foundations, um, yeah, um, institutional 
investors, insurance companies, um, to, to get them on board, um, also to uh, be a co-investor, as our Deep Tech and Climate Fund um, is always um, investing with a private um, co-investor, which is very important for us. And so uh, we have, a, we have uh, begun a, a structured dialogue, uh, first of all with family offices, um, and also at the same time with foundations, um, and what we have learned also that there is, uh, there is a need for more transparency um, on the return rates on venture capital funds so far. And I can only recommend uh, yeah, to, to the European Investment Fund to provide um, these facts and figures um, about the last 15 years. They have the, the most experienced uh, venture capital investor in, in Europe. And uh, because we, we've learned that there is a lot of misunderstanding and misperception um, when it comes to venture capital funding. And if, uh, if you want to attract investors to get into deep tech uh, investments, um, they should be aware, first of all, that it's uh, really not only risky, but uh, you have yeah. also lots of chances. And this is what we are um, doing at the moment. Um, and in general, our overall goal is um, yeah, to, to really strengthen also a, a German and a European eco uh, system in, in terms of venture capital and deep tech um, ecosystem. And therefore, uh, we've launched um, a 10 billion euro future fund. Um, up to 10 years, we will have these 10 billion euros as a state guarantee. And this implies a different financing instruments for uh, focusing on the growth financing. Thank you Great, very much. Thank you. So you're putting your money where your mouth is, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you for announcing that. Andras, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, as a policymaker, it's always uh, heartening when you, following a reflection and two days of conferences, you actually see that what you have identified as a problem is confirmed by uh, the stakeholders uh, and, and, and the room. So that's exactly what, what has happened uh, when last year the European Commission adopted the new European Innovation Agenda. Uh, it was very clear that one of the main areas where uh, uh, we need to uh, improve Europe's innovation performance is access to finance. The gaps that we have discussed today in the conference were, were, were well identified. Some of those gaps have increased in the meantime. Some of them have, have come down. Um, uh, but there are other four areas which have a indirect impact on access to finance, uh, on the ability of companies to raise capital, but also on their incentives to invest, in particular in deep tech, because you need to know that the innovation agenda as such was always focusing on, on deep tech and making sure that the EU uh, reaps the benefit of, uh, of the new uh, deep tech revolution. So uh, the other four areas that uh, I think some uh, have already touched upon today were uh, the regulatory framework. So it is important to get the regulatory framework right. Um, uh, uh, ecosystems, many of you have mentioned the need to strengthen and better connect uh, ecosystems. It's particularly important in the EU where uh, our best performing regions are nine times more uh, innovative than our least performing regions. That's a, uh, a major problem. Uh, uh, talent, the ability to attract and retain uh, talent, uh, and then uh, good policy making, both at the EU and the, uh, and the national level. Now, what are we doing about it? Because uh, 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 that, that was the thing, second question. Uh, uh, there are a number of legislative proposals uh, which are now on the table, actually are with the Council in the, um, uh, uh, in the, in the EU. One of them is a Listings Act. Many of you mentioned that y you need to improve the ability of EU companies to go public in the EU. Uh, so this proposal would simplify those rules. It would also allow founders to retain uh, control in certain cases, which is a major incentive for some of them to, to list in Europe. We also have a debt equity uh, bias reduction allowance, uh, great, uh, another great uh, acronym going by the name of DEBRA. It's very important because it actually allows companies, if it goes through, uh, to have a preferential corporate tax treatment on, on equity. 
uh, as opposed to debt, which we can also help uh, raise further funds, um, and attracting talent. Uh, uh, when uh, previous Commissioner Gabrielle was in the US uh, on an innovation mission a few months ago, uh, she launched the uh, Innovation Talent Platform, which really aims at attracting the talent, which uh, is now becoming available, sadly, for, uh, for some of the U.S. Uh, 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 employees. About 50,000 50, um, employees in the deep tech sector have been uh, 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 fired in the last uh, couple of months. Uh, Europe has a great opportunity to come and attract them. So we have launched a very pragmatic way to reach out to them and to help them come to, to Europe. Um, one thing which I think uh, uh, hasn't been discussed, and maybe it's an opportunity also for the workshops this afternoon, uh, um, how do we ensure that the companies who are now getting and hopefully will get increased funding, especially in their scale-up phase, uh, uh, Herman accurately uh, mentioned the uh, particular funding gap for the 50 to 200 million euro equity rounds. Um, how do we make sure that once these companies continue to scale in Europe, uh, possibly with the support of EU public taxpayers' money, that they then uh, stay in Europe uh, for the uh, uh, for the subsequent growth stages? And that's that's a very important question because the least the last thing that we want to do is to uh, throw more money into this problem and then just exacerbate the risk that these companies uh, uh, then, then uh, leave uh, the EU. So that is a challenge also for regulators and also for private companies. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And, and again, some really wonderful insights and solid thoughts on proper actions that we're going to take to fix all of this. So last words from you, Philippe, and I'd love to get your perspective on Thank you. Uh, well, from my perspective, uh, working now for two and a half years on the Scale Up Europe initiative, uh, I'm very encouraged by all what I heard in these two days, and I thank you for organizing this excellent uh, uh, conference, and I'm very encouraged to see that all actors across countries and, and across sectors or, or professions are aligned on the yeah. same objective. And uh, uh, I can also see the progress that has been made in the two and a half years with new instruments being created by the EIC, by the EIB, EIF. And uh, I think this is helping a lot. Uh, it's helping a lot to f in the financing uh, uh, phase of uh, the, the companies uh, at the, an early stage with EIC. Um, the fund of fund uh, that has been created with the EIF shall help also at the later stage uh, because it will help build larger VCs which will be in a position to uh, uh, plug this gap, this 50 to 100 million gap that was just mentioned in, in the last panel. And for me, the, the, the next challenge now is really about exits that has also been touched upon. Yeah. All kinds of exits, so IPOs and EU Listing Act is uh, central, uh, but you also have the corporates that have a great role to play and we should uh, encourage them to play that role. They need Perhaps to Perhaps the more. workshops yeah. could uh, uh, reflect on that. Uh, and also the secondary market, actually. There are very interesting initiatives being taken right now to energize the secondary market, which is very useful because the secondary market is about VCs taking over from other VCs. And then you can solve the uh, uh, time horizon discrepancy you have between VCs that need uh, uh, to have a distribution uh, uh, not too late in the phase and deep tech companies that need uh, to have a longer uh, horizon to be able to build uh, uh, these new technologies. So this, this is also very, uh, um, uh, uh, I think, very interesting. And uh, last but not least, uh, yes, we have to mobilize uh, private capital by all means. We have to, 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 to have a wake-up call in Europe because up to now, as has been said, most of the funding, especially in the later stage, comes from outside of Europe. Uh, one thing which could help to have this wake-up call would be uh, to move on the Solvency II regulation. So there are discussions now, uh, right now, uh, going on in Brussels to uh, adapt the Solvency II regulations to make it easier for insurers to invest uh, uh, in deep tech companies, in tech and deep tech companies. And I think this would uh, 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 mobilize additional capital, but also could be a, a, a very uh, um, defining moment for this wake-up call. 
And I think those are amazing final words. So thank you very much, Philippe, Andras, and Sabine for talking about what your reflections were on today, the wake up call. And I think the big strong message I've got from the sessions that I ran today was very much around collaboration between private and public, learning to speak each other's languages um, and working together to um, take it to the next level. So with that, thank you, the three of you, for your wonderful reflections. To everyone else, it is lunchtime. We have until 12.30, and then 12.45, the sessions will begin. So thank you very much. I'm pleased to meet you.
Spain. Okay. Um, this way, this way. I think so. Well, welcome back after lunch. Refueled, re energized, re caffeinated. And we're here to talk about building robust innovation ecosystem to unlock the innovation capacity in Europe. As we heard before lunch, um, we were asked the question are we competing to win or are we competing not to lose? And that is a beautifully annoying question. You want to say, yes, we're competing to win. However, you need to think to the not so subtle question um, of our ambitions and of our real vision and what we're doing. And luckily, we have a panel here to dissect uh, this and many more aspects. Anna Panagopoulou, you were here earlier to this morning. And uh, new on stage is Asia Rufino from Technalia, is that correct? That's correct. And H2 site. And Eva Lundin, welcome. You've come all the way from Dalana and region Dalana. So, Anna, uh, following on your conversation this morning and yesterday and this annoying quote, uh, are you competing to win? Could you set uh, the scene here, a bit of a backdrop, what we're talking about? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, uh, it's a great opportunity to continue our discussions on yesterday and today and then to say, yes, we are competing to win and we are not just competing to not to lose. And um, one of the main issues that has been always addressed during the two days discussion, but also through the experience that we have over the years, is that, uh, okay, we are not Silicon Valley because our challenges are completely different than Silicon Valley. We are in Europe with different member states, different regions. So how we can make the whole Europe Silicon Valley. So I think this is what we can put as a vision to work at pan-European level and uh, we from the European Commission side, we have launched a new initiative that I mentioned very briefly uh, during the two days discussions and presentations, but I would like maybe to be more a little bit more explicit about that. So what we know we know already that, uh, this is the puzzle, by the way, that uh, we have regions at different level of development. We know that uh, we have less innovative regions and more innovative regions, but innovation happens across Europe, even in those countries and regions that are less innovative. And uh, we know that we have challenges uh, of uh, deploying innovations once they happen and scaling them up and bring them to European markets. And also we know we have the challenge to promote innovation in general, but also deep tech innovation. So what we try to do with these regional innovation valleys is really to bring the puzzle together and to make a new instrument which will enable us to create up to 100 regions across Europe that they will work together and they will create a pan-European ecosystem that uh, it's there to deliver solutions on burning challenges that we have in Europe and in the globe uh, in order to excel and to be the ones that we are leading and we are winning the competition that we have with US and with China. So uh, this is the vision and uh, how we can deliver this vision and this objective. So, what are the opportunities that we have? First of all, we'll try to, to establish a kind of directionality, so in which technological areas we would like to work. And I think this is why we call it burning challenges. You can sell it political priorities, but uh, in particular after the last two years, we all know that we need to have to reduce the resilience on fossil fuels. We all know that food security is an issue. We know that we have to master the digital transformation. It's good to have digital transformation, but we have to be able to master it. Achieving circularity and improving healthcare. So these are the areas in which we would like to see regions work together, institutions and actors in the regions working together and delivering new uh, innovation, technological developments in those areas. And how we can do that? So there are two ways. So the one side, we would like to attract the interest of regions to say, yes, I want to become a regional innovation valley. Whether I need money from European programs or not, I want to have the label that I'm a regional innovation valley. So for those regions, 
you can just apply to the call for expression of interest that was open on the 28th of March, where they can present their commitments, what they put in the region, how they support the innovation actors in the regions, universities, companies, big industries, how they establish a whole governance approach in the regions in order to deliver uh, a, an innovation future, future for the region and to attract talents in the region. So commitments, financial commitments, strategic uh, prioritization on concrete areas. So they just have to apply this call for expression of interest by the 18th of September. Or we have regions that they also want some European money as an incentive. Those regions, they can still apply in the call for expression of interest because this call for expression of interest works also as a matchmaking tool where we can see which regions they would like to work together on specific areas. And they have the opportunity to apply to the calls of proposals under two programs, the European Innovation Ecosystem and uh, the program of interregional innovation investments. Both calls were opened on the 17th of May with a deadline on the 17th of October. So, Depending where you apply, you see there is a lot of money, 60 million for the one, 62 million for the other. So depending where you apply, either we need regions in the European Innovation Ecosystem Program that they work together with other four regions, two more innovative, three less innovative, uh, uh, two, uh, at least two less innovative, three more innovative, work together on specific area and uh, on concrete projects, and then they have to put 50% of the funding for these activities, or in the I3 program, you need actors of the innovation ecosystems that they are going to work on deep tech, but also between actors in different regions. So this is the opportunities that we have. Either you get the label, but please let us know that you have the ambition to become the regional innovation valley and or you ask for funding because EU money is always help mobilizing you. But we want those regions that they are going to be there to commit not just for a project, but for the years to come. In a second, I will ask Dolana if you will apply to, to these funds. But first, Anna, allow me to be devil's advocate for here for a second. Because if we're serious about competing to win, there is there's two different approaches. One is, and I completely agree with that, innovation is borderless and knows no geography, i.e. the deep tech solutions that we need to solve the big problems of our time could be found anywhere throughout uh, the EU. However, that is not necessarily the same as all regional parts of Europe need to be innovative and need to uh, create their own deep tech solutions for all of these things. How do you see that balance? So whether there will be all region or less region, so it's... Is it realistic to think that all parts of Europe will be able to create deep tech solutions? I mean, probably... Or should we find the winners? Yes, probably, I mean, in any case, when you do a call, f even for the call for expression of interest or call for proposals, the best they will get the label, but... This it's a honey, it's a, a big net to find. Yes, but this initiative, it advocates and address, attracts the interest of all regions in Europe. We have to be very serious about this. The idea is that if we don't mobilize regions in Europe with the funding that they have, to work together and to focus also on innovation in order to grow their economy. It could be innovation, could be deep tech innovation. I mean, we can discuss about mm -hmm. it. It will not be possible to succeed uh, on creating a prime European innovation ecosystem. So it cannot be only few cities, capitals. It cannot be only few regions in the more innovative countries. I think innovation should be promoted everywhere because each one of us, we are coming from different countries, <coughs> maybe from different regions, and we see this lack of growth uh, linked to research and innovation within the same country. So that's why it's so important to go at the regional level. And then, yes, I believe that there could be innovative innovation opportunities across, in all, Euros, in all regions in Europe. And the work in relation to the smart specialization helps very much, because already you know mm. that these are the areas where I can excel and I can succeed. And let's see, Dalana, will you apply? Yes, yes, we will. You just had a uh, conference on Wednesday on uh, regional deep tech and innovation. Could you share with us? Yes, uh, it's 
It was one year celebration of the pi uh, pilot that was initiated by the European Parliament, uh, uh, Regional Committee and European Commission. And it's abo about uh, partnership for regional innovation. We know that we have a huge challenge in front of us, the climate change, and we need innovation to solve this. And we need to work together. And we can't leave anyone behind. So we need to connect the high-performing regions concerning innovation with the less performing <coughs> regions. And this is what we were discussing um, um, in Talbot, in Dalarna. We were 140 persons from regions, from institutions, and we also had uh, uh, Mrs. Risco there, and uh, it, we had a really nice time. And also, of course, uh, we were trying to um, um, establish and form a, a consortium to go ahead and, and uh, search for these in innovation valleys. And because we need to connect regions, well-performing regions with less perform performing regions, if we are going to... Could you uh, just spend one minute um, before we get uh, Asir's uh, take on this? Why? Why is it important to connect high-performing regions with less-performing regions? It's about uh, deploying innovation. I mean, there less performing regions, usually there is the industry there. They need to make that transition. They need uh, in the deep tech to make this. They have the supply. So it's not actually a fairness question. It's an, uh, it's optimizing the system, allowing it yes. things to move forward. Yes. And, and I think that's an important change. thing to underline. Yeah. That's... Uh, Sorry, what did you say? I think it's important to underline that aspect because sometimes when we talk about EU and uh, uh, the less performing region, yeah. it sounds like a fairness outreach program, but it's actually about achieving our goals. Yes. Asir, please uh, <laughs> join the conversation. Uh, could you take, from your perspective, mm. are we competing to win? Um, well, um, I think that uh, we are competing to win, but uh, we need to uh, collaborate and um, uh, probably have uh, a more clear picture of uh, what it takes to win. And I always like uh, launching these uh, two figures. The first one is uh, EU27 represents 30% market share of publications on top journals. So basically uh, papers, okay? When it comes to GDP adjusted for purchasing power, uh, you could resort to different sources, but we are slightly below 15%, one five and declining. So the problem uh, that we have is to translate this excellent technology that already exists, because we've been talking here about uh, uh, increasing the research budgets. Okay, that's fair enough. But what about quick wins in terms of what we already have in labs? And by the way, the labs are not only in universities, and also on ortios research organizations that oftentimes are forgotten and play a paramount uh, role in fostering uh, deep tech to take those technologies to the market. Because I also hear uh, VCs in Europe saying that they don't have enough deal flow early stage to deploy their funding. And what, do that, what does that mean that they don't have enough uh, deal flow? That they don't have enough good quality deal flow, which means well-rounded teams, okay, not only people who are in the lab moving into a company, but having the mixture of uh, teams where you have not only the Bosniak, but the Steve Jobs, actually, that are required, those yeah. two type of profiles, to have uh, excellent deal flow. And just coming back to uh, the topic of ecosystems, when you look at uh, high-performing regions that invest uh, perhaps the same than us, uh, but obtain beta better results in terms of impact, I've been in different places throughout my career around the world, and you always see, uh, I call them three Ms, minds, management, and money interacting in a virtuous circle. What does that mean? You have technological excellence, but next to the technological excellence, you have top talent, top entre ent entrepreneurial talent, so this source of so-called Steve Jobs, connecting with the people in the lab, and you have a smart capital joining in forces. Obviously, in order to trigger on the first time this uh, virtual circle, you do need uh, public uh, support and uh, public strategic uh, uh, vision. And I hope that actually this ecosystem uh, initiative could help 
to create critical mass that is very important in Europe because it's not a matter of you having mines management money at the regional side, but perhaps you could connect, when we talk about good innovation in Europe, perhaps we could connect good minds, good technological excellence, with some sources of entrepreneurs that may be in other regions, maybe with investors that are in other, other regions. regions. And you can achieve that. For instance, uh, on the second part, that by the way, I'm the CEO of Technalia Ventures, which is the deep tech venture builder of Technalia, just in case uh, my boss sees at some point this, this presentation. Uh, h 2 Side is a clear example. This is a company that is tackling um, issue in the uh, hydrogen uh, uh, hype around all the uh, hype that is being created around uh, uh, hydrogen. Uh, the EU requires 25 uh, million tons of uh, hydrogen. 10 million tons need to be imported and are going to be imported in the form of ammonia that needs to be cracked into hydrogen or probably using the natural gas pipelines and de-blending this uh, hydrogen. So this company originated in a cooperation of basic research from Eindhoven University and Tecnalia in Spain in the context of framework uh, programs okay, from the European uh, uh, Commission. At some point, we played a, a venture building role so identifying a team, a well-rounded team that could manage the spin-off with people who were in the lab, but also recruiting someone who was coming from a different uh, background, setting up the, uh, the incentives, and then looking for a smart capital that were actually French investors, engineering ventures. And the A series that we just closed a few months ago, um, Breakthrough Energy Ventures join forces, Equinor uh, Ventures from Norway join forces, and what we are doing nevertheless in terms of regional impact is we are creating a new supply chain in the Basque Country, just helping reindustrialize regions uh, basically, in, in this case, in Basque Country, Unfor and you can do it. I mean, we have all the elements. Unfortunately, time is running out. And I think Asir is uh, highlighting one of the interesting aspects of Europe, which is we don't have the clusters in that yes. sense. The Equinor, the, uh, the uh, breakthrough venture, the tech there, the research allowed. How do we bridge and compensate for not having the Silicon Valley cluster and achieving what you want to achieve? But it's exactly in minus 20 seconds. In minus 20 seconds. But this is exactly what I will try to do with this call, really to bring all these actors, as you explained, together, whether you are in the North Europe or you're in the South Europe, then depending on what you have already in place, let's work together, let's make the dots uh, and we would like from our side to facilitate this connection so that tomorrow, and I repeat that because I like this, the whole Europe will be the Silicon Valley. And we should not forget, I visited the Silicon Valley very recently, you have plenty of European talents. Why they are there? Because they have the conditions that we cannot offer them across Europe. But we, one region cannot offer it alone. One country cannot offer it alone. Maybe all together and through our collaboration, we can create the valley and we bring back the talents that we have educated, by the way. So and put this is what on I the think. Map. Thank you for this. We could talk about it forever, clearly, but <laughs> yes. uh, we'll have to put a, a stop there. But thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And now we will move on. And I'd say it's a, an hour and a half smorgasbord of ambitious forward-leaning initiatives throughout Europe trying to address some of these challenges. And luckily for the smorgasbord, presentation, I have a co-pilot, Joachim Skog. <laughs> Give him a warm welcome. Joachim, yes. you are from Vinova. I am. And your title is, or I've remade it to Head of Future, Future Predictions. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, on my business card, had I had a business card, it would say Strategic Area Lead Future Innovations. Future innovations. And one of the things that you do in your day-to-day uh, -day <coughs> job, which I find very cool, is set a future prediction, either positive or negative, mm. and have us emotionally connect with something we don't want to head to or something that we want to go to, compete to win. Yes. And that allows people to move quicker. Could mm. you tell us a bit about this work? Sure. So, of course, we work with horizon scanning, identifying the white spots on the, on the map where to invest. Of course, we work with innovate how we innovate because we can never stand still. But above all, we work with leading from the future, which is another word of, uh, well, another way of saying that we work with strategic foresight. Strategic foresight can be used as, for instance, speculative design. 
you create artifacts visiting us from the future in the present, built on signals that we see around us today, uh, that creates a possible vision of the future, something that you can interact with, something that you can experience with, and as exactly, it provokes feelings. And those feelings are super important for us to use in a way that we can find new ways of, of heading in a radically new way to, to address the, the large societal challenges. Because one thing that we were reflecting over lunch was A, I really wanted butter with my bread, so I was a bit <coughs> disappointed about that, even though it was tasty, and the fact that potentially we have forgotten the why in, in the conversation uh, over these two days. Yeah. Like the sense of urgency, and that might be because it's hard to, on a daily basis, emotionally connect with civilizational collapse. The Guardian wrote this mm -hmm. morning that we've hit seven out of, out of our yeah, eight planetary that. boundaries. Yeah. Exceptional times to be, be a futurist in, right? I mean, everybody's talking about generative AI and ChatGPT. ChatGPT is eating up all written texts uh, that's out there right now, but ChatGPT is already old. It's hard to live in exponential times. ChatGPT is using text. Now we're talking about multimodal. We're talking about that we have AIs learning from, from pictures. We have video. We have 3D. We have sensory data. AI is learning from taste, learning from f like what f stuff feels like or smells. What if we have a ChatGPT quite soon le that's been, been trained on all of those kinds of data sets. So yes, really hard. Another thing that's hard with exponentiality is that we need to understand that it's we're in a hurry. Because it's not that... Wha and the clock says we're in a hurry, too. Okay. Okay. So you and I have the uh, daunting task of presenting, I think it's... 25 at speakers least. at yes. least. So join us on a parade and we will start with the Europe Startup Nation Alliance, ESNA, and Arthur, I can't pronounce your name, I apologize. Arthur, the executive director of ESNA, <coughs> will come and tell us about uh, Europe Startup Nation Alliance. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And your last name is? Jordal. Jordal. The Portuguese for Jordan. Ah. Like the Welcome. Jordan Reven. Well, uh, I'd like to... Th uh, the clicker is... The clicker is there. Is here. Okay, perfect. Well, f first I would like to, to thank the, the Swedish presidency for the invitation and congratulate the, all the organizers for, for this ter terrific conference. And my presentation today is to talk about uh, a unique, uh, one-of-a-kind entity that was uh, created uh, two years, roughly started two years, the creation of this, uh, that came from a political movement from uh, the several uh, member states. And I'll go through the three stages of, of this creation. So and the stages were the inception moment, the foundation, and where we are right now, which is the operational part. So going to the inception, and, also, and, and this started even before, the, the, at the time, the Portuguese presidency on the first semester of 2021. Prior to that, an extensive uh, assessment was done to the ecosystem. And well, it's, it's no uh, news flash of, of, the new <laughs> of the findings that were, were found there from uh, that Europe is lagging behind other leading regions. Uh, such as the U.S. and, 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 and uh, China and uh, Asian countries, uh, for that matter, in, in terms of relative indicators. So we're behind per capita in number of startups, in number of unicorns, in number of uh, investments uh, on workers, talents, and so on. Another very important aspect that was highlighted through this assessment was the fact of the multiple concepts of what is a startup that are flying around. And well, for... Um, data consumers that we all are, regardless if we're politicians, uh, policy makers for that sake, uh, uh, investors and so on, it's, we don't have comparable data. And that's, that's something that needs to be addressed. And lastly, uh, another very important aspect is regarding the European fragmentation. And I'm not talking about the 27 jurisdictions that, that we have, which make it difficult for startups to operate in, is the fact that we had many uh, entities gravitating around the ecosystem system, but none of them fulfilled a, a specific uh, a role, which is to become a platform uh, for a unique, unique voice of the European startup ecosystem. 
Also in parallel to this, and for, a, for quite a while, countries have been discussing to improve the framework conditions to, to, to startups. And uh, this conversation, like I said, it's been going on for some years, and they reached the consensus to focus on eight dimensions of public policy making in terms of best practices for the startup ecosystem. And from startup uh, fast start uh, uh, startup creation, uh, stock options, uh, Attraction, attraction and retention of talent that has been very well discussed, access to fu funding and so on. And all of this culminated in a unique uh, declaration that, from, that is a bit different from, from what we're experienced to see because this one comes, goes from uh, aspiration to concrete operation. So not only they commit to this concept of the standards, but now let's create a vehicle, a platform, an operational arm that truly you know, uh, puts uh, our money where the mouth is, like the expression says. And this gave a clear political mandate to ESNA uh, to become this new platform uh, to thrive and support the ecosystems and the several stakeholders for, for Europe. And uh, 26 member states plus Iceland signed the same declaration. So this was the inception moment. Now going to the foundation. The foundation after this declaration uh, signature that started uh, uh, it with the Portuguese presidency, then went through the discussion among many member states on very critical aspects on uh, to answer the question how, not the what was defined previously, now how are we going to do that? And so to define the vision and the mission like any other organization it was required, so we need to bring Europe to the lead of the global startup ecosystem through the policy making platform through reliable and harmonized data in terms of what is this mission. <coughs> to define the audience, it's very clear for ESNA that our primary stakeholder and, and target are the, the, the governments and the entities that become uh, our members. And then through uh, a, a unique governance model that is, has a 360 approach. So each country has a seat the, the countries that are holding the presidency have a special seat through our presidency board it, in a rotational format. And then we have the voice of the market with a non-country uh, logic, with the uh, act main actors, with the investors in all shapes and forms, the founders, academia, and former policy makers in our uh, advisory board. And so that was pretty clear in terms of what was supposed to be done in terms of how to structure this organization that has uh, 8.5 million funding to start until 2025. And then which led us to uh, the action moment. And, and here um, I'm, I'm glad to say that since the declaration we grew and we reached more than half the member states already are uh, current members of ESNA, appointed by each of their governments. Our strategic areas following the mission that was defined as the startup nation standards. So to monitor and assess how countries are performing in those eight dimensions. But not only that, we need to go one step further, which is to have technical support through our platform to learn from each other experience and share the best practices on each one. We have I, I just have to salute you on the best PowerPoint presentation <laughs> hack ever. If you get a ceiling on how many PowerPoint presentations, <laughs> just put four in one. <laughs> I think that is a genius one, and I salute you. However, uh, I will ask you to uh, give uh, us the, the yes. grand finale. Yeah, the grand finale is we're, we're on those strategic dimensions that I just mentioned, the standards, the data, which is quite important. We cannot stop on the eight because we live in a fast-paced environment, so the eight tomorrow need to be adapted so we have these strategic areas we're working on specific strategic projects like the scoreboard and the tech talent service desk and so it's exciting to see this unique platform and I would like to finish then just to give a quote which is a spirus in our everyday that comes from the Commission and it's related to many of the things that were discussed today which is do we want Europe to be a a playground for others, or we truly want to become this global and leading player that uh, we should be in that position. So thank you again. Thank you, thank and thank you. you for the work you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> should we take that table? Which one? I don't know, this one. I've, I've been most comfortable over okay. here. Okay.
Yoke, okay, would you like to introduce the next panel? Uh, yes, please. Um, let me see. I don't have the run sheet that's I updated. I will do it. So it is called Unlocking one, Synergies, Making Deep Tech Collaborations Happen. And we have with us Ignite Sweden, the CEO of SIS Peace de Lance, Deep Tech <coughs> Alliance, uh, Thomas Clem Andersen, and EIC Corporate Partnership Program, the head of unit at the European Commission, Viorel Pecha. Please come up on stage. Now, could you please start? Uh, one of the th things that we were talking about in the panel before was regional challenges and talking about different players meeting each other and finding an arena. And one of the things that you have a black belt in is matchmaking and allowing conversations to happen. Tell us about your work and that pe part of it. Absolutely. I think the previous discussion was really, really good, and I think it lies a lot in this. But we need to move from, uh, how do you say, theoretical angle into actually doing things together, and that's the big key. And that's what we have done uh, in an initiative that we have in Sweden called Ignite. We are now 27 incubators from all over Sweden, uh, sharing the same mission that we should provide our innovative startups uh, with customers. And uh, they meet uh, customers from all over Sweden, both within public and private sector, but also from abroad. And uh, up till this date, we have uh, been tailoring more than 6,000 meetings. Uh, also connecting the ecosystem, of course, in this, not only the startups and the companies. I think it's hugely important, just that little meeting. Moving on, uh, Virel, could you share with us the work that you're doing at the EIC? And I know you have some slides as well, and I have the clicker. I say no immediately before I've even asked, heard the question. <laughs> yes. I have a tendency. Not yet. No. 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 Getting there. So many microphones. No. No. Do we have a hand mic? Use the depth of your voice. hear me better now yes. yes it will be a mental work okay so <laughs> no work Look, what do you think is the val the yearly budget of the EIC across all our TRL levels so Pathfinder transition or accelerator the yearly budget okay anybody any guess come on I did I thought I didn't thought it's such a difficult question nobody the yearly budget okay I will help you in the interest of time, is over 1.6 billion euro per year. As much as this amount, as, as big as this amount is, we've seen that it's not sufficient. And however, we think that uh, this amount, as important as it is, it is not sufficient. You, not, you, you cannot use only funding. You need also to use other measure, I call these demand side measures to support because the growth of the company is more complicated than that. Than that. That's why at the EIC we have developed the um, we have developed the, um, the business acceleration services so that we can implement what we call smart money. This is what the startups need. They not just need money; they need smart money to grow. Um, and in the interest of time, I, 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 I will spare uh, talking about all the business acceleration services that we have. I will just focus on corporate partnership program. Um, luckily for me, and in the interest of time, I don't have to convince you, I hope, about the importance of corporate startup collaboration. I think there were numerous speakers uh, yesterday, even this morning. But can I ask you, beyond the speakers, are you convinced about the importance? Or who is convinced? Can I see your hands? Who is convinced about the corporate startup collaboration that this is important? OK, well, I would expect that a bit more, more hands. So <laughs> they you have my hand as well. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> this, but still, I see the majority is convinced about that. So it only led me to, uh, to, to Jim uh, Snabe to convince you that the EIC is well uh, let's say, well-positioned to help in this much bigger exercise. So 
just to, to, to go a bit into detail now how this is done. If you can look on the right hand side, you see some of over 100 corporates which we have collaborated across the year with many of them more than one. So I let you try to find uh, if the one from your country or the one that you like best, is it there? Just want to mention that last month we had um, uh, 4th of May, a corporate day with, with, uh, with Shell and 24th of May, another one with, with Vattenfall, both in person. In the, the left hand side you can see some statistics. So Aurora, I hope you, you see we, we did not uh, outbid the colleagues from Mesna. It's only three slides in one, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see some of our statistics. Since 2017, 65 corporate and multi-corporate days implementing this cohort that, uh, uh, that was mentioned yesterday. Uh, more than 1,350 SMEs, EIC startups that, that we have invested grant and equity. M like I said, more than 100 corporates, many of them more than, than once. 100% uh, of corporates wants to repeat. That means they, they are happy. They see added value of this. And we put a lot of impact on, on uh, a lot of uh, accent on impact. And we have more, we have recorded more than 400 follow-ups, meaning uh, uh, NDA, a proof of concept, this kind of thing. And then, also real deals that there is contract. So the process which we are using, it's, 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 you see it in the, in the lower corner, it starts from the corporate needs because we don't, we don't, we cannot and we don't want to ask money to the corporates, but we want to have alignment interests to have those coveted deals. So they define their challenges, we publish those challenges. For your curiosity, just pick EIC, any corporate name, and you say challenges, you will find them on the web. And then we publish this on our internal EIC community platform, on the internet, the EIC beneficiary, past and present, more than five, almost 6,000 of them are seeing this, are applying, and then we are giving their short proposal, two, three pages, to the corporate. They are doing the selection. They give the name, name to us. We are training those so that they can show to the corporate their, their best face. We, do ha we have the corporate day, one or two day event, depending on the, the, on the corporates and, and startups, online or offline. We, of course, during COVID, like everybody, we're doing online. Now we are doing a mixture of both. They all work, so no. And then we are as evaluating immediately the quality. And then six months, we are evaluating the impact so that we can provide these statistics that, that, that I showed to you. Um, now, let me give you some uh, concrete examples. Um, one of the success stories that, uh, that we have is the uh, Holcim Lafarge, the, the biggest company actually in the world in the, in the cement and industry I, and construction industry. I'm sure you know it. And Nanolike, Nanolike is a, is, a, is a startup in France specialized in IoT and, and measurement. And the problem of, um, of uh, Holcim, um, you can see there in the upper corner those uh, the silos, they, they may they may look small in the picture, but in the reality, they are huge, and I mean really huge. And imagine w at least once a day, or even several times a day, somebody, uh, a person like you and me, climbing those narrow stairs that you can see there, uh, really risking their lives. Because, OK, of course, there, there are sunny days, but they are also rainy and, and, and even windy days. So you can imagine how inefficient and dangerous was. So the, I, the, all seems, the nano like solution allowed whole seem to measure in real time from the comfort and the operating room what is the fill, the, the, how much cement do they have in those huge silos and order in time uh, reinforcements. Okay? So they, we did in January 2021 a corporate day. Immediately they signed an NDA. By the summer they, they, they start the POC in, in Greece. And uh, by September or October, they evaluated positively and already in that year, so in basically one year or less, they deploy in, in three countries, in, in the US, France and, uh, and Greece, of course. And then uh, the idea is to deploy this in all the 70 countries that Holcim is present. So you, you can see that in this is the advantage for the startup, the scale. And of course, Holcim is not the only one uh, in this world uh, working on cement. Another example, ne uh, Neste, you know, the, the second biggest Finnish corporate uh, in the energy domain and circularized. They, uh, following a corporate day, they announced both uh, 11 million investment uh, led by Neste and three others, and the pilot with 10, corp with 10 partners to uh, certify the sustainability of the supply chain. Again, in a relatively short time, they go from a, prov from, a, from a corporate day to signing contract and investment. We are not obliging to invest, but <coughs> still um, it's good if that's happened. And then last but not least, 
Um, we are even going further and we are trying to help corporates to capitalize on their customers. Not all of them, but like in this case, we work with Casha Bank in Spain, the biggest bank in Spain, which they have a specific agricultural bank called Agrobank. They have half a million farmers and small agrotech SMEs. And you see there, it's a bit small. They develop these five challenges, both horizontal, like energy, ICT, et cetera, and vertical, more biotech and, and water, et cetera. And they say, when we publish those, we get a huge, I think was the second or biggest response, 118 proposal you see there. They, they, they pre-selected them, they had a pitching day, they even bring to the uh, uh, Future of Food Trade Fair in Bilbao, uh, and I think you can, you, can see, you can see there. And in the end, what they will do, they will, through their sales force, sell the products of our EIC beneficiary, the last 10 that you see there, to via their sales force, to their customer, half a million, and very important, provide them money to buy those services. So, and so you can imagine how huge support is for the companies, for the EIC beneficiary, because they will get the money, and we don't have to go to another bank to, to get the money to build this product so that they can get the money later on. And of course, we want to streamline this to, the, to, to um, have this pilot, that's what we call it a pilot, through other countries in Europe. Uh, starting, of course, from the agricultural domain. So if you are interested, let us know. And just to finish on time, I would like to let you with one message today. Supply side measures are, not su are necessary, very necessary, but not sufficient, and that the business growth means much more than funding. And that's why we have to our beneficiary, AC beneficiary, the business acceleration services and Corporate Partnership Program has demonstrated both traction on both supply side and demand side and the impact, and we hope to continue to improve. So if you are interested, join forces with us so that we can help even more scale-ups in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and now, moving on to the Deep Tech Alliance, Thomas, could you tell us your uh, perspective on this, what you guys are doing, and, and what uh, problem are you solving? I'd be happy to. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so my name is Thomas Anderson. I'm an alliance manager for, for Deep Tech Alliance, and I'll see how much I can get across in, in just five minutes. Uh, but very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Deep Tech Alliance. Uh, the numbers we have to date are partners, programs, results, and uh, if we have time, also dive into some of the learnings. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, but I think we can all agree, as it, as it says here, the deep tech journey is complex, long, and costly. It holds high potential, uh, but it cannot be made successfully alone. And that's why we need ecosystem initiatives. So um, Deep Tech Alliance, I guess it's a, a sort of a grassroots uh, initiative. Um, we are a collaboration between nine Deep Tech startup support organizations from nine different countries in Europe, closely associated with technical universities. We collaborate together to provide the startups we work with in our own ecosystems, but also startups in Euro Europe at large, with access to capital opportunities, and business opportunities on a European uh, level. And we do it by connecting the startups with uh, co our corporate partners and investors. Currently, we uh, focus uh, primarily on the domains of uh, clean energy and Industry 4.0. Uh, we also have some initiatives going on supported by the uh, European Union. Um, so here are some numbers with some funky circles. Uh, um, so to date, uh, we spent I'll start from the beginning. So this whole Alliance initiative was launched a little more than five years ago with a grant from the Danish Industry Foundation. The first couple of years we spent forming the Alliance, finding the first partners, agreeing on what do we want to do together. In 2020, so not so long ago, we started launching, uh, running our own joint uh, programs. So today we have these nine members, we've run four of our matchmaking programs, we've done three EU-supported programs together, uh, we've had 113 uh, startups, deep tech startups, through our program since 2020, engaged thir uh, 35 uh, paying corporate partners and um, 71 um, VCs. And um, 
the results we're measuring is kind of yeah the volume of matchmaking meetings we we are facilitating also follow-up meetings but most importantly expected collaborations we run quite short programs and these types of collabor collaboration takes a long time to manifest so that's why we're measuring on the expectation level um, these are the partners we've been working with today um, paying and committed partners that's important to us to have skin in the game and the programs we run uh, together are uh, fully financed by these uh, participating partners, both uh, our preferred VCs, our corporate partners, and actually also the participating startups. And that's really healthy, I think, for us because it makes us super, super focused on delivering value because they're sort of our customers also. Um, and, and, and I think that that's, yeah, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's super healthy for an initiative like this. Um, I'll jump quickly to... Uh, explaining a little bit about the, the types of program we're running. So they're quite short, only eight weeks long, fully focused on matchmaking. Um, this is uh, some numbers from our current, uh, currently running clean energy program, for which we've selected 23 startups from 13 different European countries, according to the needs of the 20 uh, 25 involved corporate partners. And uh, within the, the eight weeks, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, uh, focus on bringing them together. and. Um, for them to explore collaboration potential. We always have two events associated with these, each program. For this particular event, we had one, our Italian member, Polyhop, hosting an event, our kickoff event in Naples. So here are some photos from that event with all of our ecosystem members represented there on the top and all the participants or corporate partners and startups in, um, in the bottom. And that's also really important to give them an opportunity for face-to-face -face networking. And a lot of uh, a lot of magic happens just in where they have opportunity to explore potential uh, collaboration potential together. This is the batch. So the 23 startups selected based on the needs of the corporate partners. Very, they were very interested in all types of energy storage solutions, hydrogen-related uh, power to X types of solutions carbon capture and, uh, uh, and storage. And uh, Summit is next week, is that correct? Yes, next week here in Stockholm. Can Hosted we come? You can come, you are <laughs> invited. Uh, it is by invita invitation only, but you're now invited. Um, <laughs> I extend it to everyone. It's hosted <laughs> by our Swedish member, uh, Things. I believe Magnus is sitting down there, so, so he'll be, he's right now working hard to make all ends meet. Um, here's some numbers from our most recent program. Uh, so partners, expected collaborations. What I'll point out here is that we also started measuring expected collaborations between the corporates themselves because we found out that there's as much value between them as with the startups uh, representing them too. So that's really, really interesting and something that's also been, been pointed to previously today. Um, I have a list here of some what I believe are non-trivial aspects of animating a thriving, eco a thriving ecosystem. I don't think I have time within my Keeps presentation them guessing. to go they through them. They can go them. to the homepage <laughs> and have a look. Exactly, mm -hmm. uh, but it's you know we found we've learned a lot about what works, what's been challenging, and uh, also what we we've uh, we've learned a lot uh, building these programs. So uh, I'm happy to share with any of you if any of thing any of these uh, headlines strike some interest. Um, I'll say this, what we're really proud about is that we, I think, I believe we've managed to uh, build an alliance of actually committed members and partners from uh, these nine different countries in Europe. We're still growing, adding new members. Um, and uh, I think I also want to mention that even though we are associated to the university ecosystems, our mem most of our members are university external. Uh, which also helps us in this, types of this type of matchmaking because we primarily work with incorporated companies and use the universities due to state, ad regulation, state aid regulations and university law cannot support incorporated companies. Um, but it's when they get to that stage that they need access to the, the VCs and, and the corporate partners. Um, and that's what we do. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for sharing. <coughs> If you could click, we will then... Stina, did you have slides?
Yeah. Yeah, there yeah, they are. I was like, okay, well, I will not show them. <laughs> Stina, <laughs> could you tell us? Yeah. And I, I want to bake in a question into the Thank presentation, you. which I think the audience shares with me, yeah. is, is there enough matchmaking for you all to do the same thing? Or are you actually competing? Is there a collaboration opportunity? So see if you can uh, add that as you present Ignite. <laughs> so are we happy with the growth of our Swedish or European startups? Are we happy with that? I think w there's definitely room for improvement. We've seen that over the last two days. So obviously there is room for more matchmaking for because more. all of them need customers. Okay, so that was the easy question, Aurora. <laughs> uh, so uh, we started Ignite uh, back in 2016 by the initiative actually of Per Hedberg. I think he's in the audience here. He will come up on stage yeah. in a uh, second. CEO of uh, Sting. And uh, quite quick, we... Uh, built a community with, with some more incubators and we wanted to solve one challenge and that was that we saw that the Swedish startups, they got their first customer often from abroad and that led obviously to the fact that they also moved abroad when they became a little bit bigger. So we wanted to support them to build a solid first customer base geographically close to Sweden or Europe, not only US and, and Asia because that was the facts. Uh, until now, I'm just going to give you some numbers, and this is since uh, 2017. We've been working with almost 1,400 startups and scale-ups, some are later stage two, but mainly startups, so there's the first customers. Those customers are really important. Uh, 291 corporates, 10 countries, 90 matchmaking events, and we started to, to measure the follow-up ratio of how many of our meetings actually led on to a follow-up. That was the first really important key. Mm. And when we started, that ratio was about 38% <coughs> maybe. So the matches were fairly good, uh, but we have improved, as you see, to 55. And I'm extremely proud of that because that has really been in the tailoring. And, uh, we count, we present our results each year, and last November we have reached uh, 453 commercial collaborations. So, we are very startup first centric. We support the startups with the opening the doors to the right customer. And independent if it's public sector or private sector or a multinational, international corporate or a Swedish corporate, that doesn't matter. The important part is it should be a potential real customer. Uh, and uh, we, we give the startups on sales training. They're often very good in pitching for investors. They're less good in actually sales meetings and sales dialogue. Uh, we do coaching, of course, and we have some legal support. We have some frame legal templates, for example, that, that we can also give the corporates say, hey, if you do this, then you're nice to startups, because that's also very important to educate the corporates to do a fair startup deal and it's not super easy for them with their legal and procurement. And with the large organizations, uh, we don't do much. There's a lot of consultants out there and others that can support the, start, uh, the corporates in how they should innovate uh, with startups. So that's not our business at all, but we do offer a network because we understood that they need to learn from each other and that's their best learning source. And, of course, we also do the needs analysis. So I think the process is quite similar to yours. Yeah, I see, I see. Totally sector agnostics. These are some of the numbers of the startups that we, we have been working with, just to understand the areas of them. 50% approximately is deep tech, and deep tech takes time. Uh, so a normal digital collaboration, this is our process. A normal digital collaboration takes about six to nine months after the first meeting to enter a contract. But within deep tech, it's years. So now we see a lot of fantastic results from meetings that we did 2018. So this, I think, is super important to remember. Deep tech takes time and you need to be patient. But the relation is super important. When it comes to um, the types of different uh, uh, collaborations uh, that, that uh, we see happens between the, the large one and the small one. I think this can be, this has been published in some, uh, some publications as well. Uh, it's quite interesting. One thing is to, you know, buy 
a fairly developed product. That's quite easy. Why should we support in those kind of matchmakings? Is it because it's really difficult for them to find each other? They don't know how to Google each other, and especially for the startup, how to find the exact right person within the large customer company. Almost impossible. But more often, uh, the case is that uh, the corporate customer or the public customer, they present a case to the startup, and the startup realized when seeing this case, aha, my technology can actually adopt by maybe 10%, and then I have a potential market that I had no idea about. So it's a lot of business development also in these first customer stories uh, for, the for the startups, which is super important. And uh, it can also be the other way around. Uh, when a corporate meets a novel technology, and they might not have an idea about that this technology was actually this developed so that they could use it. So then the corporate gets an epiphany. It's like, wow, now I can solve this really huge problem that I have here because I met this fantastic startup with this very brand new technology. That often happens quite a lot. And then, of course, this, the last one, the creating. Sometimes they actually create something together. I have three concrete examples, but my time is kind of out. But just to give you the diversity of it, we have an AI that teaches children to speak better Swedish before they start school, non-native Swedish. That's an integration problem. Uh, also, this is also another application that can scan for breast cancer with a mobile phone. So you can, you know, as a woman, you know what that means, that you don't have to go into these big machines. And of course, most importantly, it's extremely affordable to all women. And uh, this is another case uh, where we use metals in a much, much smarter way. And uh, this, they have been working since 2018, and now they are kind of ready to actually understand what they will do together on the long term. Aurora, I think my time is up. Thank you. Fascinating <laughs> examples and great work. I would like to give you all a hand of applause. And. Um, my cheeky question you answered correctly, which is there's a lot of work. There's more of you needed. Uh, and you're a great uh, beacon of hope that you're uh, putting together these uh, alliances, collaborations, matchmaking, and magic comes out of these meetings. So thank you for your effort, and thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you. So that was uh, unlocking synergies, but what about the ecosystems enablers? Uh, welcoming up on stage to talk more about how Europe is collaborating uh, to catalyze uh, the European deep tech community. I invite uh, Thomas Kösters, MD at Deep Ecosystems. We have Elvira Shishenina, <laughs> President and Co-Founder at QuantX and Quantum Computing Lead at BMW Group. And finally, Martin Svensson from AI Sweden. Yeah. Welcome up Thank on stage. You. Thank you very much. Thomas Kösters, as an ecosystems enabler, tell us what's your take on how to catalyze this ecosystem? Mm. Before I go to the slides, I think I want to comment on something that we uh, said a lot today. It's like we don't have time. We, we, we need to be really, really, really fast. And at the same time, we hear deep tech takes a lot of time. And uh, I think that is one of the big conundrums that, that we need to solve. We need to take the time for the ecosystems to evolve. Because if we come from a perspective, we need to have it tomorrow, then we run the danger of doing a lot of grave mistakes. Um, I think that ecosystems are all about setting the right incentives. They are setting the right collaboration incentives for various stakeholders with the end goal of creating a new industry. Right? And when we're talking about deep tech and we're talking about all of these new technologies that might come, we're in the end talking about the creation of new indu industries. And these new industries, they need to set up a completely new supply chain and, uh, thank you, um, and need to collaborate on ways that uh, has not done before. So, and that only works in very few cases, and it's regionally defined, it's vertically, de vertically defined, and it's very, very hard to get this done. So what we need to do is, in the beginning of setting up an ecosystem, it needs to be about the right rules, the right collaboration incentives, it needs to be about setting up like a small 
incubation of that ecosystem with the willing and those that understand how this innovation can work and this system they build among each other that will expand over time take over and push out the old system right and if we take that serious we need time an ecosystem and if you all have read Brett Feld uh, and his book about startup communities and said um, we are a relatively young ecosystem in Boulder, Colorado. It takes 30 years to build an ecosystem. So let's not forget the basics of ecosystem building by all of the hype and by all of the um, great um, ambitions we have. We cannot rush it. Um, so that's why we, at Deep Ecosystems, we say ecosystems matter more than unicorns. You can replace unicorns with other things. Um, all our ambitions and wishes, they are important. But if we say, if we start from the end and say tomorrow we need to have that, we forget to build the basis, which is the ecosystem. So what we are setting out to do is, is to help to bring this revolutionary framework of ecosystems into all regions of the world. As DB Ecosystems, we have an accelerator for entrepreneurs who want to build their ecosystem. And we have a solid basis that now in the next three minutes I cannot completely cover, um, but we are based this on... This is a teaser, <laughs> so tease them with all the things that you can do. Exactly. This is a teaser. This is about the concept behind ecosystems that um, we want entrepreneurs to understand. We want entrepreneurs to build their own ecosystems. We don't want them to rely on the corporate and on the government world to come and say, we organize that for you. We show you how you can collaborate. Now, it needs to come from the entrepreneurs themselves. The entrepreneurs need to invest in the creation of the ecosystem, of the creation of the industry they want to disrupt the world. And that's what we are doing. So we are creating self-propelling ecosystems by getting local ecosystem builders, which are entrepreneurs and are long-term committed um, to join forces, create a new culture of collaboration, create a new community around their regional innovation space as well as their vertical that they want to create. And then we give them the resources and the structures that maybe for them is a little bit foreign because they are a business people, they are not ecosystem builders in the first place. So they need a bit of these best practices, they need a bit of these structures that help to orchestrate the collaboration between young firms, uh, like we heard from other examples just before. So we provide them with these resources and structures as an accelerator, so they then themselves can own it and grow very fast these unicorn ecosystems that emerge through the collaboration. Now, is that actually true what I'm telling you? And now I want <laughs> to give you some three examples of where this actually happened because ecosystems that are successful today did really start with entrepreneurs who set out and said, I want to change my region. And these three examples, Brad Feld, Boulder, Colorado, you all know it. No one would have expected Techstars to come out of Boulder, Colorado, not the Silicon Valley. Um, Helmut Schönenberger, Unternehmertum in Munich, was mentioned often today already. Um, I started my career there, very impressive. He was an entrepreneur, it's a private company. Um, Roxanne Vasa, an ex-colleague of mine at Microsoft, she is the CEO of Station F, which is financed by um, Xavier Neal, um, which is again a private funded ecosystem. So bottom up, entrepreneurs can actually create world class ecosystems. Now, we have built a platform to grow ecosystems. We invite entrepreneurs to join, uh, and it's basically an accelerator that we offer. So you join an accelerator program to create your ecosystem. We have done so in 35 projects. Up until today, they have raised 1.7 million for their ecosystem projects already. We cover more than 15 countries, and we do the next call I think next week, Tuesday. Um, so if you have an ecosystem project applied to the accelerator, you can join a global community over 250 ecosystem builders already organized. You get intelligence about ecosystem building. You get the chance to realize your moonshot project and you're in good hands because the founders of Deep Ecosystems have been creating Startup Chile, have been working with the Portuguese government uh, uh, ecosystem, have been part of Unternehmertum, F Estonia, um, et cetera. So, we are very excited to have new projects at Deep Ecosystems. Train the trainer. Thank you so much, Thomas, for sharing that, which I thought was a very good teaser. Moving on, QuantX. Could you tease us about the ecosystem that you're building around quantum computing? 
Yes, thanks so much. Very honored to be here today. And uh, thanks to the organizers and all the speakers for those amazing talks. I, I think I learned a lot during the two days. Um, so you already got in touch with the quantum computing technology, right? Today, earlier. And uh, I think you very well know that it's not any more discovery. It's rather in the engineering phase. We have the first prototype of quantum computers <coughs> that enable us to develop the first software and apply it to some of the industrial uh, use cases. And I'm actually also representing the industry today because I'm leading quantum computing research and applications in BMW, uh, one of the pioneers since 2017 of this technology. Uh, but today I would like to not touch, let's say, the technical challenges of hardware and software development, but rather speak about the ecosystem development because we all agree that this can be also a very crucial factor to enhance the technology progress. And uh, I will speak on behalf of the two nonprofits, French nonprofits, that pioneer in the development of the quantum computing ecosystem in France, Le Lab Quantique or Quantum Lab, um, which mainly works in a close collaboration uh, with the French government and the French National Quantum Plan, um, and operates on the national level. And uh, uh, the Quantix, which is rather a branch responsible for animation and bringing all the clusters, not only the academia, industry, startups, but also the business groups, the CPA investors, uh, policy makers into one collaborative platforms through many events. And I'm actually very thrilled <laughs> to present you one of our babies. Um, it's a series of big quantum, or this one, the latest one, was a hybrid quantum AI HPC hackathon uh, that we organized since 2021 all over the world. Big why? Well, the number of participants who are actually participating in presence is probably not the biggest one. But we are specifically proud of the number of the players and different clusters involved in the organization of this business tech competition. The competition happens in four days in physical presence. The last one was in Paris uh, and involved two phases. The technical phase, um, yeah, the technical phase, uh, um, uh, we have 10 uh, industrial companies, big leading groups who provide the use cases the real-life use cases and also their specialists uh, who assist the teams uh, in the physical presence and, uh, to better understand the problems. We have 10 quantum software and hardware providers who provide access to their platforms as well as their specialist assisting on place and usage of those platforms. As well as this year, they brought also five European HPC centers to enhance the creation of this hybrid quantum HPC technology. And the last but not least, of course, the competitors who are mainly the students or young engineers all over the Europe, uh, as well as we had some US representatives and people coming from Saudi Arabia and Singapore. You can see here in, uh, in the slides uh, some of the uh, companies and use cases covering many different industrial sector, aerospace, automotive, telecommunications, energy. We are particularly proud to uh, at every edition of a hackathon have, having a newbies. So this year it was LVMH, in 2021 it was L'Oreal who practically started their initiative from our quantum hackathon. So they were curious enough to bring their use cases and specialists and try the first path in the quantum journey. And we also have some serial uh, <laughs> participants such as French Ministry of Armed Forces who provided the use case on quantum, post-quantum uh, cryptography for the, for the second time uh, during this, this last edition. Long story short, people compete during the technical phase. The best solutions are selected by the jury of world-known experts and sent to the business phase, where you actually have uh, not students, but rather business professionals coming from the consulting group, the CPE investors, deep tech founders, who take those technical solutions and try to sell them back to the industrial companies and propose some strategies how to integrate the technology in the future and what benefit it will bring. They also compete, they also pitch their solutions to the business jury and then we select the winners and these are some memories <laughs> from the last edition. Um, the award ceremony in the presence of a French minister uh, for digital economy, Jean-Noël Barraud, and also the Nobel Prize in physics uh, Alain Aspe. So 
we were very we were very lucky to welcome them because we could encourage the, the people to pursue their careers. And also, as a successful story that we usually say is that this hackathon, they provide such a great platform for communication. You already mentioned that the place, it's important to get people together and to provide them uh, the possibility for the magic to happen, right? <laughs> and uh, based on those hackathons, we could actually develop a network of uh, trustworthy partners together with the use cases that we collect, of course. And uh, based on that hackathons, there was more than 20 collaborations built between the companies and business groups, as well as plenty of students confined their PhDs, employment uh, in the quantum computing space. So we continue to expand our competitions all over the world. We already had editions in Canada, in UK, with the local ecosystems. And now we plan four hackathons in Chicago, in Switzerland, in Basel, uh, in Qatar, and special edition for Olympic Games. And just if I may, 15 seconds, uh, those hackathons also motivated the creation of uh, two projects. One of them is the House of Quantum, or La Maison du Quantique. It's a physical space in, in France, in Paris, for instance, uh, where we could host the resident scientists from thus industry, academia, startups, as well as business groups. So the soft launch is previewed in July with the launching of the working spaces, uh, working posts, and uh, the inauguration and the presence of a government in September. So you are all very welcomed. And um, to ensure the continuity between those singular hackathons and competitions, we also plan to launch the platform that will basically collect those use cases, expose them to the ecosystem, and provide the possibility to all the talents all over the world to brainstorm on their solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you. it wasn't too fast. <laughs> It's encouraging to see that you're taking something that feels very futuristic and slightly complicated and showcasing it and making it real and moving the needle. So I thank want the you. house of quantum in Stockholm as well. I, you're inspired. The, yes. the Vinova to-do list is happening in parallel. <laughs> you're, uh, great job. I'd like to ask Martin to come here uh, as well and talk to us about AI Sweden, both in terms of an ecosystem builder, uh, but also a general pusher and catalyzer for uh, movement. Cher, what are you uh, up to? Yes, thank you. I'm probably representing an example of building such an ecosystem. Uh, we started off in uh, 2019 to build an ecosystem around the mission of accelerating the use of AI, uh, both for competitiveness and for a better society. And um, an ecosystem is absolutely essential for doing that. I mean, you can imagine whatever company involved or organization would likely not have the data, the competence, and perhaps the, the place where the value actually is created. So collaboration is really needed, and that goes for large organization as well as small. So for any deep, deep tech uh, company working with AI, they will probably need to, to collaborate very, uh, very much also in the creation of their product or solution with a customer or, or, or many. Um, but I'd like to take you on a, on a different path than, than the actual innovation as such, because we are about 75 people in Sweden trying to push this with about 110 partners right now. It's growing uh, constantly. And what we see is that we, s we start to talk more about change than innovation. And, and, and why so? Yeah, because we basically believe that there is so much technology out there there are so many AI technologies, so many solutions, that this is this is the the supply of those are are in in ex, uh, exceed the, the demand, and the demand is very much based on the leadership among the companies, organizations that could create value with AI. So we really believe that we need to think much more in, in terms of change, thinking that the technology is out there and that we need to change in order to make good use of it. Uh, and therefore, we also invest quite a lot in, in areas that we call AI transformation. That is much more about the business value, the organization, the legal aspects, and so on. Uh, and this really starts to, to pay off now. So um, doing that in an ecosystem, in a multilateral way, where we gather the stakeholders in, in area after area to talk about this thing, to learn together, to build knowledge together, uh, that really, really starts to work. So that's my first point. Think more about 
this as a change exercise rather than innovation, because the innovation is there. We, ha we have access to much more technology than we typically, as an individual organization, is ready and capable of, of adopting. Uh, then, uh, AI Sweden is unlike many AI initiatives around the globe. We are not based, or re we don't origin out of research or academia. We are much more a group of, of entrepreneurs saying, okay, what does it really take to accelerate the use in an ecosystem, uh, the use of AI in a country or an ecosystem, right? And and therefore we think a little bit differently. Uh, and one other thing that I think really we need to to uh, recognize in Europe is that the the big breakthroughs in AI, and you have all of you in the room have experienced this the last couple of months, right? The big breakthroughs are not done today in academia, are done in private sectors and typically by non-European country companies, right? So what does that mean for us? Okay, we, we need to recognize this first. We can't consider <laughs> AI to be research. And this is the case, actually, if you look at governments and big organizations everywhere. It's still something that is coming. It's not something that's coming, something that is here. So it, the, the, this, this is commercially driven. This is engineering. This is less research. We still have tons of research questions, right? But the technology is already here. So we need to think about it as such. Therefore, we also have realized that, okay, we need to fill some holes here uh, since the, the European academic world is not um, there to generate the big breakthroughs. So we have invested in a, in a number of things. There are two areas that we think are really, really important when it comes to the adoption of AI. One is the, the large models, today language, and as we heard before, also going into multimodal. We need on a European, in a, in, we need in Europe to, not, not to be perhaps cutting edge and, and really be at the same pace as the global leaders, but we need to build that knowledge and we need to think about what models in uh, as infrastructure do we need to supply to our companies and, and public organization. And this goes all the way from the, the biggest to the smallest company. So that's, that's one thing. We are the only one having built large language models in an open fashion in Europe. We're very happy to discuss that with any of you. The second field that I'd like to mention that I think is up and coming is the centralized AI, distributed AI, if you, if you wish, or some call it federated learning and so on. But in a broad sense, we have the large models on one side and we're going to go much more into distributed uh, solutions. So here we are also investing and, and we're doing that together with with a lot of large corporations, uh, both, both Swedish, European, but also American, building knowledge in this field uh, collectively in an open way. Uh, we call it Edge, uh, edge Learning Lab. Uh, very happy to invite you there also. But these two things, large models and distributed systems is something I think for you who are interested in the future of AI is something you should look into. And I'm gonna stay on time, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Before we uh, take a quick break for coffee, I thought we have Mr. Vinova on stage mm -hmm. and you are Sweden's innovation en uh, agency. Uh, you're representing them now. Yes. Uh, on your to-do <coughs> list, you've added the house of uh, quantum. quantum. Yeah. From other speakers and uh, the speakers now, what's jolted your imagination? Well, like looking for the, the white spots on the map, I'm thinking from a regulatory and policy uh, making perspective that, as you said, Thomas, we need to move fast, yes, but also slow. Some of the regulatory processes are really slow, so we need to get going on these and thinking about alternative futures. That's a really important thing. Also looking at other, uh, I mean, do we have the right people around the table? When matchmaking, do, do we make sure that we also have uh, civic society and do we have the academia on, on, on board? Because we need to get together and really find acupuncture points here to make sure that we address the societal challenges point on and not like in a broad sense. So yeah, a couple of interesting uh, notes here. The to-do list is growing. You've it inspired Vinova, uh, which is a great thing, and the audience, and us. Thank you so much for sharing. Coffee break, back at 2.25. <laughs>
Great. The ABBA, the Ace of Bass, the Rock Set, <laughs> all the Swedish music that are coming out of the head, um, the microphone. No, what's it called? The speakers. Uh, speakers, yes. Speakers. Mm -hmm. Any favorites? Swedish classics? Oh, being, being a singer in <laughs> ABBA, the museum, the choir, I'd say ABBA, but uh, yeah. And we move on. Uh, the last section of today. Who are we going to listen to now, Joachim? Uh, so now, now we're going into uh, securing intellectual assets, supporting measures for an active IPR engagement. And welcoming up to on stage here, we've got, sorry, the names here are... In, uh, Director of the Customer Department of the EU IPO, IPO. CD Administrative Office, Inge Buffalo. Please welcome. We start immediately. First of all, uh, it's really great to be here. I think uh, uh, it's already uh, a pleasure to listen to what all these presentations uh, given. And of course, it's also very nice that I have the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, EU IPO and how we can help uh, uh, deep tech SMEs or SNE. Uh, in general, um, we are looking, of course, we are European IP office, we are looking on how they uh, deal with their IP rights engagement and uh, how they follow up on their IP portfolio. So let's see if this works. Yes. So, we heard, of course, already a lot about uh, the European Commission strategies and policies which aim to capture and scale up the measures needed to ensure Europe's prosperity, competitiveness and, of course, the growth. So, when it comes to SMEs, including deep tech SMEs, the priorities of the European industrial strategy, the uh, new European innovation agenda and the intellectual property action plan, they actually shape the direction of many of the initiatives we do and we initiate and we do that together with the Commission, we collaborate very strongly with the national IP offices and I will talk a little bit also other of uh, many other organizations, European organizations we collaborate with. So, our studies, one of our branch is making studies and also uh, this was already mentioned by Darren uh, Tang, the Director of the General, uh, Director General at the uh, uh, WIPO, World IP Intelle uh, Intellectual Property Organization, which shows that SMEs with IP rights have on average, almost 70% higher revenues per employee than those who have not. And this would be very promising were we not in the situation that only 10% of SMEs in Europe own registered IP rights. So protecting IP rights is actually not often a priority for businesses, even less so regularly following up on them. We know that this can lead to difficulties when a startup wants to scale up. It can even lead to its failure. So our mission at the UIPO is to add value by developing actions that support them. And uh, these activities, they focus mainly on improving IP awareness, increasing IP rights ownership, helping the businesses to grow, helping to enforce their IP rights and uh, to protect their IP abroad. So in presenting the challenges that deep tech SMEs face when it comes to protecting their intellectual property, we should also acknowledge that there is a plenty of opportunities and the level of in investment is only set to increase. So one of the largest growth opportunity market, deep tech SMEs tend to be very R&D intensive. We heard a lot about it, using innovation, innovative and emerging technologies to solve a problem. And with 96% of deep tech ventures using at least two technologies, they are very IP rich. 
because of their R&D intensive and IP rich nature, and this has uh, been mentioned several times uh, at this conference, it can be uh, years before an SME manages to commercialize its innov innovation. And for a while, therefore, IP might be the only asset a deep tech startup has, so protecting it and developing a robust IP strategy is critical to its success. And I see I'm running out of time. I will get shorter. So, and uh, we have spoken a lot about creating synergies and we the EUIPO, we want to join this need. And therefore, we have created the European Union Intellectual Property Network. And there we bring closer uh, the EUIPO with the European national and regional IP offices, as well as with international partners to make IP rights more accessible, user-friendly and uh, effective. In raising IP awareness and skills and in collaboration with 20 European member associations from the SME ecosystem, we created also the Ideas Powered for Business uh, Network, covering uh, business areas such as crowdfunding, accountancy, business angels and innovations. And last year, uh, the EIPO, we have reached 22,000 SMEs uh, through more than 250 activities. And um, I would now take, get I get 30 seconds, I just want to share a couple of initiatives. So here we see, and I was uh, also on Wednesday, there was uh, a conference of, uh, by the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, EIT. This is one uh, area of support. They have this very ambitious uh, target to uh, train one million young people and our, uh, we will provide them support, how we will disseminate information, we will give them IP uh, material, we will prepare talks or we will also give uh, training. Then we are also uh, collaborating with the EIC. So uh, there we are running a pilot in IP due diligence. And this is uh, an initiative where the uh, EASME has made a call for interest to uh, prepare uh, IP specialists, which would then look at the IP portfolio and as how to support this. Ooh, this is. And uh, finally, I would like just one of our flagship tools and then I will have to stop. This is the SME fund. Here we uh, have uh, put in a three-year program 60 million euros. Uh, for the SMEs and there they can have uh, support by IP experts to look at their IP portfolio but also financial support in protecting their IP rights uh, such as patents, trademarks and design and so far we have supported uh, 50,000 European SMEs and I think they all look very much, I could maybe give some more but uh, given the <laughs> current time situation I stop here. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing. <laughs> Clearly, and it's been a theme throughout the last two days, <laughs> IP is an important part to create a fer fertile ground for a functioning deep tech ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, your work and the others' work have clearly outlined what we need to do, how much we're doing, and uh, the announcements yesterday also shows that we're cr creating more of an inner market and allowing yeah. uh, small businesses to we take the leap. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Thank, Thank you. you. Before moving on into my uh, into the next topic, uh, navigating uncertainty, th that's one of my favorite uh, pastimes. Um, I just want to mention that you guys in the room, you get the premium treatment, you get the scent, you get the smell of us, or, and you get the in-between sessions and we get co coffee outside. But also, if there's something you're missing or something, what, what was that, what was that slide? Everything is not only live streamed, Hello, everyone out there. Uh, we also have this live stream, of course, going to be published afterwards. So we all can get go back to these sessions and rewatch them and really dig deep into what, what has been said here during these days. 
That's yes. <laughs> Good to know. And the next session will be navigating uncertainty, funding the and talent in deep tech development. We would like to welcome up on stage the EIT Deep Tech Talent Initiative, Johan Stare, Nordic Angels, Andreas Grape, and women, uh, your European women in VC, welcome. Inga. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Hey. Hey. Welcome. Thanks. Inca Mero, you are the managing partner of Voima, is that the right pronunciation? Voima Ventures, yes. Yes. Could you start and talk to us about uh, women, women in European venture capital? Happy to do that. Thanks so much and, and good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you. There, there are still some people here awake. Hey, um, so just very briefly before we dive into the venture capital industry, and, and the diversity in that, and also the tech-related diversity. Very briefly, uh, Boima Ventures is a science and deep tech venture capital fund, which I'm running. I'm the founder of it. Uh, we launched the fund four years ago, and today um, we actually have 200 million euros under management on our third fund, and, and we're now basically uh, sort of a launch in that third fund. And we invest only into deep tech companies. So university, research institutions, spin institutions spin-offs, very early stage. Uh, so not only uh, bits, but also atoms, anything from quantum to life sciences and synthetic biology. So sort of a, the hard part. And why I'm here is that I'm one of the founders in the uh, European venture capital, uh, women in venture capital. And, and uh, the background obviously is that this is a very, very male-dominated industry. So I actually had two tries before I was able to raise my own fund. And before that, I, I, I had done a long career, both as an entrepreneur, co-founding seven companies, investing to more than 30, international career, and still it was super hard for me to raise a venture capital fund. So let's look at the bit of the data here. Uh, and just uh, let's put things into the context. Uh, venture capital industry in Europe is roughly uh, you know, hundreds of billions under management. But to be, uh, last year, for example, the VC funds raised roughly uh, 23 billion euro. Uh, the firepower of women investors is very small compared to the male investors. So roughly 9% of that capital is actually decided by women where that money will go. Um, and then, of course, like mo sort of a, the data that we often follow is the share of uh, female founder-led teams or women teams or mixed teams in, in the startups. And pure play women teams receive only 1.8% of the total capital in this industry. Uh, mixed teams a bit more, roughly 7 to 8%, at least according to last year's figures. So sort of a, there is a big systemic problem. And, and the big problem is not only like, you know, how can we get more diversity because of the performance, what we see in diverse teams. It's also due to the fact that you, Europe is facing massive demographic challenges. We're basically having really rapidly aging population. So the big question in a way is like, how can our tech community and deep tech community sort of a neglect 50% of the best talent on the market? Uh, easier said than done. And let's look at the numbers a bit for more. Uh, so, uh, in a way, we, we sort of I could say that, of course, you know, there are more women in startups nowadays and there are clearly, you know, more teams who raise money. Yes, uh, there are more startups. So amount of venture capital funding to European startups has obviously grown massively during the last four years. And, and even so, e even more so in the Nordics. Nordics has been alone the highest growing region globally during the last four years. But the share of women and mixed teams sort of a hasn't grown more or less at all. And, and so there is sort of a has to be a few questions asked, like, you know, is it so that women don't want to work in technology or startups or is it uh, less of an ambition level or um, not enough role models or what is it? And clearly the study so shows and Atomico has been very favor, uh, famous for this. They, they've announced a lot of data around this. And women don't find technology industry that appealing because it's considered hard, difficult to access. Um, uh, young women are not encouraged to study necessarily biology, physics, mathematics, and, and all of that. So there are a lot of root causes to that. But one big problem is a lack of role models and also the first investors willing to sort of a coach you and put the first 10,000 or 50,000 to the table. And uh, well, I've, I've raised, you know, I've run my own startups for, throughout my whole life and I've even raised funding when, while I've been pregnant. So I can sort of uh, relate to that, how difficult it can be. 
But uh, one of the things what we also see is that as female investors have less firepower, they are much more likelier to invest into women-led companies, <coughs> but at the same time, um, the impact is less, even though these companies perform the better. So somehow we should systematically and systemically solve this issue. Same thing lies in, or lies in, in, in venture capital altogether. So in this questionnaire, there were over 300 VCs who responded to this. And as you can see, the share of women uh, across different regions varies uh, somewhat. So obviously Nordics and the whole Western alliance is leading a bit more. UK is really a leader here. So there is a big um, uh, difference between UK and rest of Europe. And, and uh, it might be because UK has a sort of a longer history as a, as a venture capital industry. But still the relative firepower of these women uh, in their professions is, is, is very low. Um, also, sort of a now looking ahead, you know, we're basically having fundamental technologies changing our lives in the future. So AI, quantum, synthetic biology, uh, next generation of, of uh, microelectronics and so forth. Um, we're probably going to see even less of a women investors because we don't have that talent necessarily coming from the entrepreneurial side or the science background or investing background. So altogether, um, pretty, pretty hard, hard numbers. And then finally to conclude, obviously um, looking at the sort of a who gets a uh, share of the upside, clearly there's a big difference. So 90% of the male uh, investors get share of their upside in the venture capital. So this is what we're trying to do. We've created Women in European VC initiative. We gather all the new emerging managers, established managers to one network. And one of the concrete things that the Women in VC network has done is that we talk on a weekly basis to investors. So what these women need, they need LPs and institutional investors, European Investment Fund, a lot of these programs to support them to establish their third, first fund. It took me five years, three tries. And I think it's not that everyone can afford it. So this is first thing that we're focusing into. Second thing, of course, is that we're sharing deal flow. We're doing a lot of initiatives like Voima Ventures. We do women to boards initiatives, matching top talent with our portfolio companies and all of that. And my only message in a way is that you can only help, you know, one woman at a time, but in a way it's really worth doing that and all of us should be contributing to that challenge. Thank you. May I just ask you one question, and it was the same question that we were discussing yesterday with the Women Leadership uh, uh, Award that the EIT and the EIC has just announced, which is still open, uh, or opening on the 15th of June. How could you <coughs> briefly just comment on the risk of highlighting these numbers and thereby cementing some sort of victimhood of women uh, as opposed to the importance of highlighting the numbers and therefore addressing the root causes? Well, I don't see any victimizing in this, this, these numbers and eventually, you know, there are a lot of women who've made their way, uh, but I think it's important that we recognize the systemic challenges here. If the institutional money is managed by gender gap, so, so will be the VC and so will be the uh, startup community. Unless we fix that and recognize that, nothing will happen. It's a numbers game. Thank you for sharing. Andreas, could you tell us about uh, Nordic Angels and please uh, build on what Inka said in terms of uh, the diversity of your group? We need a microphone. Try. But there's a handheld there. If worst okay. Case. Uh, oh, there no, works. No, no. Thank you so much for having me. Should become member in Nordic Angels. <laughs> Actually, I asked you <laughs> before you went on, before we went on stage. Uh, we, my name is Andreas Grape. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Nordic Angels. Uh, it's an initiative we founded three years ago. Me and Ash Pornori, together with 40 of Sweden's most uh, recognized angels, um, we saw the need of angels working better together sharing deal flow, sharing their portfolio companies, helping their entrepreneurs, and also in terms of getting the, the different kind of cities to work closer together. So I've been here two days now and I heard a lot about collaboration, early funding, et cetera, et cetera. And that's actually what the angels are accountable for. Because if you think of it, an angel, as we define them, are people who contribute with their capital, with their knowledge, network, and engagement. They could be entrepreneurs turned into angels, wants to give back to the ecosystem. 
could be politicians. We're actually, some of you guys in the audience are members at Nordic Angels today. I see some of you. Uh, and we all need to help, we need to help each other to actually succeed. So we don't, you know, we started this, we don't have a business model. It's more of a high trust social media that I'm going to show you guys. You're going to be some of the first people to see this. So the problem is that there's a matching problem because there's a lot of capital out there and there's a lot of ventures out there, but they don't meet each other because it's a private environment, right? You cannot list, list it in papers or on, on, on the web uh, in, in uh, th that, that kind of um, media. So the thing is that we, we saw that and angels need to be stimulated. They need to have, uh, people need to know uh, what their contribution is. So what we do is that nobody's built stuff for angels before. Nobody has given them the tools to be more efficient. And uh, um, nobody has been facilitating them to meet on their terms. There's a lot of entrepreneurs events out there. They're awesome. But nobody has built anything only for the angels. So an angel could be a person who works for a VC or a guy or girl who puts in the first ticket. And there are approximately 200,000 of these people in the Nordics. So it's a large group, right? Uh, we, together with Boston Consulting Group, uh, I'm going to show you some slides, uh, are, are creating a report now that's called uh, State of European Angels. We're going to launch it during the autumn as one of our initiatives. We're also launching a, a, an angel prize ceremony to highlight angels and their contributions. We also do newsletter, podcast, and a lot of stuff regarding the angel environment. Uh, so, what we have in the Nordic is trust. That's an amazing uh, thing we have. We trust each other, uh, and we are, uh, what we want to say that we have a lot of high trust here. So I think that when you assemble people in this kind of rooms, you establish high trust. God goes down, and you can see how you can collaborate. So that, that is what we wanted to build a digital platform for. And I, when you talked about role models, I love that, because we had Bjorn Borg as an amazing tennis player uh, some years ago. And after his era, we had 15 tennis players in the top 100. Uh, that's amazing. Today, we have the best tennis player. His place is 59. We only have one on the top uh, 100. On the, uh, on the men's side. So I think that role models is super important. Uh, and wow, the time is going. Uh, yeah, be a role model in clicking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, sorry. Uh, so uh, the vision, I walked through that a little bit. Uh, this is angel contribution in Sweden. Uh, six times more than public capital. It's super important uh, that this group is stimulated. We, that is the only thing we're focusing on. Um, so it's roughly about 25,000 new jobs, 2% uh, of Sweden's GDP, uh, but they do so much more. They open doors, they share experience, knowledge, uh, and their competence in helping the entrepreneurs uh, become better. Uh, so the ecosystem was scattered, their angels were underserved, and there was a matching problem. And then we created this one. So we put in 25,000 hours into build a high trust social uh, community platform, high trust social media. And people, the angels can share deal flow. We have audited tools. Uh, they can read news about their portfolio companies and they can share their portfolio companies with other angels. Uh, I think that in terms of Europe, um, the value of the European startup ecosystem surpasses seven trillion dollars. That's more than France and Ger Germany's GDP together. Half of the jobs in OECD, this is a glimpse from the report with the BCG, are set up in the last five years. And startup drive innovation and growth. So these 200 plus unicorns create so much inspiration and role model um, for the others. When can we expect the report? Uh, in uh, autumn, just before the Angel Prize ceremony. So 
we are doing angel investing overview in this report. European angels, dig, uh, we dig, 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 dig a little bit deeper in the Nordic angels area, and we also share insights from the report. So we have a team of five people working with this. So we have some high expectation on it. We will hold you to it. Thank you for sharing. Thank you very much. And last but not least, all these initiatives, everything that we've been talking about the last two days need to be powered by people, hearts, brains, hands and feet. And we would love to hear from you, Professor Yuan Stoddard from the EIT Deep Tech Talent Initiative. How are we going to find the talent to do all these things that we aspire to do? That was my question to you. <laughs> Speak How again. are we going <laughs> to find them? Uh, today I'm representing the uh, European in Institute of Innovation Technology. Uh, my day job is a professor at Chalmers University of Technology in uh, Göteborg. And I'm also chair of the advisory board for the Deep Tech Talent Initiative. We've been talking, had some amazing days here on innovation, startups, deep tech. But we've mostly been talking about infrastructure, about methods, about capital, about dead things, in a sense. <laughs> so I would like to that. become a little bit more personal. And this is what the Deep Tech Talent Initiative is all about. Finding the people that will do all this, that will use all these methods, that will use all these tools. And I think that, let's see, um, as part of this European innovation agenda that was launched uh, last July, uh, one of the flagship is fostering, attracting, and retaining deep tech talent. And who is these deep tech talents then? Because that's still a, quite an abstract word. What's, what's a talent? Is that a person? Industry is looking for talent. There is a skill gap. Who is looking for, who is finding these people? And you have the policy making, you have the acceleration, you have the funding. But who's going to use it? So that's uh, partly why this initiative was formed. It, well, there was a bold uh, um, uh, goal for this. I think that maybe there was a discussion in Brussels. Who, how many do we need? Oh, let's make it 100,000. No, it's too small. 500,000. Oh, let's go. One million. Uh, I'm not sure if one million is going to be enough. No. Maybe there will be need for two million people. But in a nutshell, this initiative run by the EIT and the Knowledge in Asian communities, the nine Euro pan-European communities that actually have businesses and education resources in, in most of the countries on EU27, uh, we, we have now, by now, uh, after half a year, we have 600,000 pledged places for, for training. And we're going to reach this million. We have not trained 600,000. That means that we have room for 600,000. So now we're moving into the second part, the enterprise and the enterprise associations that can pledge their people to get educated and trained. We have financing partners. I would love to have the, we would love to have the angels invest in deep tech talent. How will you ever have companies if you don't have talent? So you should invest in this as well. But also member states and institutional partners, they can directly or indirectly through, through products, uh, projects, etc., do these. We have an example of that in, in Sweden. It's called Ingenieur 4.0. So we have some... Um, I'm missing one. Yeah. So we have some instruments to do this. Um, and we are looking, we, want, we don't want to get, be left behind. So technology, radar, and forecasting to find the deep tech areas is important. We talk deep tech abstractly, but basically it's on the, the left side of the Gartner curve or hype curve, right? So we need to find those technologies. We cannot start with a set of technologies that will be obsolete in two years. We have a gateway to courses and whether we can utilize all these nine knowledge innovation communities their resources, we, they are already there, so we can start using them yesterday. We, have, we will have a, a matching tool, AI-based matching tool, that can help us support the, the finding of, of our people and, and skills. And then we will need to store these learner results. Uh, and some examples of courses that are already there, 
you can read yourself, it's AI for youth. We have big companies like Intel who have pledged to help us. They have uh, themselves a goal of, of educating 30 million people until 2030 globally. So they are supporting us there. We have JA, we have others, you have, you have universities as well. So uh, the kind of, of uh, enterprises and trainings, it's not only for the, uh, the young people. Actually, I was going to show you a demographic picture, but it got lost along the way here. Um, we had a discussion in, the, in these uh, the workshops before. Actually, we have very, very few young people moving into this. I'm not sure if you're aware. In Sweden, we have half as many 20 to 25-year-olds as we have 30 to 35-year-olds in Stockholm and Göteborg. And in Italy, it's even worse. And in Germany, it's, it, it, it's not good either. And we have a, a huge deficit of young people. So I think that we have to leave the stereotype of the young entrepreneur coming out of the university, moving into an, an entrepreneurial state using all these nice instruments behind, because that will not Are be the case. Are you saying there's hope for Joachim? <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's, there's a new career. There's even hope for me. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Uh, I think that, that it, it's super important that, that we understand that the real beneficiaries of these trainings are not 20-year-olds, they're 45-year-olds. Mm. And those are the ones that can also, they should be open are arenas for in the, the entrepreneurial field and all these instruments should invite them because that's why we have the bulk of people. There we have 200 million people in Europe and the young ones, they are only 30 million. We unfortunately don't have that much time, but I was wondering if you could shortly reflect on uh, A, the educational system, is it built for lifelong learning and coming back and going to school and re-educating, but also maybe the uh, social perception of going back to school. Is that seen as the, a new career uh, status, or which I, um, I I, I feel is the potentially the risk, it's seen as I'm no longer useful, I need to take a, a, a plan B, etc. Like the, the social status of, of learning. We have experimented here in Sweden with a national program. We have, uh, I call, the, call this Engineer 4.0, where we have put down, uh, if, you, if you look at this, um, there are some pictures got lost, okay. The, the number of, of credits that we need to pursue, to, to be able to, to count to us this million, is two ECTS, two points. So it's not a long education. So you need to add that on top of your, uh, your regular uh, education. If you are uh, an expert in, in, a, in, a, in a company, then if you add on top of that deep tech talent, of course you can then move your company ahead and do other things that you would do before. And we have the, the, the experience from this engineer 4.0 where the, the companies are lining up with their employees because they want to have this short education, modularized, customized, putting together what they, 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 don't, know, they don't have to break for half a year and go into an education. They can take this in parallel with their regular job. And that makes this social trench, whatever, valley uh, less problematic. I sense more skilled talent, <laughs> more angels, and more women investors. Thank you so much for sharing. I mean, we could easily have a day for each and every Clearly. one of the speakers here. I'm exhausted here. already I mean, just by doing top I nine. I would love to talk more about lifelong learning, and I never cease to be provoked of those uh, lack of diversity in tech innovation or in investment, uh, and also aligning private capital with public capital. Let's, let's, uh, let's uh, book another conference, please. <laughs> Uh, next up, we're going to talk about the new alliance of European entrepreneurship hubs, together with Per Hedberg from his CEO of Sting, together with uh, Mikkel Sørensson, CEO of DTU Skylabs. Welcome up on stage. <laughs> So Hi. here's the real enthusiasts left. We got the absolutely best time ever during the conference. And about 5,000 online viewers. Yes, that's great. So 
Um, we will first present, we're in the wrong uh, setup actually here, but, but nevertheless. <laughs> we will present um, a, a mature ecosystem for you and then an in, a European initiative to link ecosystems in Europe in a very interesting way. So I'm, I'm uh, the founder of Sting, Stockholm Innovation and Growth. We're an independent non-profit ecosystem uh, for startups in Stockholm owned by public-private foundation. We have 20 years of experience um, developing a quite comprehensive ecosystem, one of the most comprehensive you absolutely can find, I think. We have also initiated and developed several other components of the ecosystem here in Stockholm over these little more than 20 years. Today we're the leading incubator and accelerator in the Nordics. We provide extensive and qualified business development support to high potential startups so that they can develop into international growth companies. I'll give you some figures a little bit later here. Um, we accept usually 35 new companies per year to the incubator out of 5 to 10 percent. So 90 percent we do not select. We're 20 persons um, and 12 of us are experienced entrepreneurs who have built companies before uh, in the tech sector. So our core programs in this ecosystem is a large incubator, a large accelerator, and a very special deep tech incubator. That's actually where we started 20 years ago with a deep tech incubator program. Besides this, we run an open coaching program with the plus 400 meetings per year with potential entrepreneurs. Um, several pre-incubator programs, a new Cassini European Space Accelerator program to make money out of space data and also uh, perhaps some uh, upstream things. Um, we recently launched a very interesting um, digital startup school. Um, it's the first European, I think, really uh, developed uh, startup academy based on Nordic values in contrast to the so often US-based startup culture and, and values, which is not wrong, but I think we make it slightly different here uh, in our part of the world. Since 2002, we have been part of developing three co-working spaces here in Stockholm, uh, two venture capital funds, uh, the largest angel investment fund in the Nordics, Propel Capital and the national matchmaking organization that Stina presented uh, here. Stina have done a fantastic job with that. We focus on innovations within climate tech, health tech and deep tech. So that's our main focus. So far we have supported a little bit more than 400 startups since 2002. Um, and when they enter Sting, their pre-product, pre-revenue. Two, three persons um, with a bright idea to solve a big um, problem for society. Last year, our companies had 495 million euro revenue. 495 million euro revenue. And when they enter, they have zero. Um, they were valued at 2.4 billion euro, and they had 3,200 employees. When they enter, they usually two or three persons. So the value for the society in this regional ecosystem is, is quite big. If you then have uh, a factor of three of, of, of 3,200. That's quite a lot of people. 36% of the people, these 3,200, are female, which is not very good, but it's okay. Uh, I'll give you some recent figures that might be interesting for you who are driving uh, this gender balance. Last year, we accepted 40 new companies. 61% of them had female co-founders, and 47% had a female CEO, hmm. almost half of them. And many were deep tech with female CEOs. So uh, there you can find places where we have some um, movement in this uh, sector. Um, the companies have raised 1.1 billion euro capital, private capital, and last year was pretty good actually, uh, 120 million euro last year. It was down a little bit from uh, 2021, 20, of course. 12 companies have been listed, 27 have been acquired. Um, and it, it took us, somebody said that it takes some time to build an ecosystem. Yes, it does. 
2021, we were awarded the world's best incubator by Global Startup Awards, and so it took us 20 years. So we're a quite unique regional ecosystem, um, and it's actually a system. We very often talk about system, but a system is based on components that you've designed to work together. We have done that. It's very much a system approach. But all our companies are here in Stockholm. We need to scale them globally, and we're a tiny little country. So therefore, we need to team up with others. So now, uh, Mikkel will present a really interesting European initiative to link hubs uh, to each other. So thank you, Pierre. My name is uh, Mikkel Sorensen, and I have the pleasure of being the managing director of D2 Skylab, uh, the innovation hub of the Technical University of Denmark. Um, and I'm here today to tell you a little bit about Rise Europe, which is a new initiative connecting an, uh, uh, 21 European entrepreneurship hubs uh, in, in a strategic partnership. And just to provide a little bit of context and background here, so we've been talking quite a lot about these uh, last few days about how uh, the European startup scene has evolved throughout the last couple of uh, the last 10, 15 years. And today we have some quite well-developed regional ecosystem, one being here in, in Stockholm. We also have tons of great accelerators, great incubators, innovation hub, entrepreneurship centers, etc. But on the other hand, still some of the most significant challenges that we face of our time, we are not able to solve by ourselves. And those challenges we can kind of divide into two main categories. So on one side, we have what we could call global challenges. So that would be the green transitions, uh, scarcity of resources, global health, etc. And on the other side, we have uh, European tech sovereignty. So basically being European tech frontiers, not being as dependent as uh, big countries like the States or China as today, and basically putting ourselves in the driver's seat, defining the future we want to live in. Um, and to be able to support the startups and uh, the startups that can address these kind of challenges, we have formed this strategic alliance. And it was originally initiated by actually uh, um, Helmut Schönenberger for Unternehmertum, who had been mentioned previously here. He called Pierre and I and a, a few others to form this alliance and uh, partnership. And today we are uh, 21 hubs, uh, Sting being one, D2 Scarlet being another, from 14 countries. And if you look at our combined uh, efforts, we reached out to more than uh, 30,000 talent every year. Last year alone, we supported 1,800 startups. And if you look at the alumni startups uh, and the startups currently incubated uh, at our different centers, etc., last year alone, they raised more than 6 billion euros in venture capital. That's around like 8% of all European venture capital. It's pretty significant. So the idea is this is to combine the forces uh, to have the impact needed and uh, the create the scale and magnitude needed. Um, so. I only had four minutes to do this, but I will be ha very happy to have a chat afterwards and coffee out there. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so given what you see today, so you're talking about creating more hubs and, and collaborating throughout Europe. What's the next step in that journey? So I, I think uh, some of the step, steps could be uh, of course, launching initiatives together. But I think more importantly, I think in our case, it's, it's, it's about actually connecting the people within it. So, uh, Pierre, you know, I can call Pierre tomorrow if I need introduction to an investor here in Stockholm and he could do the same to me. And I think that, that thing, that is where the magic happens. And this is also why we need different kind of initiatives. There, there was a question early on, so there are so many connecting ecosystem initiatives. Yes, but you need quite a few, but you cannot, you cannot just create one big connecting thousand ecosystem or hubs or whatever, because that's a phone book, phone book you cannot really use. Mm. But you can actually use it if it's a strong strategic alliance between, say, 20 entities and 20 people. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for uh, connecting the dots. And thank you for coming here and sharing. Thank you, thank thank you so you. much. <laughs> per, might we ask you to stay? We per. Per, we might we ask you to stay? Okay. We thought we would have a, a concluding panel uh, to talk about many of the initiatives and uh, the hard work that's happening around Europe. And we would like you on start to come back on stage, as well as Stina uh, from Ignite. Quant X, Alira is here, and potentially also Thomas Clem. 
and you have left your microphone. Ah, well, we have one we have handheld, one. that's good. We can use that We one. don't have that much time, but we're, uh, the workshops are coming back from the, uh, the other rooms, and we're going to soon have the concluding remarks and, uh, the, uh, with a few of our guests here. But we thought maybe just take a few minutes to highlight out of the Schmorgus Board of Initiatives that you've seen, yours included, what is the important, what is the essence, what are we trying to do here? As uh, Joachim was saying, there's no room for complacency. We're not make building ecosystems for the fun of ecosystems. We have uh, goals to achieve. What is your main priority? If we see you here in a year, what will you have achieved, Thomas? So in, in, in uh, the initiative I'm involved in myself or? All of it. All of it. So Hand out a gold <laughs> star is where you see it fit, and uh, you All may right. give well, it to so yourself so as well. So in a year from from now, just within the, so with the in deep, the Deep Tech Alliance initiative that I'm involved in, we of course want to grow it. So we will we want more members involved. We want more initiatives going uh, because it's all about connecting people across Europe, right? So we want more corporate partners, more startups, more VCs, more ecosystem members involved. Um, so growing the whole thing and finding ways to do that. And uh, I think listening to everything that's been going on here in a more general perspective, I think um, uh, there's, there's so many great initiatives, right? And it's mm -hmm. so inspiring to hear about and uh, see the results created. And, and I think we all agree that we need to connect more of these uh, ecosystem players across Europe and break down the national barriers and, and all that. Um, so I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, this can be uh, first of many steps in the direction of finding ways of actually making this uh, this collaboration and these connections work beyond the intentions. So it's not just kind of toasting to the great ideas and visions and exchanging logos, but it's also about actual collaboration, actual ex execution, actual uh, result creation. Mm. And Steve, I gave you the title of having a black belt in matchmaking, which I, I still think <laughs> you uh, have. Would you like to hand out some gold stars or some reflections of uh, this ecosystem and the initiatives that are needed? Absolutely. Um, actually, today I'm the interim CEO of Swedish Incubators and Science Park, which is a national ecosystem of 64 members. Uh, so I'm Unfortunately, not that hands-on in Ignite anymore, but uh, very happy that it's working without me. That's the scale-up. <laughs> so, uh, I think one thing that I've been reflecting upon here uh, in the dialogues uh, is uh, the need for speed. We cannot wait because the climate can't wait. And if we, we don't really do things uh, on a very pragmatic and very direct way together for the startups, then we will lose speed. Mm -hmm. so, so, we really need to level up from that you're doing that, I'm doing that, and so on, and really, you know, on a pragmatic way, work much more together all over Europe. I think that's crucial. And then I'm very happy also to, to see, I mean, the initiatives. Uh, I've known you for a while, and I've been following what you're doing, and I think this is also really important because we lack talent. Uh, and our startups lack talent. They cannot grow. Uh, I mean, the big corps can't hire, the startups cannot hire at all either. So this is really crucial also. How do we make Europe, Sweden more attractive and more easy to enter for foreign talent? And this is one of the examples that you showed. That, but I think we also need to ask the EU, actually, to make regulations much, much easier. Uh, mm. to actually enter Europe and, and join these fantastic companies. So time, talent, more customers, more investment, and we all need to do it together. Yes, and level up. I totally agree that we need to level up and we, we need to, I mean, that courage. We've been talking about courage and, and taking risks and that, that we need trust to make that happen. It's uh, super important, so I totally agree. And you, um, what about talent? Because the freshly baked talent that we, we are walking out uh, other doors of the universities today, in five years' time, that talent might be outdated. How do we, how do we cope with that kind of challenge? I, I think we should stop talking about talent, talk about people. Mm. I mean, it's people we're talking about, and we want, if, if I were to look forward one year, I would like to see 100,000 people going through this training that the IT is doing. I would like to have, th there are some fantastic initiatives called Girls School Circular, which is trying to introduce young girls before 18 to go into science and technology that is also run by IT, which is an uh, enormous uh, 
pathway then for people to introduce the young ones. And then I would like to see that the, the, all these initiatives, all these infrastructures actually reaching out to the people that are being educated, being trained, to offering the, the, all these nice capital investments and, and startups and test beds and whatever you have. They, 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 otherwise they will just be dead facilities if, if there's no one there. So reach out to these people that are not there yet. Don't wait for the, the startups to come or the people to come, but reach out to the people that are in, in universities and are in companies but are thinking about, about entrepreneurial things, offering them, them these, these assets. I think that that's really important, not, not waiting for the, for the entrepreneurs to appear because they won't. And I think maybe there's an opportunity to be uh, self-reflected self-reflecting there you re represent the EIT and many of the conversations that we've had over these two days have been around the fact that there are huge initiatives big pockets of money but not necessarily known people don't know how, how to apply and if they would know the assumption would be it's too complicated I won't get it anyway I need to hire a lawyer I need a BCG whatever uh, um, <laughs> how do we bridge that gap the perception uh, of EU in the in the opportunities that you guys are offering? Well, uh, I, uh, the the uh, lady from the commission was talking about simplification, right? But simplification is, is relative to the pe people that are, I, I think there's a lot of bias in this, I mean, that it's it's so complex. I think they've done a lot to make it easy. Perception but is reality. If people think it's complicated, yeah. they will assume and therefore not apply. Absolutely, and I think that, that by reaching out and, and popularize this, being entrepreneurial towards the people that might be coming in here, because there are quite few, as I said, and also reaching out to companies and for un uh, intrapreneurs to try to find them, to train them, to, to offer them opportunities, not perhaps in, in conflict with their own company's goals, but as, as an add-on to make the, the, the big corporations uh, more entrepreneurial or intrapreneurial as, as well. I think that is, that is an important part because otherwise you will have these nice funds and, and test beds, but no one will know about them. Like you said, this perception thing. Per pain points. What do you say? What 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 are the barriers that you see uh, going ahead uh, in your development? Well, I, I'd like to uh, take it on a sort of bigger scale. We have a really big problem, and we know that, uh, which is the, the, the emission problem, the climate crisis, and. It, I think it's still a scandal that our politicians are not tough enough. They should be much tougher on different type of emission. That would stimulate innovation mm. even more. Now it's the industry who is pushing the politicians in front of them, give us tougher regulations, wh which is weird. It's really absurd that it is like that. How can it be that cheap to fly with an airplane? Mm. It's a scandal. Uh, so that's one I think I, I'm looking for, much tougher regulations for emissions. That would sort of fuel um, more innovations. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is... is um but it's an interesting one because the in it's not new. The industry has been pushing for a while. Yeah, yeah. I saw Shell the other day. It doesn't happen. But why doesn't it happen? Because... Because this is a big, important part of uh, the politician's constitution. Uh, playing into uh, well, corporates. Uh, politicians are there to be re-elected the, the next three or four years. That's why. Mm. But the it's private sector is an important <laughs> part of achieving that. Yeah, yeah. But it, but it, it's. I mean, it, it takes very brave politicians to do this, and and then you must perhaps see a le little bit longer than the next election, uh, mm. and you might not get re-elected. So. Don't get into in politics now, but but that, that's sort of, I think th that I would love to have much much tougher sort of demands on us to solve this problem. That would be be great. Uh, then then I have another wish uh, on my wish list, uh, and that is um, um, I don't know how it is in in other countries, but but in in my country it, it's very much that politicians and on departments they think there's a sort of a misconception that the more you spend on research, the more value comes out. No. The transformation of innovations that you have built up with money to the research does not automatically transfer into value in the society. We spend 
this much on transforming innovations and that much to create knowledge with money. So I would love more politicians and, and powerful people to sort of rebalance this a little bit. That's sort of my, my second one. <laughs> Um, well, luckily, Per, you are a powerful person too, so... <laughs> no. and, and my third is sort of on, 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 on a slightly other level. That, that ha has to do with the, sort of the deep tech, creating deep tech companies. We are still, at least in some of the countries here, we still have f far, little, far too less money, early stage deep tech. And it's not usually nothing for a venture capital fund. Because it's longer time, it takes evergreens, a family office, or things like that, and we don't, uh, we will not win this race if we don't create more platforms for that. EIC is excellent. Germany have launched a fantastic national, very big investment scheme. Now the NATO Innovation Fund is entering, perhaps not for Sweden yet, <laughs> uh, but 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 there's a lot of. We need much more money early stage deep tech to sort of do the first prototype to show that this is actually working before the venture funds or can enter. So that's my three things. Let me just say to everyone that's coming from the workshops, please have a seat. We're uh, ending it this soon and uh, moving on to the concluding remarks. But Thomas, you've been raising your hand a few times. <laughs> okay. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True. He started, <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, yeah, I, well, I agree with Pear. I was to say, so research doesn't ne necessarily by itself turn into value creation in society. And I think when we talk about uh, deep tech and deep tech entrepreneurship, we also have to be a little bit careful that we don't um, shield uh, the early stage uh, deep tech ent entrepreneurs for too long so they end up staying in the, in the labs for, for too long. Uh, we need to um, provide a commercial mindset really early on and also um, get them out into the market trenches and in dialogue with um, the industrial players out there uh, through matchmaking initiatives like we've been hearing about today and in dialogue with the, uh, with the VCs and not just kind of protected comfortably by uh, governmental uh, support. And according to Johan, they are people too. <laughs> yes, yes they are actually <laughs> people. And uh, I think um, another thing I wanted to uh, point out is seeing all the great initiatives uh, that are already existing, hearing the panels, hearing the uh, ecosystem tour that we've had today. Um, I would really also hope that the, the European Union and EIC uh, is wonderful with, their, with, the, with the programs that they're hosting themselves, pan-European programs, but I'm really hoping that uh, they uh, will also help support some of the grassroots initiatives uh, that we've been hearing about today and yesterday, also even pan-European initiatives, and uh, support them to, to scale also. That would be wonderful because a lot of them need that support to scale up their organizations or, and operations. And I really believe if we do that in Europe, we can uh, build our own uh, solid ecosystem that can compete with, let's say for uh, many, many years, the US has been steps and miles ahead, right? And we've seen American organizations sweeping in on Europe like tech stars and plug and play, helping our corporations with startup matchmaking and, and, and everything. But we can do it ourselves. Are you we competing to win? Uh, are we're com competing to win. <laughs> we just need, uh, we need the, 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 the resources uh, to, to do it. Stina? That's good. Well, I think uh, to follow on uh, Paris uh, point number two here, uh, but the climate can't wait, we know that. We know that we're in the middle of a crisis. But we do have something on a European level, it's called state aid regulations. And I know that this has been a topic in some of the rooms, uh, also in the workshops, but what if, because the state aid regulations makes it really, really tricky for us to support startups after tier L6. And you know, it's the, the value comes after tier L6. That's when the market happens. That's where the m real value starts to, to show. So we need to be able to support the startups much longer uh, than to um, this point. And I think we also have a new opportunity in the regulatory sandboxes. So what I really would like to say is that, okay, we have a crisis, we need to solve it. How can we fix a pan-European regulatory sandbox to actually break down uh, the state aid regulations as there are and see what can we win if we do that. We need to test now. Uh, and also another thing that's very connected to that, how can then the public sector also be the driver? How can they 
become the buyer of these fantastic deep tech solutions. That's also a very, very pressing issue. And we can put those all together in one sandbox. Mm. That's the wish list for me. <laughs> Beautiful, and thank you for, for creating this a little bit more complex and problematic picture of the future, which gives me more hope that we have to put more energy into trying to collaborate even more efficient and, and aligning our ambitions in solving the big societal challenges. Thank you, Per, Johan, Stina, Thomas. Uh, thank you for concluding our this, this pa part of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Joachim, for being a co-pilot mm, Thank you. in this uh, smorgasbord of initiatives. Thank you for th throwing the stick to me once in a while. <laughs> Surprised. Uh, I think uh, we can conclude in that there are big hearts, big brains, capital, and there is a, a genuine will to win. Yes. It is a competition. It I is. see people coming in from the workshops. Welcome. Have a seat. And in a few minutes, we will start the uh, concluding remarks and the finale of today. So bear with us three more minutes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow citizens, uh, deep tech enthusiasts, distinguished guests, all good things must come to an end. 
We have talked about high and low, the big, the policy, the structural, the why, the what, the how. We've marinated, we've hopefully broadened our networks, met new friends, challenged on our opinions, and now it's time to conclude. I would like to ask up the final panel to join me for some reflections, conclusions, and hopefully some ambitions for the year ahead. I would like to welcome up Director General for Research Innovation of the European Commission, Marc Lemaitre, State Secretary of the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Services, Foreign Service, State Secretary Håkan Jevrell, Dr. Michael Scheffer, the EIC President in Waiting, and Director General at the Swedish Innovation Agency, Daria Isaksson. Give them a warm welcome. <laughs> Vi var svenska. Daria Isaksson, may I start with you? Please, what are your reflections over the last two days? Aha moments. Aha moments. Well, aha, no, the wonderful feeling uh, that every day of this conference has actually been a day where we have collectively been building the deep tech ecosystem of Europe. So I think that's the main uh, takeaway for me. This conference has really demonstrated the strength of the deep tech ecosystem in Europe, um, but it has also uh, shown the shared commitment we have to driving deep tech innovation, as well as then highlighting some of our challenges. So highlighted the fact that we know that we have the no much of the knowledge we need, we will continue to invest in it, uh, we do have a lot of the talent we need, but some of it is yet untapped. What we do not have is time. We cannot negotiate with planetary deadlines. So therefore, we all share this sense of urgency, urgency to act. And then we've heard that means deep tech innovation is existentially important for us. But then we also admit that this type of innovation comes with certain new qualities, such as advanced tech infrastructure is important. Demonstrators are expensive, therefore risk sharing, public-private is essential, and we need to be willing to invest into these innovations long term, 15 years, not seven. So I really hope to see the EIC crowding in effect as one of the things to notice soon. An inclusive and diverse ecosystem is key. That's where the untapped talent is. Strong collaborations across Europe with a win-win, pay-it-forward mindset will really make us draw the most of our shared resources and knowledge. And another topic important, one last thing that really stood out, was the importance of policy and regula regulation. There is a testament to the fact that our success does depend on our ability to enable innovations through uh, the regulati regulatory context we have, has to be enabling and create opportunities for speed. So therefore, also regulators need to de-risk tech startups, engage actively in activities such as regulatory sandboxes. So I would conclude that for me, the reflection is, we know that this is the future for our competitiveness, for the prosperity, and that we share a sense of urgency and the need to act. And ACT is what you'll also do, because I know that this uh, report, there will be a report on the conclusions and the workshops and everything that we've done. So it won't be lost in the ether, even though you can watch it online. Could you tell us the insights from the report that you will make after this conference? How do you see that uh, playing in for Sweden, for example? No, but apparently that's a privilege to have been, um, you know, tasked with, uh, with arranging these workshops privilege to be able to listen in all the insights and of course we will put it together and make it available to anyone but for, from the Swedish perspective then of course we will also use it as an opportunity to then invite the deep tech ecosystem to have a shared discussion about it asking ourselves as the innovation agency but also uh, the system at whole what will we now do to take action on on the things that and the great ideas that have been identified. And Michel, when you t uh, see this report, how will that feed into the EIC, the machinery that we've heard throughout these two days are pledging both capital, will, interest, people? Thank you. To start off, I'm not no longer in waiting. I was waiting two months. Oh, but sorry. <laughs> since uh, yesterday morning, I'm in oh. charge. Uh, and this is really the coming out. So it's my first public conference. I started my job <laughs> Welcome. in Sweden. Um, 
And it was a wonderful two days. It was a very inspiring, rich, deep uh, conference. I like more interaction, but I for, for an executive conference, it was a very good one. And I've learned a lot. Um, and for us all together, I think it should be useful to think and to consider the adventure we are in. I'm also an adventure for two days now. To see it as an, as an adventure, something where we have to learn together to redeploy public tools, to crowd in private tools, and to learn to work together, European Union, member states, regions, so to get all these ecosystems together. And to have together the patience, because that's quite a dilemma or dichotomy, we have a long-term urgent issue, but we only will solve it if we have patience. Mm. You can't rush to solutions. Um, and one of the things, as I remember as well, someone said that quantum technology is the biggest invention of mankind since firepower. And I said, no, the biggest invention of mankind since firepower is the European Union. <laughs> because the European Union is designed to manage firepower. <laughs> and one of the tools is technological development, and the other one is a single market. And what also learned, President Constantine was very clear on that yesterday, is we need to align also within the European Union all the instruments. So faster technologies where we also can use the power of the single market to create mm -hmm. procurement on the European level so that we, uh, we also beca become the most important market for deep tech and not only the developer of it. And of course, uh, uh, something that came across the whole conference is the, the, the huge importance of crowding in. Governments cannot be alone, the U EU cannot be alone in investment. It is basically to seduce family capital, pension funds, other authorities to do that together. And that's a learning process in which I think the ESC is an important stepping stone, a hugely important stepping stone that has to uh, learn to work well and as well, but, but it's a stepping stone to bring in others uh, in this period, in the next programming period, I hope. Um, so there are a lot of challenges ahead and I hope to, to help 450 million people in Europe to, to achieve that with uh, a wonderful staff and a lot of, let's say, commitment from uh, in, in, in the, let's say, in the nerves of Europe as a whole. Let's be uh, concrete and tangible, and we have an, an audience here that will hold you to it. When we celebrate your one-year anniversary, what will you be able to have achieved? Well, the first thing is, I mean, Jean-David Malo made, made an announcement this morning. Uh, the system n must work well and be reliable and faster than it is. And there's a huge effort on improving that. That's one thing. If we don't have a good system, we cannot grow. So that's one thing. And the second thing is to make to create the stepping stones of growing. Because if investors want to, if, if public investment wants to exit in five or six years, seven years time, we have to start preparing that now. So one of my missions is to prepare the ground of being able to, to, to phase out and to crowd in all the others. And the third thing, of course, is we are, uh, also we control firepower within the European Union. We have fire at the borders. Uh, so the, the, the whole issue of sovereignty has become far more urgent than it was any time in the last 30 years. So we have to recreate, because we have lost a lot, we have to recreate an economy that truly, truly can be, let's say, for weeks sovereign without being dependent on others. And I think to use, to, to ho I hope that there will be a sovereign, sovereign a sovereign uh, tech fund that basically covers that, and that is also one of my priorities. So well, it sounds like your first year will be the adventure that you hope for. Yeah, I will be full-time uh, <laughs> available for helping. Mark, please, from the European Commission, what are your uh, reflections and conclusions of this summit and moving forward? Well, um, I, I do have to start by congratulating all those who uh, have made uh, this event. I was extremely impressed uh, by the all-encompassing uh, program. Uh, and while, unfortunately, I could not attend the whole event, I have no doubt uh, that um, it, it will produce uh, long-lasting good. Um, I am very excited to be here because of the topic, um, the topic of deep tech. Uh, Darian Mikiel already said a few things about this, but there are two points I want to emphasize um, about uh, deep tech. The first one is that, indeed, we have a planetary emergency. And here, I don't see any dichotomy. We need to be impatient um, about, um, 
about finding the solutions that we um, uh, that we that we need. Um, Europe today does lead the way. Europe has all the assets it needs to find the solutions uh, and is arguably ahead also because it is ahead in having very clear, very clear objectives. But we need a burst of, uh, of innovation in Europe. Um, and today uh, we, we do not have uh, the speed that is required uh, in green and in, uh, in, in deep tech to succeed. The second reason is that um, Europe absolutely needs to be or to get back at the forefront of uh, innovation if it really wants to ensure for its own citizens um, sustained uh, progress and a term which certainly has been used uh, uh, here and, and before um, if uh, Europe um, um, is to be strategically autonomous. And I would translate that in very, very simple terms. If Europe is to have its destiny in its, in its own hands. And this is, I think, where deep tech is indispensable for those two uh, reasons. Now, I have you know, one very simple takeaway uh, here. Um, we uh, need to work further, very hard, all together, to have a vibrant uni European innovation ecosystem. We are not there yet. Um, we have improved, I believe, uh, but we need to, um, uh, to, uh, to make further efforts. Um, and here I would want to mention three things. The first is that the new European innovation agenda that we have put forward uh, one year ago uh, is certainly a direction of travel uh, to uh, pursue very uh, vigorously. Um, and here I am extremely encouraged uh, by the announcements which were made in the context uh, of this conference uh, in the EIC forum, not only by member states and associated countries, uh, but also uh, by um, uh, actors uh, from uh, the uh, innovation uh, scene. More than 200 actions have been uh, announced here, and I think that this is a great sign that there is a lot of drive um, uh, through the new European innovation uh, agenda. I'd want to mention specifically regional innovation valleys, uh, which is a proposition we make uh, to identify at least 100 regions across uh, Europe uh, which will want to cooperate, coordinate uh, more and to have joint directionality in their innovation decisions and innovation um, uh, investments um, because we need more uh, cooperation uh, in Europe across our different uh, territories. Secondly, I want to make a special mention of funding, indeed. Um, on funding, we clearly have some market gaps, uh, which places like the US, like Israel, perhaps also like China, uh, don't, uh, don't have. And we need, to, we need to work on closing those market gaps. The European Innovation Council uh, has had an extremely promising start and has already made a concrete contribution uh, towards that. But we need now to focus also on the gaps in terms of size, in terms of scaling up, and the gaps in terms of the time uh, which is needed, uh, meaning uh, patient uh, capital. We will be thinking hard about that in uh, the context mentioned also by Executive Vice President Vestager yesterday uh, of um, uh, the uh, solidarity uh, fund that uh, we are thinking about. Last but not least, talent. Yes, talent. Entrepreneurial talent. Um, here I'd like to um, announce that we will be launching um, a new initiative called EIC Scale-Up 100, um, which is meant to identify uh, 100 
future tech champions, um, to bring them together uh, with mentors, with potential business partners, with inventors, uh, with, with investors, with innovation agencies uh, into an EIC scaling uh, club. Um, and secondly, I do want to refer to the first European Prize for Women Innovators, which was uh, um, attributed uh, yesterday. Um, Europe's values, Europe's characteristics of inclusiveness, of diversities are its ultimate strengths compared to the rest of the world and we need really to uh, leverage that to the, to the maximum. Finally, I'm very happy that this is not uh, the end of the road, all to the contrary, that we already know the next stepping stone, uh, which will be on the 10th of October, um, with the help of the upcoming Spanish uh, presidency. I'm very happy that the subject of innovation and the title will be Next Generation uh, Innovators Summit uh, will not be uh, just dropped. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, Deep Tech is obviously a key part of the Swedish presidency. State Secretary Håkan Jevrell, please, could you conclude this summit for us? Uh, well, oh, easy task. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, and, I, and I would say that uh, uh, it, this is so important. And it's so important for Europe uh, to... Uh, to actually meet and given the opportunities to discuss this, these important topics and issues. Uh, our, our future lies in, in your hands in this regard. And, and, uh, and I think with the backdrop that was mentioned uh, also, that we have war in Europe, uh, which has caused an energy crisis. Um, we have, of course, the climate change and the green transition that we need to address. So we have a lot of challenges and hard work ahead. And how to address this is really to work with innovation. And this has been the core of the Swedish presidency, to work for competitiveness, meaning that our companies innovate and will be part of this European structure of being relevant for the future. Uh, and, and I would stress the, the importance of the open strategic autonomy, because we cannot do this all by ourselves. We have to work within Europe, all member states, we have to interact more than we do today, but also with like-minded friends across the Atlantic and in other places. Uh, this not least important when we talk about talent attraction. We need to be the place where the best researchers want to go in Europe. Uh, so in this regard, I, I think that what's been discussed uh, in these couples of days and will be further discussed, of course, during uh, the coming presidencies. Uh, this is really the core of Europe, how we manage to address the challenges and how we manage to really play the important role of innovation uh, for the future. So really be excellent in these areas will we'll set the foundation for the future of, uh, uh, of Europe. Uh, so in this regard, uh, also to say the, uh, um, just a few words of a big, big thanks uh, to uh, the organizers, thanks to the Commission, AIC, who's really contributed to making this happen. Uh, of course, my colleagues within, within uh, 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 the different ministries have done a, a tremendous work in, in, in uh, making this happen. All the speakers, moderators, thank you so much for, for uh, making such a great event. But the most important things are all the delegates and guests who have been participa participated and really come together. And I think that one crucial thing that I have learned throughout my years in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, living abroad in Asia, the importance of get to know each other then things will happen. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, the challenges are clear. We know now what to do. And I can just say, as an early stage investor, I've been reflecting, and there's a trend that's clear that's worth noting. 18 months ago, to be labeled a deep tech uh, company meant difficult to fund, it will take forever, and management is run by probably by some crazy professor who doesn't have a commercial bone. <laughs> Today, deep tech means something completely different. It's substantial tech, well-researched, solving a real problem, 
addressing something that we need as a civilization, and you would be crazy not to fund them, not to join them. And today, I'd like to end with the words of another Swedish diplomat, uh, many, a hero for many of us, uh, the previous UN Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld. And who would have thought that a diplomat would inspire a deep tech entrepreneurs? But he said, never look down to test the ground before taking your next step. Only she who keeps her eye fixed on the horizon will find the right road. Thank you, and we have work to do. And there's buses for everyone, which is always good. <laughs> so don't rush to Thanks the exit. <laughs>